the forests remind us of a time long past when those terrible things with teeth and ravenousness would drag our loved ones away into the darkness of the trees. But such terror still happens even today. This episode is a compilation featuring 50 of the unexplained and disturbing things found in the woods. Can you brave them all? Leave a comment and let me know which story you enjoyed the most, or which one you really didn't like at all. Click the like button if you want more of these stories in the future. And remember, if you want me to narrate your story, share it with us at darkstories.org. Also, the illustration in the background of today's thumbnail was created by Lucef. Check the links in the description to see more from this talented artist. Now, let's begin. My Old Clubhouse From Michael I I grew up in the 80s, deep in the woods of West Virginia. My mom and dad were very loving and caring parents, who spent a lot of time with me and my older brother. And I think that rubbed off on us, because my older brother and I were the best of friends. We shared the same interests, spent much of our time together, and could count on each other. I remember one time when some neighbor kids stumbled upon our house. Mom and dad weren't home, and my brother was busy with chores in the house. I was outside just playing with my old toy truck in the dirt. I recall hearing footsteps. I looked up and saw two older boys coming my way. I thought this was weird, because we didn't have any near neighbors. Then again, back then, kids didn't have much to do inside the house, and busy parents would often let their kids roam about. So when I saw these two, I figured they had come from a couple of miles away. Some other house way out here in the woods. Now at first when I saw them, I was excited at the prospect of having some new friends to play with, being a trusting youngster and all that. When they got close, I gave them a howdy, and they began to step on my toy truck, breaking off the wheels in one fell swoop. I had no idea why they would do that. Before they even said a word, just as I was about to ask what was wrong with them, they pushed me in the dirt, and I began to cry. I guess that commotion was enough to alert my brother, who was a few years older than me, and much taller. He came right outside, picked me up, and socked the larger of the two boys right in the face. He fell in the dirt, crying, and the two then ran off back into the woods where they came from, I guess. It was the weirdest thing. Why would two strange kids without a word come and do something like that? I could only guess that they had some trouble at home and were taking out their frustrations on the first other kid they met that they could overpower. Anyway, I was grateful for my brother being there. My brother was the one who taught me to fish. He was there when I caught my first bass. I was so excited. Dad showed me how to cook it up for dinner, and we enjoyed it as much as we could. I do admit I may have left a couple of bones in there, but I tried my best. One of my fondest and longest lasting memories of my brother and my family is that of the clubhouse. My dad was a masterful woodworker, and one spring he had a lot of time off from work. I can't remember why exactly. But being a couple of bored and excitable boys, my brother and I asked my dad to help us make a clubhouse in the nearby woods. We caught him at a great time because I don't think he even considered saying no, but that may be due to the fact he had a lot of spare wood in the backyard, a pile of stuff that was just taken up space. Firstly, he had the two of us go out in the woods and pick a spot. We wanted a place that would stand against time. Even as kids, the two of us knew that we wouldn't always live here, and that meant some strangers might live in our house, and they could stumble upon this clubhouse, and that made us think they might wreck it, that all our work would go to waste. Luckily, there was a specific place my brother and I had in mind that was quite secretive. There was this large tree with strong branches. It sat just under a sheer cliffside, and the easiest way down the cliffside was a hill that was covered in masses of brambles and thorn bushes. Basically, people might find the clubhouse, but they would be hard fought to get to it. So, we picked that tree. We showed Dad where it was, and he told us it was quite a distance away, so we'd have to help him get the wood out here. But we already expected that. Over the next few months, we'd make time almost every day 
to put together the clubhouse two by four by two by four, nail by nail, until it was done. That thing was a wooden monument. It had one of those drop down rope ladders attached to a string that was really hard to see in the daytime. So we could toss the rope ladder back up when we crawled down and only we would know how to get it back down with the string. Plus it was especially roomy thanks to how big the tree was and thanks to my dad's woodworking. With a roof and a makeshift door on it, it was the perfect place to spend sleepovers. And by sleepover, I usually mean my brother and I camping out in the treehouse, which we usually just referred to as the clubhouse. We spent an untold number of nights there, sometimes laying in the clearing nearby counting stars, other times in the clubhouse telling ghost stories, making sure the rope ladder was pulled up, just in case anything creepy decided to climb up inside with us. When we did have friends from school over, they thought it was the coolest thing they'd ever seen. In my teenage years, my brother would show me comics, which I grew to love as well, so we'd often spend some quiet hours reading comics up in the clubhouse. With how often we were out there, I'm sure my parents were either worried about us or thankful for all the free time they got. But not every moment at the clubhouse was a cheery one. I remember when I was 13 years old, my brother must have been around 16 or 17. He wanted to sleep in the clubhouse again and invited me to stay with him. But I had a fever as I'd been sick. And that muggy outdoor air, especially at night, it made me feel so much worse. So I told him I'd just be staying in my room that night. He was understanding about it. About an hour after sundown, he took off with some food, a sleeping bag, and a backpack, as well as a kerosene lantern. A couple of hours after that, everyone back at the house was in bed. I was asleep. Until I suddenly heard a banging at the window. I shot straight up out of my bed, startled with goosebumps all over my back and neck. I looked to the nearby window, the one closest to facing the direction of the clubhouse. I saw a silhouette of a boy. I rubbed my eyes and turned on the light. And there stood my brother, just outside the window. And though I'd heard him banging on the glass, he was now facing away from the glass, staring into the woods. At first, I walked over and tapped on the glass to get his attention, to let him know I was awake. Then I reached down and began to pull up on the window. When the window was open, my brother didn't budge. He still stared quietly into the dark woods nearby. Uh, hey... Are you okay? I groggily asked him. I waited for a response for an awkward amount of time, but he stayed silent. It was so bizarre. I'd never seen him act like this, and I was worried he was scared of something out there. Maybe he saw a bear or was chased by coyotes. Worried, I reached out my hand and grabbed his shoulder. The moment I did, I happened to look down and saw his feet. Now, my brother and I always wore shoes outside, as it made exploring the nearby woods easier and less painful, what with all the random rocks scattered about. So when I looked down and saw that his shoes were gone, and saw instead his feet covered in mud and blisters, I became concerned. Hey, what happened? I tried to ask, when he suddenly interrupted me. May I come in? He spoke in a strangely low voice. It was monotone. I didn't really understand it, but he soon repeated himself. May I come in? What? I you live here. Why are you asking me to come in? I told him. I smirked a little bit, but I think it was only for my own comfort, because everything about this situation was bothering me. May I come in? He said again, completely disregarding everything I'd said. I rolled my eyes and was just about to tell him to come in when those goosebumps came back twofold. Something felt incredibly wrong. Well, I... I began to say, but then I looked up above his shoulder into the distance, and in the trees, standing there waving, was my brother. A sudden banging at the window behind me in the room caused me to nearly scream. I turned around, my hand no longer on my brother's shoulder, but there was nothing at the other window. When I turned to face forward again, the boy that had been standing in front of me, face the other way, was gone, 
and my brother was running towards the window now. The real brother, the one whose face I could see, the one with panic in his eyes and expression. This one came towards the window, and when he got close enough, he did not ask permission. He jumped inside, nearly tackling me, as I stood there dumbfounded. He picked himself up, breathing heavily, and closed the window. Right away, I looked down, and I saw that he was wearing shoes. Everything about this brother looked perfectly normal, except for the face he was making when he turned around. You didn't say yes, did you? He immediately asked me. I got chills. Well, I, no, I, I didn't... Oh, thank God, he replied. He turned to look out the window and scan the surroundings out there. What happened? What's going on? I asked. I don't know, he explained. I, I was in the clubhouse and I just got done reading some comic books and was about to go to sleep. I, I turned off the lantern and I closed my eyes. A, a moment or two later... I felt something hitting the tree below. I thought it was someone trying to get my attention, maybe you or dad. I opened the door and looked down, and I saw dad standing there, but he was facing the other way. I couldn't see his face. I called out to him, but he didn't respond, and eventually he said something weird. He asked me if he could come up, but his voice was all wrong. Dad knew where the pull string was to let the rope ladder down, and yet he kept asking me if he could come up, repeating the same thing over and over no matter what I told him. I closed the door, then covered my face in the sleeping bag. Eventually, it was gone, or he was gone, I guess, because he finally stopped asking me if he could come up. After a few minutes, I got so scared and freaked out by that, I ran home, but then... I saw Dad standing there, at the bedroom window, still facing away from me, looking at you through the glass. As my brother finished his story, he sat down on the bed, seemingly exhausted, or just really scared. As for me, my eyes were watering with terror. Why did he see Dad, and I saw him? And why did neither of us see this person's face, and why did we never hear their footsteps? That night, we stayed up all night, but first we kept the lights on, and we stapled some blankets to the windows, as we didn't have any curtains or blinds. I don't remember ever being as scared as I was then, and even still, all these decades later, I've never been that scared. Thankfully, nothing else happened that night. Nor did anything similar happen for the remainder of our childhood there in those West Virginia woods. Soon the event became a distant, creepy memory. One that, of course, we shared with our friends who never believed us. They thought these two brothers were just trying to fool them and scare them. I wish I could have told them it was just a prank. But it wasn't. A few years after that, Long after my brother moved out to go to college, and just after I moved out to attend my university, I was excited to hear the news that my brother would be graduating. He would be getting his bachelor's in astronomy. I congratulated him over the phone, and he told me he wasn't done yet. He was looking to get his doctorate in astronomy as well. He wanted to study the stars, just like we did in that clearing by the clubhouse. I thought it was amazing, and I was so proud of him. About a week after that, I received another call. This one was from my dad. I remember standing in my dormitory, answering the phone, and collapsing to my knees. Son, a drunk driver hit your brother on the road. I'm on my way to pick you up, okay? Dad? What do you mean, Dad? Is he okay? I I'll see you soon. He didn't give me an answer, and I knew that was a bad sign. I sat there on the floor, choking back tears. I just kept calling my brother's phone over and over and over, expecting someone to answer, even though I knew they wouldn't. When my dad knocked on the dormitory door, I let him in, and it took all the strength I had just to get up. He was already in tears. He hugged me before he said a word, 
but the first thing he did say as we embraced each other was, he's gone. There's a feeling you get when you lose your other half, when something that's such a big part of yourself and your life just ceases to exist, when it's ripped away from you. To me, it felt like drowning, like I couldn't breathe, like it wasn't real, sheer and utter and helpless panic. I ended up taking a year off, moving back in with my parents, who still at the time lived at the old house in the woods. Mom was a mess, and Dad it took everything he had to keep going. My old man became angry. The loving man I'd once known was now filled with hatred towards other people, because it was, after all, some stranger who took his son away from him. And my brother had been my mom's pride and joy, a college graduate getting one step closer to his dreams, all gone because someone couldn't wait to get home to drink. The first night I came back home, I slept in our old room. Then the tears came back that night. But with the pain came a different feeling, a different desire. Deep inside me, something kept telling me that I had to go to the clubhouse that I couldn't sleep here, that I needed to go to the old treehouse out there to see how it looked and to stay the night. But I knew why those feelings came up. I fought to push them back down, but ultimately I lost. So as not to wake my family, I climbed out the window, bringing nothing but my jacket. I walked into the woods, making my way toward the old clubhouse. The trek was much tougher on my older self than I remembered, but I made it there. And all this time later, it looked just as I recalled. The wood still well maintained. I didn't know how it was possible. I mean, I hadn't been back at the clubhouse for a few years. I stopped going when my brother moved off to college. Just didn't see the point. I searched for the old hidden drawstring. I found it and yanked down the rope ladder. I climbed up with some trouble, but eventually pulled myself up. I opened the door and lay down inside. I stared up at the roof, and I waited, and waited, and waited. I wanted to watch outside below the treehouse, but I was afraid it wouldn't come if I was watching. But no matter how long I waited, it wouldn't come. I stayed awake until I saw the first beams of sunrise and the tears came back, because then I really knew I would never be able to see my brother again, and yet I'd come out here hoping that that thing we saw that night would come back, and I could, at the very least, see my brother facing the other way, asking if he could come up, and that time around, I would have given him an answer. The Whistler from Chip Oil, 1991. I'm a freshly graduated high school student and on my way to college. During my senior year, I had a job working for my grandfather as a farmhand. Well, more or less a farm manager. He would give me instructions on what to do to the farm without him being there, most commonly feeding the cows. It was early November and at this moment in time, baseball practice started after school, and it would last from 3.25 to 5.30 p.m. By that time, the sun would be almost down when I arrived at work, and would start getting ready. One day, I had gotten dressed, filled up the buckets, and fed the first farm when I realized I didn't have a key to the other farm. Frustrated, I was forced to pick up two buckets at a time and walk them from the fence to the feed troughs, a good 40-yard walk. While walking, I was trying to keep myself upbeat. I just started to whistle. No real pattern or tune to it, but something that I came up with. When I came back and put the last buckets in the bed of the truck, I heard something from my neighboring property. It was whistling. Strange, I thought. No one lives anywhere near that property, and it sounded very close. I rationalized it as a mockingbird or something, and continued on. 
The next couple of days I didn't whistle, but the whistling I'd hear would continue, and slowly over those few days it got clearer and clearer until it sounded just like regular whistling, and eventually it got louder. When I'd first heard it, it was very faint. I almost missed it over the crunching of me walking to my truck. Over the course of those days, I kind of became accustomed to the whistling, and I kind of expected it. One day later, when it didn't come, I was actually a little disappointed. This time I'd brought the key, and I walked up to the gate and started fiddling with my keys when I dropped them into the grass. I said dang it, and squatted down, starting to search for them. It was then that I heard a very faint sound coming from the other property. A low groan or gurgle. It was getting louder. At this point, I wasn't scared, but more curious as to what was going on over there. I left my truck parked across from the property and walked a few feet down the road, hopping the fence to the property where I heard the sounds. The land over there goes straight uphill and is heavily wooded all throughout, and the further you go up, the more and more dense it gets. Looking back now, I made a few big mistakes that could have gotten me hurt. As I walked up the hill, I would occasionally hear the gurgle. It was still far up the hill, so it was as faint as it was before. As I walked on, a bad smell began to hit my nose. A weird mixture of garbage and wet dog. I heard something as I was about to crest the hill. A very dry, low, and quiet, distorted, dang it, came from a couple yards in front of me. It sounded like a 60-year-old smoker, saying dang it really slowly, and I automatically thought someone was on our property. Somewhat angry and paranoid now, I started to move slower. I didn't want this guy to hear me before I could see them. I kept going, and I stopped and listened when I heard another sound. Dang it, dang it, dang it. This guy was slowly saying dang it normally, not long and drawn out in that eerie way as if he didn't know English. I sat down on this log, kind of listening, trying to figure out what I should do about this person. He kept saying dang it over and over, and I noticed that his tone was getting higher, and his inflection was changing, and it hit me. This guy was perfectly mimicking me. My tone, my inflection, literally everything. He even mimicked my frustration when I said it. Teed off and kind of scared now, I got up and began to crest the hill. I flicked on my flashlight on my phone. Hey, this is private property. I was cut off mid-sentence. As I came over the hill, my light barely illuminated a naked figure squatting just a couple of yards in front of me. His eyes were illuminated by the faint glow of my flashlight. I automatically felt that something was wrong. This wasn't a regular person. His neck was longer than normal. And when I came up the hill, he winched his neck and snapped his head to look at me without moving the rest of his body. His eyes were too big and his head was large and slender. He sat squatted down in a ballerina-type squat. I looked at his body. He was very skinny. His ribs were showing through his skin. There was a short silence, and like a robot, the man turned in the leaves and slowly stood with his hands next to his side. I was debating whether or not this was even a person. It was far too tall to be a person. Dang it. It said, in my voice. I turned and I sprinted down the hill. It didn't feel like I was running, but more like my legs were just going through the motions. I didn't look back before I got to the fence, and when I hopped it, I got in my truck and sped away. Sadly, I still work at that farm, but I've never told anyone this story, not even my grandfather. I've only heard the whistling a few more times since then. Something tried to kill my friend's dog. From 
just a simple username. This happened a few years ago. I'm six foot one, and I'm in decent shape. I was taking my dog out at about 11.45 p.m. one night. A light drizzle of rain was beginning to fall when I suddenly hear this ape-like sound. Now, immediately, I think I was just hearing things because I live in Virginia and I know there are no apes or monkeys out here. Once I finished up my walk, I brought my dog back inside and locked all the doors and closed the blinds. Before I knew it, I'd hit the pillow and fell asleep. I woke up sometime later. I checked my phone and it read 2.33 a.m. I was wondering what woke me up. I looked towards the glass door that leads to a small deck. This doesn't have a blind on it. When I looked in that direction, I saw this dark shape just perched on the deck rail. This was two stories up, and the deck hangs off the house, so I was wondering how this thing or person got up there in the first place. After looking away, then back at it, I saw bright yellow eyes. I couldn't make out any other features, except for the cloth-looking thing around its waist. When I looked away again and looked back, it was gone. This takes me to the second day. There was no rain, and nothing odd happened that day. A few days later, a heavy downpour had begun. By then, the creature I'd seen was not on my mind, so when I went to sleep on the couch, I didn't close the blinds. I woke up to a cracking noise. I had left the outdoor lights on that night. I looked at the window. There, again, I saw that thing. This time, it was trying to get inside the house. I got a better look at it. I thought the devil himself was coming in to get me. It was gray with sagging skin, too loose to fit on its body. It was very thin and tall, and though its skin was loose, I could still see ribs sticking out from underneath. Its eyes were bright yellow, and the odd thing about it was it had antlers protruding from its head, and there was stuff hanging off those antlers. I looked at its body again and saw it was decaying. Suddenly, it let out a horrifying screech. Then it was gone. When I went out there the next day, in the mud were some human-looking footprints with coyote prints leading away. I wish I could say I never saw it again, but I did. Two weeks later, in the middle of the day, a light rain, much like the first time I saw it, was coming down. But this time was different, as I found it standing in the field outside my house. Without a thought, I ran in the house and grabbed my 270 caliber rifle. I aimed at it and fired one single shot. I watched as it screamed that god-awful noise, then ran off the other way. The next day, I asked to stay with my parents, until I could find a new house, as I was now definitely moving out of that one. These days, I live in Northern Virginia, and I've never had any problems since, but sometimes when I'm alone, I see those yellow eyes, and I hear that god-awful screech in the distance. If you live in the southeast part of Virginia, I warn you, there is something that only hunts in the rain. Update at the time of writing this update, this happened three days ago. I was telling my friend about this experience. He looked at me and started to laugh. This upset me, seeing as though this experience had shaken me to the core. When I mentioned that I think it was a skinwalker, avoiding saying the word as supposedly that could draw it to you or give it power, he looked at me again and did the thing I least expected. He said if there was such thing as a skinwalker, tell it to come get him. I've listened to many stories about skinwalkers, and I've researched it. It is said if you mock the creature or make fun of it, it could show you just how real it is. After that, we went to his house and just chilled out, playing Call of Duty on his PS4. I don't consider myself good at shooters and lost most of the games. Eventually, I got bored and I decided to go get a Coke from the fridge when his dog, Winnie, suddenly ran past me and began to bark at something outside the window. I thought she just needed to do her business, so I let her out. Now, Winnie was a well-trained German Shepherd, 
so we had no worries about letting her out. We knew she'd come back to the door and scratch when she was ready to be let back in. As I was walking back to Tony, I heard Winnie barking, but not the passive kind. It was like the I'll rip you to shreds kind of bark. While she's doing that, Tony looks at me concerned. We run back to the door to let her in. I've never seen a dog move faster than that in my life. As she came inside, she was growling and her tail was between her legs. She had never acted like that before, so we put her in her kennel for the night. After that, Tony and I went back to playing video games. We heard a tapping at the window at some point, and Tony got up, pushing the blinds aside. He said he saw nothing though, but the look in his eyes told me otherwise. Then we just decided to go to bed. In the morning, we let Winnie out of her kennel to do her business. We also went outside to enjoy some fresh air, and so Tony could have a smoke. I was walking around when I noticed gash marks under the window where the tapping had come from. This chilled me to the bone, but before I could call Tony over, Winnie began to whine in pain. Tony and I rushed to where she was, and when we saw her, an especially large coyote was attacking her. The odd thing about this coyote was its limbs, as they seemed to be too long for its body. And when I looked at its face, I saw those same familiar yellow eyes from all that time ago. Without a word, Tony ran inside and grabbed his 45. Without a word, he came out and began to fire at the creature. It let out a screech as one of the bullets hit the right front leg. It let go of Winnie and ran off into the woods. As it ran, I got a look at its backside, which was very slim and was tailless. Soon after, we rushed Winnie to the vet and got her treated. Thankfully, Winnie is doing well and will make a full recovery. And my friend never mocks me for my experience having one of his own now. All I can say is that the Native Americans were not making up these creatures. These monsters aren't just cautionary tales. They're very real. And I would advise you all to heed these warnings. And to that creature, let us never meet again. The Lights on the Mountain, from Chant Recollect. Alright, I've spent a good amount of time thinking back on my teenage years, and how stupid I was with a lot of things. But as they say, hindsight is always 2020, and I contribute most of what I learned about relationships from a guy named Jason. He was my first serious boyfriend. The fact that he was, still is by the way, a bit too old for a girl of my age back then probably helped a lot. He wasn't a predator, just so you know, but he had his demons and smoked greens to cope. His mom said he was born with the call, and that made him special. I wasn't too sure what that meant at the time, but after a little research, it made sense. Jason could not only see things, but help those around him see them too as long as the other person wasn't a complete and utter skeptic. My dad assisted at a friend's dojo a few nights a week, and since he didn't really like that we were dating, I only had Jason around when dad was gone. Our relationship was still relatively new, so we spent most a lot of time getting to know each other. On this particular night, we were sitting on the step of the sliding door one night drinking cola, just staring into the distance and talking crap. About eight miles in that direction was a mountain. Nothing special. A roughly 800 foot high moles hill. I had my contacts in, and I could clearly make it out against the city lights behind it. Jason got quiet after about an hour, and asked if I wanted to see something amazing. Vegetation here is savanna, so trees don't grow tall and are few and far between. Of course, I exclaimed. He told me to focus on that there hill, and nothing else. Take deep breaths in your nose and out your mouth. Blink only when you have to, he said. The humidity and my contacts might have helped because I ended up blinking less than three times per minute. Soon, I saw people with flashlights on that hill. I told Jason, but he didn't respond. The more I looked, the more I noted how those flashlights were moving too fluidly, too smoothly to be flashlights. If you see someone carrying one in the distance, 
you'd know that those lights flash when the person points it in different directions, more towards or further away from your own direction. These lights were constant in size and pale blue in intensity. How are dull blue torches useful? I thought to myself. I counted more or less 12 of them, but didn't know how many were on the other side of that hill, and they didn't seem to acknowledge the other's presence at all. I asked Jason what the heck we were looking at. He said to look away if it started to feel like a line was being created between me and those things. I was confused. But then, okay, imagine you and a friend are holding opposite ends of a rope. Imagine consciously being aware that the rope connects the two of you, and no matter where you are, as long as you both hold on, the rope will bring you back together if you pulled it towards you. It was also like being on the other end of feeling as though someone was watching you, I guess. That's what this felt like, as if I was building a bridge. Some of the lights slowed down. Amazement turned to fear, and I looked away. It's as if those things went blind to my presence again, and that was it. Jason hugged me to his side and explained that they're ghosts or spirits. He said they were either a collection of three or four different races of soldiers. Our area was very chaotic back in the colonization era. Everyone wanted a piece of this land. He didn't know exactly what happened, but speculated that something transpired on that hill that caused the deaths of a lot of people at the same time. They must not know that they've been dead for over a hundred years, or they've got some unfinished business and can't move on. I asked what he meant by unfinished business. Jason went, I don't know, maybe some have a message they need to tell a loved one, or maybe their remains are still there, or they were unceremoniously buried in unmarked graves and aren't happy about it. He went on to say that they're a real pain in the butt once they pick up that you can see them. They'll enter your dreams and make you see things in the corners of your eyes late at night. Mostly, they just want to know that it's okay. They can move on. Their families, etc., are already waiting for them on the other side. Because, you know, the war happened over nine decades ago. Anyway, that event was my introduction to the spiritual. Quite a lot of things happened after that, but those are stories for a different time. Those orbs are pretty mesmerizing, but don't stare too long. They might feel your gaze. Eyes in the Trees From Noel I never really believed in myths or legends about Bigfoot or werewolves, but after what happened to me, I 100% do. My uncle owns about 20 acres of land in northern Michigan. There's a small grassy area where he keeps his cabin that's surrounded by dense forest. I've never really gone deep into the woods, mostly because I was scared of bears and all that. Last summer, I went up north, that's what we call northern Michigan, with my mom and older brother. We were staying about an hour away from my uncle's place in a city by Lake Michigan for a carnival. But first, we stopped by my uncle's place on the way there, at around 9.30pm. As we got out of the car, I noticed my uncle sat in his lawn chair facing the woods with one of his guns by a fire. He didn't even acknowledge our arrival. As we got closer, my mom called out his name. He blinked and slowly turned his head towards us. He looked really freaked out. I'd never seen him like that. My uncle is a pretty intimidating guy big muscles, and a stern look, so I felt a little put off by his expression. He nodded his head and looked back toward the woods, his grip tightening around his gun. I shared a look with my brother, who seemed as put off as I was. My mom asked, You good? And all he did was shrug and sigh. After a few long seconds of silence, he speaks, You guys should get going. I'm heading out soon anyway. Uh, what's going on? My older brother asks. My uncle shakes his head as he heads for his truck, gun still in hand. We all back away towards the car and hop in. I watched from the back window as we drove down the long driveway leading back to the dirt road. As we passed by a little clearing, I saw something in the woods behind it. I got excited and tried to get a better look because I thought it was a bear and I've never seen one. But the excitement soon vanished into fear 
once I got a better look. Its eyes stared back at me, hazel orbs that looked almost human. They seemed to glow in the moonlight. The eyes were about eight feet off the ground, peeking through some tall branches. From the moonlight, I could see some brownish-gray fur and pointy ears like a dog. I gasped and choked out a shaky, Mom? We were past the clearing now, coming up to the end of the driveway. She replies with a, Hmm? I tear my gaze away from the dark woods. Did you see that? See what? She asked, confused. The eyes. She shakes her head. I didn't see any eyes. Did you? She asks my brother. He shakes his head and says, eh, Probably a bear. But I knew it wasn't a bear. It was too tall. Plus, bears don't have ears like dogs. I didn't say anything else or look out any windows to the woods. I don't know what I saw, but I do know it wasn't a bear. I've heard of dogmen and werewolves, but I never really believed in that stuff. But now, I just don't know. We're going back up north tomorrow, and I'm hoping not to see that thing again. Coal Mine Road From Dean When I was young, my parents moved around a lot. I must have attended 10 different schools during my life. My dad was the kind of man who shouldn't have had kids. He wouldn't keep a steady job and forced my mother and later my aunt to work long hours to support our family, which included six kids. He was a schemer and always looking for an angle to work. My earliest memories were bar fights and my dad robbing my piggy bank while he was drunk in the middle of the night. My mom followed him like a god. To this day, I don't understand why. He was physically violent with her, and she stayed with him for over 20 years until all the kids had grown. I guess she stayed for us more than anything. The story actually begins when I was 10 years old. My dad outfitted an old school bus with bunks, and we traveled across the country from Utah to Indiana and finally to Kentucky, where the bus engine died. So the bus was our home for a long time, until dad finally rented what could only be described as a shack on the side of a mountain. This was near Burksville, in what is known as the Cumberland Gap. Very mountainous with steep hills, with gravel roads carved into the mountains. The house we rented was from an old man named Howard, who owned a gas station and convenience store where two roads intersected. Howard was a good old man who took a liking to my dad. He used to give us the flat sodas from his gas station when we were waiting on the bus. For us, it was a very rare treat to drink anything more than water. There were six of us kids altogether. Marty, who was just a baby. Michael, who was in kindergarten. My sisters Jean and Carol Ann, who were in third. And my brother Jim, who was in the second grade. I was the oldest in fourth grade. We would walk down a steep gravel road that was about a quarter of a mile from the house each day to the bus stop. I remember the gravel road was overgrown and had old houses that were dilapidated on both sides. The town had been part of the company housing for a coal mine that closed up back in the 50s. Kudzu and vines covered houses. Old trucks and cars that were no more than rust piles lined the sides of the road, looking out of the brush as if they were trying to hide. Howard called it the coal mine road. The house we lived in was at the top of the hill from the gas station then about a quarter mile down coal mine road on the right. It was the only house not grown over with kudzu and weeds. The road kept going to a clearing where Howard had an oil rig. I remember there were copperhead snakes, and we'd keep ourselves at the center of the road, so no one would get snake bit. Sometimes they would come out onto the gravel and warm in the sun, especially early in the morning. 
we would throw gravel at them to keep them back. We were warned never to venture off the path because Howard had told us that there were hidden dangers all around. Old cellars that had caved in, uncovered wells, and of course, the snakes. Mom was very careful to keep us all near or in the house as much as she could. But being the oldest boy, I would be sent out to get coal from a coal pile. A potbelly stove was all we had for heat. It was a chance to goof off and look around throwing old rocks at the windows of those old houses I could see through the woods. One day, Mama asked me to go out and bring in some coal. I was watching TV on a black and white TV set in the bedroom, and I didn't want to get up. So I acted like I didn't hear Mom ask. She finally came in the room fussing and said that if I didn't get the coal right now, it would be dark. So out I went. We had an old wheelbarrow that we used to bring the coal up to the house. Then we'd take a few large pieces in and put them beside the stove. For those of you who don't know, coal is very dirty, and it gets all over you. The old wheelbarrow had a steel wheel that needed grease and would squeal as you pushed it down the road and over to a pile of coal that Howard had brought out for us to keep warm. In a lot of ways, I think Howard worried about us in that old drafty house. This was sort of his way of helping. It was already dark when I shoveled the last of the coal into the wheelbarrow and turned toward the house. Then, I saw something. On the road past our home, there was a light. It was dim like an old lantern. Dad wasn't home, that I knew. He was working at a blue jean factory four hours away, and he wouldn't be home until Friday. The light bobbed as it came slowly up the road, like someone walking. There was nothing down that road now, no reason for anyone to be coming up from the old oil rig and coal mine, and if it was Howard, he would have taken his truck instead of walking. And yet here it was. A dim yellow light that seemed to keep a steady pace toward me. I gave the wheelbarrow a push. Then I stopped. If they didn't know I was here now, that would have told them. I dropped the handles of the wheelbarrow and made a run for the house, hoping I could beat the lantern carrier. As I ran the 100 yards or so to the house, the lantern grew closer but kept its steady pace, not pausing. I could see it was a lamp, flickering with a very dirty, dusty glass cover. I could make out a single person in the light of the lamp as it swung at the end of the arm, walking ever closer to me and my home. I burst through the door of the house and yelled, Mama, there's someone out there on the road, behind the house. Mom came out of the kitchen and came to a halt, just inside the living room. There was no doubt based on my face that I'd seen something. I wasn't overly afraid of the dark, and Mom knew that. I didn't spook easily, and she knew I was usually the one who got rid of the snakes and defended the younger kids from bullies. She said in a calm voice, Lock the door. I ran back to the front door and shut it quickly, not taking time to look for the lantern, I turned the old deadbolt lock and a homemade wooden lock we had made with a nail and a flat piece of wood. Mom came into the living room with a single 16-gauge shotgun. Her dad gave her that gun, and that may be the only reason we still had it, because she refused to let dad sell it. By this time, the other kids were coming into the room. She told them in a hushed voice to go to the bedroom and lock the door. It must have been the tone of her voice, because they did exactly that. I could hear Marty crying behind the door and my oldest sister hushing him. She walked around cutting off lights, the kitchen, the hall where the potbelly stove was, the living room. The house had those old string lights to a single bulb. So as each light went out, the house grew very dark. The only light was the light of the porch light and the light from under the bedroom door. Mama began to peek out the windows. First, she looked out the kitchen window. The back door was locked, I could see. She peeked out the small window in the door then, and then the living room windows, 
than the bathroom. Nothing. She turns to me and asks, Are you sure you saw someone? I answered quickly, Yes, they had a lantern and were walking up the road. From the mine? She was looking at me intently with a furrowed brow now, her voice raised like she was questioning the information. You better be telling me the truth, she responded flatly, rechecking each window. I was hurt and at the same time angered by her lack of belief. I then started checking the windows myself, but I didn't see anything either. Finally, Mom opens the front door and steps out on the porch. She goes to the edge and looks up and down the road. I peeked out from behind her and didn't see anything either. The moon was above the trees now, and you could see clearly there wasn't anyone on the road. I guess it would be easy enough to turn off the lantern and slip into the woods, but why? We didn't have any kind of flashlight, so we had to just strain our eyes and see what we could. Nothing moved. No noises came from the woods, but we could hear the other kids bumping around in the bedroom. We went back inside and shut the door. She put the shotgun in the corner by the door and looked at me with surprising compassion after such a scare. Maybe we have enough coal for the night. She smiled at me. I really saw something, Mama. I once again insisted. Maybe it was Howard. We'll ask him in the morning. She walked back to the kitchen, leaving me standing by the door. The next morning, I woke to a very cold house. No one else was up, but the fire had burned down to cinders, and there wasn't any more coal in the house. I got up, slid on my pants and shoes. I went to the front door and saw the shotgun was still in the corner by the door, where Mama had left it the night before. I peeked out the living room window, Everything that had happened the night before returning fresh to my memory. Unlocking the front door, I opened it and I looked outside. My mouth dropped open. The wheelbarrow filled with the coal I'd loaded the night before was now just sitting on the porch. Someone had taken the wheelbarrow to the house and up the five steps to the porch without anyone hearing it. One more thing. Sitting on top of the coal was an old kerosene lantern. I poked my head out into the brisk air. I thought it was cold in the house until that frosty October morning met my bare arms and face. I looked up and down the old road and around the house, no sign of anyone. I brought in a couple of pieces of coal and started up the fire. We never did find out who my mystery helper was. We found out later that day that Howard had been out of town at a doctor's office in Versailles, and Dad didn't come home until later that Saturday afternoon. Howard said it looked like one of the old lanterns in an old storage shed near the entrance of the mine. Dad, Howard, and I walked out the road the next day. I remember I had a hard time keeping up, it was so grown over. Howard toted an old black revolver, and Dad had Mom's shotgun. First, we went to the old shed. The door was bolted, and the padlock was rusted beyond opening. We then traipsed through the tall weeds and kudzu until dark, checking each of the old houses. But they were all still boarded up. There were no signs of entry, except for some broken-out windows that were probably from my rocks. From that day forward, I went out early to get the coal with the exception of a few really cold nights. Those nights I did venture out after dark, I took my lantern. Terror in the Wild and Wonderful Mountains of West Virginia From Wayside Strangler 86 If anyone's ever seen the wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia before, it's the exact area where this event occurred. I literally had to drive by their house on the way. Hank Williams III also wrote a song about it, called Boone County Blues, which really captures the essence of the depressing, drug-consumed area. 
I worked as a lab technician for an independent company. I would run analyses on coal samples to determine the quality. BTUs, ash, sulfur, things of that nature. Part of the job was driving company pickup trucks to various different coal mines, train loadouts, and the river docks to draft barges and collect samples. We got a call at around 2 a.m. to go pick up a train sample over in an incredibly remote area. The mine was miles away from absolutely anything. In order to get there, I had to drive across a place called Williams Mountain, home of Jesco and all the other whites. It's a notoriously steep, curvy, and dangerous mountain with a very high rate of accidents. I made it to the mine and collected the sample without incident. After about 15 minutes of driving, I started back up the steep mountain. Having made the trip numerous times, I could take the curves pretty fast, especially when it's pitch dark and you can see headlights approaching you. The nearest stoplights, stop signs, or streetlights are a good 30 miles away, so it's a different kind of dark. The complete darkness just perfectly compounds the isolation. It was because I was driving so fast that I was completely caught by surprise when it appeared that there was a vehicle quickly catching up to me. I started to speed up, but before I knew it, they had caught up with me. When they got close, they turned on their high beams. I could tell it was a truck from the height of the lights, but the bright lights had me somewhat blinded. It was then when the terror really began. They started edging closer and closer until they were right up my rear. It didn't matter how fast I went, they stayed right on me. All of a sudden, they just stopped in the road and killed their headlights. Completely weirded out and rattled, I took a huge sigh of relief and began laughing nervously as they dropped from sight. Thinking it was just someone's idea of a cruel joke, never had I been so ready to see that city skyline. Not too long after, and to my complete and utter horror, the lights began quickly climbing the mountain once again. Frantic, I punched the gas, almost wrecking twice trying to flee but it was no use. Again, the bright lights filled up my mirrors and simultaneously filled my heart with fear and absolute dread. They would back off some, then get extremely close, repeating this over and over and over until they finally rammed me twice. The second time was hard enough to make me swerve, though thankfully I was able to ride it out. I should note, there is absolutely nowhere to pull off while traversing the mountain just guardrails on either side, and drop-offs wherever the rails are missing. There's only one little church on a wide spot on the side of the road, so I tried to pull over and let them pass. I put on my signal and turned off, but my pursuers turned off as well and killed their lights. I hid my vehicle and ducked down, trying to watch out for any movement. Nothing. Two or three minutes probably goes by and I made my move, frantically peeling out. To my unimaginable relief, they did not pull out too, but I wasn't convinced it was over. Sure enough, the lights approached once more, though this time it was accompanied by a sound, an unmistakable gut-wrenching sound of gunshots. I'd heard the term hyperventilate, but at that moment I discovered the full force of its meaning. Barely able to breathe, I ducked down as low as I could and began reciting a nonsensical plea for help. This was before cell phones were popular, but to this day, service there is non-existent. The bullets rang out like a soundtrack for my misery, and all I could think at that moment was that I never would see my loved ones again. Time is truly subjective. It felt as though I was on that mountain for days, but I finally reached the end. I eventually saw a few houses and immediately pulled into the first place I could. The truck didn't turn down the driveway, but lingered in the road with the headlights off. After a couple of minutes, a porch light came on and the truck did a donut, starting back up the mountain. A man emerged from the home, but I left as soon as the truck's lights were out of sight. I yelled, sorry, out the window 
and drove like a reckless lunatic the rest of the way. I ended up getting pulled over for speeding on the interstate. I didn't even attempt to explain, as I figured it was a small price to pay, all things considered. Obviously, I never entertained the idea of ever making that run again, and my boss began collecting samples in the daytime only for that particular site. The mountains of West Virginia are incredibly beautiful, but there's also a lot of danger lurking in the depths of their remote isolation. Places that inspire movies like Wrong Turn. Places where no one can hear you scream. Giggles from Sidriax. I used to work for a motorcycle company in a very rural province of the Philippines. Unlike other places, my home island has only one city for now, and that's where our main office is located. My job at the time was as a field representative, but I mostly handled the collection of monthly payments from our customers. Most of our customers live in various secluded areas near the shorelines, mountains, and vast forests, hence why I was required to go collect their payments. More often than not, they supposedly forgot their monthly due dates, so it's up to me to remind them. I'm only a 5 foot 6 tall guy, but I'm not skinny, like my other co-workers. And before joining the company, I was an avid mountain biker and hiker, because I was raised in a very far off farm with no electricity or motorized transportation. Anyway, because of my nature, the office always puts me in charge of going to the most mountainous areas covered by woods. I didn't really complain at first. All these places that I had to go to were very secluded to the point that even electricity is non-existent, and people there live as if it's the Middle Ages. One of these days, I started off early, since I had to ride a motorcycle provided by the office as a means of transport. This motorcycle was clunky, old, and had had more repairs than a World War II war machine. But I trusted it enough that I called it Ox, because no matter how hard or impassable the terrain was, it had never let me down before. But I do have to repair Ox while on the way every now and then, but nothing major. As I reached the foot of the mountain, I prepared a bit by checking my gas, inspecting ox, and waterproofing my everyday carry stuffs. I never leave home without a knife, and on cases like these, I always brought one of my large blades. I revved up ox, and we started to tackle this steep dirt road used by large trucks heading up the mountain. My client for the day was a tribesman who worked in a mine and it always takes me two hours to get to the top of the mountain where his village is situated. The path there was very hard, and I was the only one who was able to get to the area. There were no houses along the way, just vast, deep woods all around. Usually, in places like these, I would hear the typical rainforest sounds every time, but that day was different. I stopped for a while and had my breakfast on the side of the road. Ox was parked on a grassy part, while my food and hot coffee were placed on top of the gas tank and seat. While I took a sip of my hot drink, I heard what seemed to be giggling sounds behind me. It was almost as if children were playing nearby. I looked around but saw nothing, so I ignored it, thinking it was a bird. When I bit into my food, I heard it again. Something felt off, because the surroundings fell silent and all I heard was the giggling getting closer from behind. I packed my stuff and unlocked the pin holding my knife. I know I sound like a coward, but I'd experienced the paranormal since childhood, and sometimes it can get physically dangerous. I relaxed a bit trying to focus to where the sound was coming from. I thought about this giggling sound and figured it could be two things. One, just a playful spirit teasing me. Two, it could be a bad one that follows you home so it can torment you for life. My grandparents told me that I needed to be respectful towards such beings, but I should never show weakness nor fear. I pulled out my 14-inch blade and took a stance as if I was ready to strike whatever would jump out of the woods. The ordeal lasted for about five minutes. It was quiet. I could hear my heartbeat and breathing. Then I spoke in a very serious tone, 
stating, Sorry if I disturbed you. I'm just resting, and I'll be on my way now. It was still silent, and after a few seconds, the normal forest sounds returned. The area felt somewhat the same again. I said thank you, and I went on my way. I made it to the small village, consisting of no more than 25 houses. I made it to my client, and he offered me coffee. I got his payment, which was three months due. While resting a bit, I recalled what happened. My client suddenly asked me if I encountered any other problems along the way. I said there was nothing else, but I asked why. He told me that one of the villagers died not too long ago. It was very sudden. One day that villager changed and acted odd, becoming paranoid for seemingly no reason, shouting in the middle of the night and running away to God knows where. He went missing for days and was found dead under a tree. The elder shaman said the poor man was haunted by an evil spirit, and it took his soul. The man was never a brave one to begin with, and was easily scared by anything. I thought about what my client said and bid him farewell. I rode down the mountain and passed the spot where I rested and had no other issues. I went home exhausted and dropped onto my bed. I remembered the events that happened and thought about what I encountered back there. Was it the same evil spirit? Did I have a standoff against it and prevail? I had no idea, but I knew for sure that with my line of work, it would not be the last time that I'd encounter such incidents. The Sasquatch Stalker From Crystal Holly 22 Location, North Carolina. This story happened when I was 12 or 13. I was getting off at my usual bus stop at about 4.30 p.m. in the evening. From there, I had an eight-minute walk down a sort of long, cracked road. Where I lived was a new housing development, and because of this, on my left side of the road was pure swamp and dense woods, while on my right, there were a few houses here and there. As I was walking home, I felt this unease, as if I was being watched. Now, to be honest, I did get this feeling a lot when I was in or near the woods, so I blew off the feeling, chalking it up to me just being scared. At most, it was just some territorial forest animal watching me. As I continued, the feeling of being watched never left. I was about 70 yards from my home when I heard it, the sound of something walking in the woods, leaves and branches breaking underneath heavy feet. It sounded as if the creature was following me while using the forest as cover to not be seen. So I stopped in my tracks to see if I could see anything in the forest, to see what or who was walking around. But I saw nothing, nothing at all. I thought maybe it was all in my head, but as soon as I began walking again, that thing in the woods started to walk as well. So I stopped walking once more, and it stopped. Then I started walking again, and it started. This creature was following me and walking the same pace as me, stopping when I stopped and walking when I walked. I found this quite odd, but this seemed to be as if the creature was stalking me. It was watching me. But why? Was it making sure I didn't approach it or come anywhere close to it? Suddenly, I saw a small rock flying at me. Not sure what to do, I picked a small rock up and threw it back into the woods. I wanted to see how the creature would react. Would it run away or would it follow me still? But nothing happened. No sounds of running or walking occurred. Assuming the creature was still there, I hurried the rest of my way home into the backyard, where my father was, to tell him about my experience. After telling him and my younger brother about the experience, I also went to tell my younger neighbor about it. Together, we decided we'd go into the woods to see if we could find what we all now thought was a Bigfoot. My dad and I loved watching mountain monsters, 
so we decided we'd do what they did when hunting for a supposed Bigfoot. We grabbed a big stick and hit a tree with three large hits. Nothing at first, so my dad hit the tree three more times. That's when he yelled at us that he saw something behind a big fallen tree trunk. At first, we thought he was seeing things until I saw a dark figure behind that trunk. It had thick, dark, brownish fur. The creature was huge, very huge, even though it was crouched. Wanting to catch its attention, I picked a thicker branch and slammed it into a tree three times. For a minute, it was quiet. Then my dad yelled to run. We listened and came bustling out of the forest to the neighbor's house. Safe and out of the woods, I asked my dad, why'd you tell us to run? He calmly tells me that when I wasn't paying attention, the creature behind the fallen trunk began to rise and stand up. My dad, not wanting to be there any longer, had us run. I don't know what would have happened if we stayed there longer. I love going in the woods, and I still do, but this encounter is one of the many encounters from the woods that is still burned into my memory. A reminder that the forest hides more than just coyotes and bears. It can hide much bigger and scarier creatures that you really don't want to ever encounter. Bigfoot? From Rango. I've lived in California my whole life. I'm an avid houndsman, meaning I hunt animals using hound dogs. I hunt fox, raccoons, and I used to hunt bears up until 2012 when it became illegal in California. I was never afraid of the woods, never believed in any myths or legends, and I still don't. But one thing is for sure. On July 7th of 1998, I have no explanation for what in the world my dogs put up a tree. It was incredibly hot in the summer, and going through the thick manzanitas and brush usually forced us to wear long sleeves, so during summer we hunted at night. It was the usual, get up at 2.30, eat, and get the dogs fed and ready to go. I loaded the dogs in the truck and headed to my favorite spot. It was the roughest country around, so no one really hunted it, making the bears quite abundant in there. You may leave your truck at 5 in the morning to go to a tree and not get back till 8 in the afternoon. Anyway, I got up into the mountains. I put the telemetry tracking collars on my dogs so I could know where they were. After about 45 minutes of driving around, I noticed the dogs could smell something. I figured it was just a cold bear track, so I turned them loose and taunted them to run it. They walked the track for about an hour before they took off barking like bats out of heck. I could tell that they had caught up to it and were on its tail. The race was over quickly and the dogs were treed, meaning whatever they were chasing stopped and climbed a tree, and the dogs will sit at the tree and bark at it. I could hear them deep in the canyon, so I packed my gear and headed in. About halfway there, my heart skipped a beat. I could hear something clear as day screaming and roaring like an African lion. So I got there as soon as I could, the whole way listening to this deafening sound that sent chills down my spine. I finally got there. This was one of the biggest trees I'd ever seen, and whatever was up there was causing it to shake back and forth, and the yelling and roaring hadn't stopped. Now, the number one rule of hunting with dogs at night is don't turn on your light at the tree because whatever's up there will come down and run. It was no bear. Bears don't sound like that and can't shake a tree like that. And bears are supposed to be the biggest things out here. Or so I thought. After some thinking, I said screw it and leashed up my dogs and headed back up the hill. I never shined my light up there to see what it was. The whole time I was on my way back, I could hear this thing still screaming and roaring. I was a good five minutes from the truck when I noticed from its yelling that whatever this is, it was moving towards me fast. I ran to the truck, loaded the dogs up, and by now this thing was so close I could hear it stomping through the woods. I got in my truck and punched it, 
The entire way out of the woods, I could hear it yelling and roaring off the road in the canyon. It was so close, I could have hit it with a rock. The scariest thing was that it was keeping up with my truck until eventually I hit pavement and sped up to 95 miles per hour. I never slowed until I got to town. Like I said, I never believed in legends or myths, and I still don't, but that was no bear that chased me and my dogs that night. I'm not saying it's Bigfoot, but I'm also not saying it isn't. Bigfoot in Utah from Anonymous Last summer, I went camping in the High Uinta Mountains with my two brothers-in-law and my father-in-law. Due to COVID and my wife and I recently having a baby, it was the first time I'd really gotten out in a long time. I'd recently purchased a new, well, to me, Toyota Land Cruiser and a new hammock and wanted to test them out camping. I don't want to give specifics to where I was camping as it's a bit of a family secret. However, let's say it's remote. It's about 2.5 hours of a drive from where I live in the valley. Once we arrived at our campsite, we unpacked our gear. We were in an area with mature pine trees and aspens. It's beautiful and a cool 65 degrees or so in the summer. There was still runoff from all the melting snow and my new vehicle was super muddy, which I didn't mind. We circled our vehicles around the camp to give us a little bit of privacy. Not that we were planning on seeing anyone anyway. I decided to set up my hammock from the top of my Toyota and attach it to an adjacent tree. It was so high, I needed to climb up onto the vehicle just to get in my hammock. I like to set it super high as sometimes it slides down the tree while you're sleeping and you end up with your back rubbing on some bushes or rocks. My hammock was probably a good six and a half feet in the air. I insulated my hammock as it usually gets cold out at night. I also stuffed my sleeping bag in there. Once I finished with my bed, I began getting the fire ready. I'd finished before the rest of my family had. I got a fire going in no time and began to roast some hot dogs when the rest of my family came to relax with me. My father-in-law had accidentally cut himself with the axe while cutting wood and actually drove himself back into town to get some stitches. We expected him to come back, but we weren't sure how long that would be exactly. Despite that incident, we had a nice night in the camp. It was relatively bright outside due to it being a full moon. You don't realize how much a full moon can light up those woods. It's crazy. As we were getting ready for bed, without my father-in-law, a white Silverado pulled up. A park ranger got out and approached us. He was friendly. He wanted to know if we'd seen anyone else since we had set up camp. We told him he was the only person we'd seen for miles. He let us know that a camp a couple of miles away had reported a homeless man going through their stuff and throwing things at them. The ranger was trying to find him. Not only that, but it's pretty rugged terrain and it's possible he could get hurt out here. We told him we'd keep our eyes peeled and didn't think much of it. Besides, we were in bear and moose country, and I had my 45 70 lever action rifle in my Toyota. That should take down any animal in North America. I felt pretty secure. Not only that, but I had camped in these mountains my entire life and had experienced all of the wildlife, including a bull moose charge and a friendly visit with a bear who tried to take some fish I'd got. Anyway, we all climbed into our hammocks, as I lay in my hammock, I could make out where my two brothers were sleeping fairly well due to the full moon. I heard one of them snoring almost right away. It wasn't long before I drifted to sleep too, enjoying the sounds of the wind through the trees and the rocking of my hammock. I awoke in the middle of the night because I felt something hit me. I searched my hammock and found what it was. It was a pine cone. One end of my hammock was attached to a pine tree after all, so I fell back asleep. But then, a second pine cone hit me. This time, it hit my back. Since I was in my hammock, I could feel it pretty easily. At this point, I was suspicious that my brothers-in-law were playing a prank on me. 
I peeked out of my hammock and found both of them sleeping in their hammocks. I looked the other direction away from camp into the woods, but I didn't see anything. I was a little bit spooked as I thought about what the park ranger mentioned earlier. I jumped out of my hammock and opened the door to my vehicle to get my rifle. I was gonna cuddle it tonight, just in case. I honestly felt stupid that I was that scared, but I figured it wouldn't hurt anyway. At this point, I also realized my father-in-law wasn't back yet. This made me a little worried that maybe he just went home instead of driving all the way back out here. Or maybe he got stuck in the mud. I considered waking my brothers up, but decided against it. I still heard one of them snoring. I crawled back into my sleeping bag, this time with my rifle, and tried to go back to sleep. I would drift off only to hear a noise that made my heart stop. What was it? Was it branches breaking, footsteps, or just the wind? I made a mental note that I didn't really want to sleep overnight in a hammock again. Next time I'd bring a tent, it seems at least slightly more secure. Just then, I noticed headlights coming up the trail, and the distinct sound of my father-in-law's Jeep Cherokee in four-wheel drive. He'd made it back. When he got out of the vehicle, he walked right up to my hammock, not expecting me to be awake. I greeted him and asked how the hospital was. But he seemed panicked. He told me when he pulled up to camp, he noticed what he thought was a man in a ghillie suit, creeping away from the camp. He knew I had a tendency to put on my ghillie suit and prank them, so he was checking to see if it was me. But he was freaked out to find it wasn't me this time or any of his sons. I felt a chill, and I thought about the pine cones and the sounds I'd heard that I brushed off. We were worried it was the homeless man. Was he crazy? Homicidal? Or just liked messing with people? Well, we made it through the night unscathed and without further incident. But I didn't really sleep much after that. We stopped at the ranger station the next morning and found the same park ranger there finishing his shift. We told him the homeless man had found his way over to us and he was wearing a ghillie suit. The park ranger's blood left his face, and I thought that was weird. It was just a homeless dude after all, right? What's the big deal? Well, at this point, it had dawned on me that perhaps it wasn't a homeless man at all. Rather, a Bigfoot. The Uintas are teeming with legends of Bigfoot, and the legendary Skinwalker Ranch isn't super far from where we were. Strangely, the ranger didn't have much to say after that. I didn't tell my father-in-law what I thought, as he had mentioned to me a while earlier that he doesn't believe in Bigfoot and thinks it's foolish. So I didn't want to look dumb, but to me, it really seems rather Bigfooty. A Canadian Horror Story From Sugar Lump When I was little, my entire family would rent a huge cottage every summer in Halliburton, Ontario. It was a week-long family reunion that was super fun for us kids, but now that I'm an adult, I shudder at the idea of being crammed in one house for a week with 20 other people. When I was about 10, we rented a cottage on a lake that bordered some protected land, so there were no cottages on the opposite side of the lake, just a really tall hill. The lake was not very wide, so the hill was quite close in view. It was so serene and beautiful. A few days into our stay, there was a collective effort to go golfing for the afternoon. My grandmother and I were the only two people who stayed behind, as we relished the idea of peace and quiet, and to avoid golf. My grandma decided to take a nap on the couch while I sat on the dock listening to the water while doodling in my sketchbook. Just as described by so many outdoor paranormal events, everything went silent, extra silent. One moment you could hear the birds, insects, and trees rustling. The next it was as if I had gone deaf, but the water continued to gently touch the wood of the dock. I'm going to sound crazy in the next part. My head shot up to a series of loud booming noises coming from across the lake. Just like in a cartoon when a giant walks, you feel and hear a boom, 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 left foot, then right foot, and repeat. 
I could see trees rattling high up on the hill. And then out of nowhere, a bone-chilling shriek came thundering down at me. I don't know how to describe it, other than to say it wasn't a normal animal, but also not something a human could muster. I could feel that scream shoot into my body with such intensity that I quite literally shut down from fear. I sat there, frozen, until I heard my grandma smash the porch door open and call out for me. I didn't answer, and she came running over to look down at me on the dock. As she stood there looking at me, confirming I wasn't the culprit to the noise, a massive rock came flying from the trees on the other side of the lake and splashed into the water with a huge aftershock. This time, my grandma shouted for me to get my butt up there, and I felt the will to run return and bolted for her. We locked ourselves in the cottage, and she drew the curtains. She demanded to know what happened, and I explained with tears in my eyes. We sat together in the quiet of the cottage for over an hour, until my family returned from their afternoon of golf. When they got back, my grandma asked me not to tell any of my cousins what happened, as I was the oldest, and I shouldn't just scare them like that. We should keep this to ourselves. It was probably just some teenagers causing mischief, she said with assurance. When I told my dad about it later, he had already heard the grown-up version smoothing it over as nothing and never believed me. My mother, who was not part of this family trip, having divorced many years previous, is Mohawk native and told me stories of monster bears, creatures with skin as hard as stone, and of course the rendition of Sasquatch she heard growing up. She was not concerned by my story and only commented that we were probably too close to its land that they meant no harm as long as we didn't come closer. Backyard Bigfoot From Listener I've seen many animals I haven't recognized, and sometimes I put them in the category of unknown creatures. This one was unlike any creature I've ever seen, but I know it must be a Bigfoot. Not long ago, I was in my room with my cat, Tiger Stripe who I'd recently got and named her that because of her tiger stripes on her fur. She's a really chill cat, with the personality of a dog. Anyway, I was in my room reading a book and randomly lifting my head up to look out the window. Tiger Stripe was in the floor licking herself vigorously. The place was otherwise quiet. Always quiet. I'm the type of person who really doesn't like very loud noises, and I'm glad Tiger Stripe doesn't really make much noise. The only time she does is when she's hungry. Getting a bit bored, I decided to get off my bed and go into the backyard to sit there to get some fresh air in my nose. As usual, Tiger Stripe followed me. She always did. Makes me wonder what she'd do if I wasn't around. Off I went, down the stairs, and into the backyard. It was warm. The type of warm I could stand. I rested myself on the chair I've got on the backyard porch. Tiger Stripe flies past me, running around as if she's never been outside forever. I smile. The only thing I hear is the sound of vehicles speeding past, the occasional sound of scampering little animals trying to flee from my cat, and my breathing. It was the afternoon, about to be evening. I was supposed to have a friend over, but due to some problems in her family, she wasn't able to come and join me. Eventually, my eyes began to feel heavy. I'm not sure why. I had just slept not long before. I started a battle between falling asleep and staying awake. It was hard because I didn't want to fall asleep while Tiger Stripe was out and about, running all over the place. What if someone or something comes and takes her away? What if she tried to wake me up but I didn't respond? Even though I tried to fight back the sleepiness, it won out, and I was out like a light. I don't even think it was long before I felt paws on my face. Tiger Stripe. I instantly remembered I was watching my cat, and I shot up. It seemed that she was looking relieved that I was awake. But I wasn't relieved. The next thing I knew, Tiger Stripe started to meow frantically and hissed to her right. I've never heard her hiss like that before. Yeah, she's hissed before, but not in this way. 
All her fur shot up, as if it was going to fly up in all sorts of directions. Her teeth were fully exposed. I even saw a trickle of drool drip down her mouth as she had the most demonic glare I've ever seen. Something was wrong. Tiger Stripe began to move, and something in me told me to follow her. So I did. She soon led me to the right side of the fence. She was frantically looking back at me, then back in that direction, as if to tell me, do you see that? It's right there, it's right there. But I didn't yet see anything. I know cats can see better than people, but I stay still as Tiger Stripe starts to hiss loudly again. Finally, I saw it. This thing, whatever I was looking at, was about seven feet tall. My mind automatically went to Bigfoot, as it matched what a Bigfoot looked like. Tall, hairy, huge. It stared down at my cat. I don't know if it was glaring at her or just taking a look at her because of its hair covering its face. Then it looked up to me. No, it didn't have the cliché glowing eyes people often describe on unknown creatures. It was making this huffing sound, as if it had just run ten miles. Then I remembered I had my shotgun upstairs in my room, but it was too far. At least this Bigfoot began to slowly walk further away from where me and Tigerstripe were, and as it vanished, Tigerstripe began to calm down and walked back into my house quietly. I did the same, this time following her instead of her following me. That night, I thought about all the situations that could have happened there. Maybe the Bigfoot was just there not to bother anyone. Maybe it was hungry and it set its eyes upon my cat to feast upon her, or to prey upon me. But I'm very thankful it didn't attack. Who knows what would have happened if it did. The Snowstorm from Dutch Vanderlint 5 it was 1987. I lived in a very isolated area, which some can see as a good thing and others see it as a bad thing. I personally find living in an isolated area better than living in the city. You just have so much more freedom, but also much more danger. One of these dangers was wolves that ran past my house on occasion, but I didn't think much of them as I always scared them away with my rifle. A couple of miles down the road is a small village, which I had many friends living in. The elders always told stories of the Yeti. They always said to never go out at night, otherwise the Yeti would catch you. I didn't think much of these stories, as I'd been out hunting at night many times, and I had never seen a white ape-like creature that kills people. One night I'd run out of supplies and went out to hunt a deer. I grabbed my rifle and went out. Once I got what I left for, I began traveling back home with the deer on my back. I was pretty stocky back then, and I did this for many years, so everything was going normally until I noticed something strange. I heard and saw nothing. No deer, no wolves, no bears, no wildlife. And I had this sudden gut feeling that told me I needed to get home as quickly as possible. I listened and when I made it back, I forgot about the feeling pretty quickly. That night, I prepared the deer and cooked some of it. Nice and tasty, and it would keep me fed for a while. A couple of days later, I went out hunting deer again. I went to a spot where I knew a lot of deer gathered to eat, but nothing was there, and as I sat there waiting, nothing came. Suddenly, I got this weird feeling again as if I was being watched. But I needed food, so I stayed a bit longer, hoping and waiting a deer would come. Eventually, I spotted one. I killed it and made my way home. Once again, I prepared the deer, cooked some and ate it, and I put the remaining pieces in my fridge. I decided to go to bed. I woke up a couple of hours later, due to what sounded like ticking on the window. I grabbed my gun and looked around. I wanted to go outside and investigate, but my gut feeling was back. It told me that if I went out, I would never see the light of day again. 
Eventually, I went back to bed, but once I'd laid down again, I saw something through my bedroom window. A hand. Carefully, slowly, and quietly, I walked over to it, and I saw what was out there. A large creature covered in white fur. It saw me as soon as I peered out the window. It had blood all over its mouth. I ran outside and shot at it, but it managed to get away. I think I may have wounded it, as there was a big trail of blood, but I decided not to pursue it, and I got back into my house, unable to sleep the rest of the night. After all, that blood came from somewhere, and if my shot had missed, then that wasn't its blood. If you ever find yourself in the Himalayan mountains at night, beware the Yeti. Pagan Sasquatch from Alice the Slug Queen. I was cherry picking with a couple of friends. We'll jokingly call them Ben and Jerry. It was the summer of 2015. One night, in between moving to another orchard, we chose to camp somewhere to take a break from the work. We walked into a little known park in the forest at sunset, so we didn't have much time to find a camping spot. Off the path, we found a nice forested area with an opening in the trees, where the others could fit their tents. There was a couple who joined me and my two friends. Ben and Jerry both offered that I could sleep in their tents, but to avoid any awkwardness, I said I was fine with just my sleeping bag, especially since I didn't notice any bugs around either. That night, we made a little fire along the creekside on the rocks, cooked some canned foods, and drank a little bit of wine. The moonlight was so bright that we didn't even need a fire to see clearly. We walked back into the forest just several meters away and went to sleep. Sometime in the night, I woke up slowly from what sounded like footsteps of a large animal walking down the rocky creek side, closer and closer. The steps got so loud that I started to fear the size of this animal. At this point, I was fully awake. The rocks around there were pretty large, so this thing had to be massive to make those sounds. I assumed it was a bear, and that I'd be okay. Hopefully he would just sniff me and leave, but then I turned over and realized I'd left all my food just sitting out, like the carefree hippie I was. Imagining the bear getting that close to me, I started to panic. I was terrified. At this point, I could hear this animal walking off the rocks and onto the dirt path into the forest where we were camped, just meters away from my feet. I could hear it right freaking there. The moon was bright enough I would have been able to see it if I looked up, as where I lay was directly in line with the path from the forest to the creek. I was ready to run. I thought if I continued to lay here, I'm sure it would hear my heartbeat with the amount of fear I felt. I lifted my head and saw nothing but the moonlight reflecting from the creek. I stuck to the plan and I ran over to Jerry's tent. I screamed for him to help me unzip the tent. I was so freaked out. I cried and we heard nothing out there. Why did I see nothing, I wondered. It should have been right there. I heard it walk for so long, long enough to know it was not a dream. In the morning... My friends found no footprints and didn't believe my story. They said I was dreaming, but I know me. I know what I heard. A dream? Bullcrap. The summer after that, Ben and I were hanging out. I told him I could not stop thinking about that night. I felt drawn to go there again. I wanted to know what I heard and what I should have saw. We drove there one day in the summer of 2016, and before walking into the same forest part that we camped in last year, I told him, I feel like there's something more to this place. We're going to see something else. In the dirt pathway from the creek to our old campsite, exactly where I believed I would have seen the animal, where it sounded like it should have been, there was a large rock with the symbol perhaps burnt into it. I was amazed. I turned around to tell Ben but I saw him focused on rock formations that I walked past without noticing, all in the area where we'd been camping that one night. 
They were shaped in huge circles and lines. There were also weird little half-dome structures made of sticks all around us, built against the trees. I told Ben I needed to walk in the other area of the forest where we hadn't been. I felt there was something over there. While walking through, I stopped and got a wave of fear. I felt as if we were being watched. We got through the path to another opening in the forest and saw many more little half-dome structures everywhere. There was a rope tied horizontally from one tree to another with several strings hanging vertically from it with wire-wrapped stones and some with dangling bones. On the tree next to this was a long string hanging from a branch of a bag of bones wrapped in gold silk. I touched it before seeing the bones poking out. That was the point that me and Ben both said we need to leave. We both believed we were being watched. We were so intrigued by what we saw we went back a week later, but I brought my friend Wiz who practices paganism. He was curious because of a photo of the same symbol on the rock that I showed him. He said it means a symbol of protection. We got to the camping spot and saw the rock formations had changed since the week before. There were now rose petals covering the ground. We were there for only a few moments before a swarm of mosquitoes thickened the air. It was something I've never seen before. I couldn't help but think we were what someone was trying to protect this area from. I'll never forget the intuition that drove me to that place and led me through it. I'll never forget the sounds of the footsteps of that thing. I know someone else is just as drawn to that place as I am. I don't know if I'll ever understand what really happened. I recently watched the horror film, The Ritual, and inside the house they sleep in that terrifies the characters, were the same symbols I saw in that forest. Algi's protection, meaning divine protection, sanctuary, and Othala ancestral, meaning inherited property, genetics. My friend believes in the possibility of this animal being a Sasquatch. Stories have told that these creatures have powers to reveal themselves if they choose to or not. That was the weirdest experience I've ever had that I'm open to any possible ideas. The Witch of Donner Farm From Harsh Truth In the 1980s, when I was around seven or eight years old, my dad's dad died. He'd lost a long-fought battle against cancer. I hate to say it like this, but I remember my family feeling relieved. The stress and pain my grandfather suffered was finally over. Now, my grandfather had been a man who saved his money, but never came around to spending it. And as my grandmother had long since passed, my father received everything from his father's will. My family received over $60,000 in the will. And after some time planning and discussing with my mother, my dad decided to put it towards his dream home. He wanted to return to the country lifestyle he grew up in. He thought the fields and woods would be a better place to raise my older brother and I. Soon my parents purchased a beautiful ranch style home with 80 acres of land, much of which still had to be financed, but the inheritance did cover most of it. I remember when I first walked through the doorway of my childhood home. It smelled of well-kept wood, the scent of freshly cut grass wafting in from the open front door. My mother left it up to my brother and I to decide between ourselves which rooms were ours. This would be my first time having a room to myself. I was so excited that I didn't care much which room my brother picked. I wish I would have cared, though. I ended up with the room furthest from my parents' room. This room was sizable, with two windows overlooking the fields outside. It also had a big closet that I had no idea what to do with. A lot of space for a boy who kept his clothes in a dresser. It was on the very first day we were there when the strange occurrences began. Having told our parents which rooms we decided on, we started to unpack separately in our rooms. 
I was sitting in the back corner of the closet of my room, figuring out how to stack my collection of board games, the only things I could think of to place in there at the time. I'd left my closet door open, as well as my bedroom door, so that lights from the house and from outside would shine into the closet. The closet did have its own light source, one of those light bulbs with a pull string, but I had a lot of trouble reaching it, so I didn't want to bother with it. I recall having just set down my Monopoly box when the closet door slammed shut. Instantly, I shot up and turned around. Without any light from the outside, the closet was pitch black, save for the narrow crack under the door. Uneasy, I called out my brother's name, assuming he was joking with me. There was no reply. I ran toward the door using the crack of light at the bottom as my guide. Then I scoured the dark for the doorknob. Relief filled me when I found it, until I tried to turn it. It wouldn't budge. It didn't make sense. The closet door didn't have a lock on the inside or outside of it. Why wouldn't it turn? A scared child, I could only assume my older brother was on the other side holding the doorknob still. We liked to joke with each other as all brothers do, but he had never been one to prank me like this. He was as much scared of the dark as I was. Moments after realizing trying to open the door was futile, I turned back toward the center of the closet and reached my hand upward, looking for the string to the light, or rather feeling for it. It was difficult for me to reach, but I knew if I could just feel the tip, I could jump up and yank it down and the darkness would disappear. The longer I stepped blindly through the dark, the faster my heart pounded. Being engulfed in darkness was a nightmare come true. Little did I know things would get worse. I did finally feel the small caplet at the end of the string. Before I could jump up and attempt to yank the cord down, I felt something that took my breath away an icy cold hand. From behind me, it placed itself on my neck and slowly ran up my cheek. I jumped and screamed so loud some of the blood vessels in my face busted. I practically tackled the wall next to me to get around the thing that had touched me because it had come from the direction of the door. Quickly, I scuttled toward the door and began to pound against it, screaming for anyone that might hear me. Moments later, my dad pulled the door open from the other side. I nearly fell on my face. I crawled out and immediately looked back into the closet. The darkness now cowered away from the light that flowed back through the open door. The closet, except for my board game stack in the back, was empty. My dad picked me up and embraced me and looked at my face. Ah, uh, buddy, did you lock yourself in there? Jeez, look at your face. He wiped tears away from my red cheeks. As he carried me to his and my mom's room to comfort me, I couldn't bring myself to tell him that the door didn't have a lock, but I did manage to tell both of them what happened in there, but they blamed it on my intense fear of the dark. Specifically, my mom said being that scared can make you see or feel things that aren't there. She compared it to seeing figures or faces in the dark when what you're actually looking at is a coat rack or a chair. As much as I loved my parents, I did not agree with a word of what they said. The hand I'd felt so long ago there was vividly real, and I remember it clearly even now. That hand was not my own, nor was it my imagination. Later on, when Dad went to my closet one night to grab one of my board games, I watched him do a double take when he opened the door. It was the first time he'd actually taken a look at it. My dad looked the doorknob over on both sides and raised an eyebrow. Hey, buddy, he said as he checked out the closet door. If you go in here, make sure you don't close the door or you might get stuck in there again. There's no lock, so it's probably just warped or something. I nodded and did my best to believe him. Over the next few months, small but weird and creepy things would happen, particularly in that part of the house towards my room. 
Dirty clothes I'd lay in the bedroom floor would often wind up inside the closet floor the next morning. When I began closing the closet door every night out of fear of the darned thing, it would always be open in the morning. One day when I was out playing after having cleaned my room, my mom called me back inside absolutely furious. When I went back inside to my room where my mom was, she was fuming because of how trashed my room had become. She thought I hadn't cleaned it, but the state it was suddenly in was worse than I'd ever seen it before. Every drawer in my dresser had been pulled out and dumped out. My blanket and sheet from my bed had been pulled off and tossed over the closet door which was now open. And inside the closet were hundreds of board game pieces as someone had dumped each of the boxes out onto the floor. I was flabbergasted, but no matter what I said to my mom, she wasn't having it. She demanded I clean my room properly before I was allowed to come out of the room. Obviously, I was upset, but I did as she said. I cleaned as fast as I could, folded all my clothes again, remade my bed, then stood at the opening to my closet. I couldn't bring myself to walk in there alone, especially after something or someone had just ruined my room, and I know it wasn't me or my brother, because we'd been outside, and why would my parents mess up my room? Deep down, I knew it was the thing in the closet. I stayed in that room two hours longer than I had to, unwilling to enter that closet to pick up the board game pieces. But when my stomach began to growl, and the smell of homemade fried chicken filled the air, I forced myself up and into the closet. It took me a few tries, but I managed to jump up and catch the string to the light bulb. So at least I'd have some light if I did get stuck in there again. Quickly, I started to pick up the pieces on the floor. It was a pain matching them up with the right boxes, as about a dozen different games had been mixed up. Every few seconds, I glanced at the closet door making sure it stayed open. I thought nothing would happen if that door was open. I thought nothing could happen if the light was on. I was wrong. I picked up the final piece eventually, a small white ball that I'm pretty sure belonged in the Hungry Hungry Hippos box. I threw it in, closed up the box, and turned around. I stopped. A woman stood in the doorway. Her feminine shape made me first think it was my mother, but she was taller than my mother. Her hair was a mess and went down to her ribs. She stood facing away from me in a stained but light blue dress. She appeared to be looking out the windows of my bedroom. My voice failed me. I wanted to speak to her, but I had no idea what to say. I wanted to think it was some long-lost relative coming for a visit that I'd never met before, and I hadn't known was coming. Denial is a powerful thing. The woman breathed in and out so slowly that I didn't hear her first breath until long after I studied her. Her breath was extremely slow and troubled, as if she'd been a smoker for multiple lifetimes. Then she lifted a bony finger and pointed towards one of the windows. I swear I heard her speak then. I think she said, Such a nice day. Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, my vision was obstructed. I flinched away first thinking that I'd suddenly gone blind, but as my hands felt up towards my face, I found greasy, messy hair covering my small form. Then, that slow, struggling breathing came from behind me. This woman was no longer in the doorway. She stood right behind me, with her hair draped over me. I screamed then, and I ran forward, where I last saw the open closet door. And Christ, this sounds crazy, but the few feet I ran to escape that closet, each inch of the way I floundered through that hair. Her breathing stayed in the same spot in the closet, but the hair seemed infinite 
as if it no longer came from her head and instead hung from the ceiling. Only when I burst out of the closet did the hair finally come to an end. I turned to shut the door and found once again the closet empty. These are a couple of my most terrifying experiences with what I would eventually refer to as the Witch of Donner Farm. Donner was the name of one of the previous owners of the land. I wish I could say I figured out who she was, that we moved, that it all stopped, but we didn't move, and it never did stop. It would happen randomly and things might calm down for months at a time, but she was always there, seemingly preferring my side of the house. The experiences only stopped after I moved out at the age of 20. If you want to hear more of these experiences, let me know. I'm sure most of you won't believe me. I wish I could sleep a bit better at night. The Witches in the Texas Woods From Skip McGrip 3 I live in the downtown area of a major Texas city. To get away from the city and enjoy the outdoors and some alone time, I would make the hour and a half drive almost every weekend to a small cabin that my folks have in the woods. I've been hanging out at that cabin in those woods almost my entire life, so I felt pretty comfortable there. The area doesn't have many people living there and it's relatively safe. So one weekend, I took some of my friends out there to fish and spend some time away from the city. While fishing on the bank of the river that runs near my folks' cabin, we pulled up some chairs, started a fire, drank a few beers, and watched the sun go down behind the trees. That's the good stuff right there. After sitting around for a few hours, I suggested we go hunting the next morning for breakfast. The guys weren't big fans of the idea of waking up early to crawl around in the woods looking for something to eat. They would have rather stayed up all night drinking and fishing, and wake up late the next day. Let's just go hunting now, said one of them. Everyone else agreed and started getting rowdy. I stayed put in my chair and replied, No, no, it's too late. It's too dark. We wouldn't be able to see a thing out there, man. Plus, those dang witches. Everyone knew I made a good point, but then one of them said, Whoa, wait, what do you mean witches? What are witches anyway, like really? I laughed a bit because they all seemed so intrigued and all of a sudden so focused. So I began telling the story of the last time I went camping and hunting in the woods around my parents' cabin. It was just like any other camping hunting trip I'd gone out on. I'd packed a backpack with all the necessities, a 22 long rifle, and an M&P 45 that I always carry. I parked my truck at my folks and walked down the dirt road until it disappeared into the woods. I make a point to not overhunt in any one area, so I hiked in a direction I knew I'd never hunted in. After a few hours of hiking, I found a good clearing in the woods that would have allowed for a good amount of moonlight once it got dark. I don't use a tent when I camp alone, so setting up my camp was fairly easy. I got a fire going and I hurried off to find some small game for dinner before it got too dark. After bagging a few squirrels and a rabbit, I started to head back to my campsite. The night had already started to settle in, so it was getting quite dark on me. I took a moment to light my lantern that was hanging off my backpack. I poured some lantern oil in it and lit it. A few hundred yards later, I heard movement in the distance. Obviously, while moving through the woods with a backpack with a rifle strapped to it, you make a lot of noise yourself. However, the noises that came from deeper in the trees have a distinct sound, like an echo or a reverberation. So when I heard movement coming from somewhere else other than myself, I froze, staying completely still and listening. There was nothing. My brain started reasoning as fast as it could and concluded that a branch might have fallen, or a deer got spooked and hightailed it out of the area. That was good enough for me. So I continued on through the dark in the direction I knew my campsite was. Compasses don't lie, 
and I'd learned how to use them and rely on them by this point in my life. I heard it again, though. Noises coming from my right, north of where I was. And this time, I almost thought I heard a yell of some kind. Again, I froze, thinking, coyotes. I'm not too worried about coyotes, so I continued. The way back was starting to feel really long, though. But hiking through the woods during the day is very different than hiking through the woods at night. You usually hike slower, watching your steps more carefully, so it's not unusual that a hike the same distance could take longer at night than during the day. Before I go on, I feel like I should say that I was recently married at the time, probably less than a year at that point. Like I wrote before, I traveled a lot throughout my life, and homesickness was not something I was familiar with, until I met my wife. I'll call her Juliet here. We met when we were both 18, and up until then, I had never missed my home or anyone really, whenever I was away. But once we started dating, I began to finally experience the feeling of being homesick whenever I was away for too long, and in some cases, not long at all. That Friday evening, I left for the woods, I got home from work and sat down with Juliet for dinner before leaving. It had only been a few hours since I last saw Juliet, and yet I missed her so badly in those woods. So much so that I think I almost felt pain. Having said that, I think it'll make what happened next a little more creepy. Anyway, I had heard something. I froze and I stood still in the dark woods and turned to my right. I was deeply confused because I knew what I just heard. It was Juliet calling me. Although it sounded like she was a bit far, there was no doubt it was Juliet. What's she doing out here? There must be some emergency. I, I gotta find her. She's probably been calling my phone, and it's not even on. Something bad must have happened. I thought, as my mind raced, to rationalize and come up with a realistic conclusion. Chip! Chip, chip, chip. She yelled through the trees in the distance. My name isn't Chip, but it's what Juliet calls me, and only Juliet. I basically jogged through the dark forest towards where I last heard her, stopping every now and then to listen for her again. Eventually, I had to stop because I had not heard Juliet yell for a while. I stood there quietly panicking for what must have been five minutes but every second was torturous. I felt like I failed to find my wife, to help her. She came all the way out here to find me because she needed me and I couldn't even find my way to her. And then I heard her again. Chip! 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 Her voice quietly resonated through the tall trees, and she sounded like she was in pain. I began to walk as quietly as I could towards her so I could hear her if she called out to me again, and she did. She sounded noticeably closer. I was relieved as I felt myself getting closer and closer to Juliet. Chip, 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 chip. This time I felt alarmed. I felt like I was about to be in danger, but I shook it off and continued toward my wife. Chip, 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 chip. Again, I heard her calling me, but she didn't sound quite right. It was as if she was in pain, but also like it wasn't her at all. Just like two different people can say the same things in the same pitch and rhythm, but they can never sound exactly like each other. Like there was someone else pretending to be Juliet and mimicking her voice. But I had heard her so clearly just a few moments ago. I figured she was choking up trying not to cry, so I kept moving. Again and again I heard Juliet calling me as I walked closer and closer. Each time she called, though, her voice sounded less and less like her. By the time she sounded like she was only ten or so yards away, I was on high alert. It sounded nothing like her by then. Whoever it was calling me, she wanted me to believe she was Juliet, and by then I knew for sure it wasn't her. I approached carefully with my handgun drawn. This person wasn't moving one bit, but I could tell where she was. I walked closer, inch by inch, holding my lantern up in front of me trying to see who I was dealing with. 
Then, peeking from around a tree, I saw two eyes reflecting the flame from my lamp. I have to admit, at that moment, I was terrified. Juliet is shorter than I am, and I was eye to eye with whoever this was, and her eyes were too far apart to have been Juliet's. Hey, is everything all right? I asked like an idiot. Jab, she said. I can give you anything you want. I knew right away what she really was. I knew her malicious intentions. Jesus, help me. I sat under my breath in a fearful whisper, gun still in my hand, safely aimed toward the ground with my finger off the trigger. As soon as those words left my mouth, she visibly flinched, as if she had smelled something disgusting. I could only tell by her silhouette and the reflections in her eyes, though. I stood still, realizing what I had just said, while she backed away from me, back into darkness. Up until this point during my story, my buddy sat staring at me completely silent listening to me speak. Dude, why didn't you just shoot her? You had a gun, right? Said the youngest guy. I told him it would have been useless to shoot the witch. It wouldn't have killed her or even hurt her, probably. How? Why? He replied. I began to explain to them what witches really are. People who practice witchcraft and offer rituals to demons they conjure in return for something they want. My theory was that this witch in particular achieved immortality through the sacrifice of people and animals. I could tell they were thinking it over and trying to decide whether to believe me or not. And to those listening, I know y'all might think this is unbelievable, and if I hadn't seen it all before, I wouldn't believe it either. The truth is, my parents were, and still are, very prominent figures in the church I grew up in. Being elders of the church community, they both performed exorcisms throughout my childhood. And no, I don't mean the stereotypical Hollywood Catholic priest with a little white thing on his neck under a black jacket holding up a wooden cross. They belonged to a Hispanic Protestant denomination that, in fact, thoroughly disagree with and oppose Catholicism. Being too young to stay home alone most of the time, I was often taken with my folks with them on house calls to pull demons out of people. It was a horrible experience every time. In Latin American cultures, it's not uncommon for people and their kids to visit witch doctors or healers when feeling sick or when they want their lives to move in a better direction, and sometimes when they want harm to come upon someone who has wronged them. Participating in these rituals is like an open invitation for demons and leaves people vulnerable to demonic activity. So there is always someone in need of help in our community. I watched and listened to everything my parents did during exorcisms and read every book my dad kept in his office about the subject. By the time I had this incident in the woods, I already knew what to do and what not to do very well. I resumed my story after explaining a bit more to my buddies. As I was saying, I stood in the dark forest with my lamp held up with my outstretched arm until I could no longer see or hear the witch backing away. My adrenaline took a while to fully dissipate. Then fear hit me hard. I tried walking back to my campsite steadily and quietly, but my nerves got the best of me, and I ended up almost sprinting through the dark. I was pretty confident I could find my way back, but either way, I checked my compass frequently. Yet, after running and running in the correct direction, I never reached my campsite. I felt confused and doubted myself like never before. Maybe I really don't know anything about being in the woods, I wondered. How could I have gotten myself so lost? I turned around and walked until I saw a familiar pattern in the trees. Once I felt confident about where I was, I forced myself to walk back to where I ran into the witch. When I found the tree she was initially hiding behind, I stared at it for a good while, expecting her to peek around it again, but nothing, thankfully. I retraced my steps back to where I detoured off my path to follow Juliet's voice, and after hiking a bit longer, I found my campsite. I was exhausted, covered in sweat, scratched up, hungry, and humiliated by the woods. I considered packing everything up and starting on the long walk back to the cabin, but I had no energy. I ate and called it a night. 
I didn't sleep much even though I felt entirely drained. The woods were very loud that night, even by a summer night standard. The bugs and animals didn't stop me to take a breath for a second, and the owls were particularly aggressive as well. I could hear them screaming near and far all night. Every time I began to drift off into rest, I would get awakened to the owl's screams echoing in the forest. Or at least, that's what I assumed to be owls. I turned to look at the guys and asked them if they were still down to creep into the woods. They looked at each other and hesitantly said yes, nervously chuckling. Well, y'all go ahead. I'm not going in there right now, I said, laughing to myself. But it didn't do anything to you. You scared her away. One of them replied, Maybe, but only because I said Jesus, I said. Well, then just say it again if she comes back. He was noticeably irritated. It's not that simple, I replied. I think you really have to believe for that to work. And I can say I really did believe back then, but now, I won't be calling on anyone to come help me. After I said that, I don't remember much about that night other than all of us ending the night by watching Blood Diamond in the cabin. It's the only movie my folks have in there. I think it was already there when they bought the place. As for what I said about believing, I'm not 100% sure it's right. Most demons hate God and Jesus, and I'm not sure if they care if you believe in God or not. It's not that I don't believe in God anymore. However, the only reason I do believe is because I've seen the other side of things, that witch knew what I loved, and what I missed, and that I would do anything for Juliet. I've seen and felt evil, but I've never felt God. Camping can be fun, sometimes. From PJ This happened during the summer I graduated high school. A few years back now. Since the end of that summer, I've moved for college. My high school was in a suburban setting, but the campus was surrounded by a good amount of forest. I joined the cross-country team in ninth grade, and that kind of developed my love for hiking and exploring. Often we'd run on the trails that were dispersed through the forest, especially behind the high school. Some of these trails stretched for many miles. I recall one day our coach was unable to make practice after school due to being sick. Our team captain told us we could basically free roam the forest that day and explore the forest in our own groups if we desired. This was the day I knew I would always have a desire to explore the unknown. My friends and I were jogging around on unused trails and came across an old shack containing various old tools and weapons. Nothing was unordinary besides the fact that there were a bunch of things like axes and daggers hidden inside the place, all of which were mostly in old and brittle condition. The area was abandoned and in the middle of the forest. No one seemed to have come here in a while. We didn't think much of it and labeled it as a good find. Later on that day, after cross-country practice, me and two of my friends came back to the high school to explore some more. This time, we went in the complete opposite direction of where the shack was, and ended up finding an abandoned trailer this time. The trailer would have been that sort that you would see on the back of semis. It was at that point of dilapidation and really had nothing left to offer. Yet, there was no truck in sight. That made us wonder how it got into the woods in the first place, without a clear path long enough to even transport to this location. Next to the back of the truck, a single-story makeshift-looking house that was clearly the victim of a fire sat. The place was practically crumbling and nothing inside was worth taking a look at. However, the trailer had some interesting stuff inside. Although it was peculiar finding this stuff deep in the woods, a lot of the stuff inside the trailer was either junk that appeared to be old, or antiques that ranged from typewriters to dressers that appeared to be made back in the 1900s. We labeled this as our biggest find yet, and we were really excited. 
That wrapped up the day, though. A lot of other cool and odd things had happened in our expeditions to the forest since then, but nothing as bizarre and freakish as what I'm about to tell you. So the purpose of stating all of this was to explain how my love for hiking and exploring came into play. Since then, me and my friends have continued to go to this forest behind the high school from time to time to explore and hang out. Now as officially graduated seniors, my friends and I decided to have one last time in those woods before we split off in our own unique directions in life. While it was a day filled with deep nostalgia and sadness, reminiscing the good old days, we also got the fright of our life. This time we dedicated the whole day to the woods. We got ready in the morning and rode our mountain bikes into the forest, bringing camping supplies and such. That day was different, as we decided we were going to camp overnight in the woods. After all, we had never done that before, and as our last time coming here together, we figured we'd better make it memorable. There were four of us in total. We told our parents we were going to stay the night at one of our friends' houses. Looking back, I kind of wish that's what we ended up doing. Anyway, we got there in the morning and found an area to set up camp. It was at the bottom of a really steep elevation, and there was a clearing at the bottom with an already made fire pit, because apparently someone had already been there in the past. There were beer cans and ammunition shells scattered everywhere. I've come to learn that this area of the forest was actually used as a shooting range back in the day. We started on our hike, and pretty much screwed around all day on the trails. We graffitied a bridge about a mile down the trail where our campsite was, writing stuff like so-and-so was here and such. We figured we had to document our last day and all the other days we had spent in this awesome forest before we all left for college. When you entered the forest, there was a main path that went straight with many side paths. The area where we camped was about a quarter mile into the trail from the high school to the left. If you kept going straight on the main path, you would eventually get to the bridge where we had our little art exhibit. To the left was where the shack was, and to the right was where the trailer was, on each of their own paths a few miles in. And if you went straight past the old broken bridge, you'd go further into the woods, where many more trails could be found that we hadn't been on completely. The day went well with absolutely nothing wrong so far. Thankfully, we hadn't run into anyone else, because a lot of the stuff we ended up doing was definitely not allowed on private property. Soon it was getting dark, and we began to get ready for our campfire. Beers in hand and memories on our mind, we had started our nostalgia trip. Things had been going great. At one point, the fire had begun to die down, and we decided to let it go. After all, the embers would stay alive for a while after, and that was all we really needed at this point. By then, it was around one in the morning, and we had all fallen asleep. I suddenly woke up, not knowing what time it was. Everyone else appeared to be asleep, though. I didn't move much, because shortly after I woke up, I heard something. It sounded like footsteps crunching on beer cans and earth. I truthfully couldn't tell if it was on two feet or four yet, but I just assumed it was an animal walking around the campsite in search of food or something. That's when I realized we were complete idiots for not cleaning up after ourselves and putting our stuff away before dozing off. But I was far from guessing right. At least I think I was. I hadn't made a single motion since I'd awakened, and even worse, whatever was near us, it was not facing in my direction. The way I was then, I was completely vulnerable to whatever this thing was. That's when I suddenly heard a new set of footsteps approaching the campsite. There was dead silence besides these footsteps rummaging around our campsite. 
That's when I made out whatever these things were had to be bipedal. The crickets and frogs in the area ceased to make noise. A few moments later, everything was dead silent, including the noise of whoever was in our camping area. The sounds of these footsteps stopped as suddenly as they came. I lifted my body up to look frantically around the campsite and woke up my friends. I noticed that the embers had been put out by water, which none of us had done, and smoke was gently wafting into the air. We were almost in complete darkness. I reached for my phone and saw that it was two in the morning now. It's as if whatever these things were knew the moment that we had all fallen asleep. The fire being put out must have happened right before I woke up. My friends were all awake then, wondering why I'd woke them all up. All I could say was I heard footsteps by our campsite, but they were audibly gone now. Suddenly, out of nowhere, an ear-piercing scream shot out into the air from the path taken to get to our camping spot at higher elevation. As I looked into that general direction, I could see at the top of the trail something looking down at us. Another scream rang out. It almost sounded like an Aztec death whistle. If I were to compare it to something, yet it was much lower in tone with an almost insect-like clicking noise to it. I nearly soiled myself. That's how taken aback I was. We were in utter shock, unable to move. That's when it hit me. Where was the other thing? It had accompanied that figure at the camp. Was it near us? I only saw one at the top of the trail. I never found out, though. Whatever was at the top of the trail had now begun to skulk off further, deep into the woods, towards the bridge. All I could make out was its tall, slender silhouette. Where its eyes were supposed to be were two small, eerily green, reflecting slits. I was scared beyond my wits. I told everyone we were going to make a run for it. After all, we weren't too far from the high school, about a quarter mile away, give or take. We ditched everything and ran. We decided we'd come back for anything we left the next day with a bigger group of people. We ran straight out of the woods, not hearing anything else besides our own footsteps. We all snuck into my friend's basement after that, through an emergency hatch, and stayed there for the rest of the night, making sure to lock and secure any form of entry out of paranoia due to what we just witnessed. Never in my life have I experienced something so terrifying as that. Never in my life had I seen or heard anything remotely similar to the sound of whatever it was we heard that night. We went back two days later and found everything there intact. However, two of the four bikes had been thrown around and scratched up. Our sleeping bags had been shredded and slung upon tree branches way up high. Everything was just a disturbing mess. The forest had resumed with its sound of nature, signifying that anything dangerous was most likely far off. Whatever was out there that night had come back in an attempt to find us again, but only found the remains of what we left behind. What I'll never know is why those things were near our camp or in the forest and what their ultimate goal was in coming near us. I mean, maybe it could have been some sort of group messing with people, but the idea of that seems really far off. It wouldn't fully explain all the incidents that happened that night. I also learned that there was an ancient cemetery somewhere along the path if you went straight past the bridge a few miles on a discreet side path. My cross-country captain apparently found it with a few others when I mentioned the whole incident on a group chat. Maybe they were ghosts. Maybe they were Wendigos. I really have no idea. Regardless, I still have trouble thinking about it to this day. But I know deep down that whatever happened that night, whatever those creatures were, they had bad intentions and were likely pure evil. I think a skinwalker was following us at Philmont. From Kinda Scared 123. 
I'm a Boy Scout, and the pinnacle of scouting is considered to be Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico. Philmont is land-owned in New Mexico, where crews of scouts plan a backpacking trip to different locations over the course of many days. I'm not good at backpacking, so on this trip I expected hardship and pain, but not fear. But Boy Scouts is about expecting the unexpected, and this experience scared me so bad that I needed somewhere to talk about it and share it with others. In fact, we're riding back now to go home. I just need to get this off my chest. Things began happening around the middle of the trek. Me and a friend of mine were in our tent talking after a long day of hiking. Philmont has quite a few ties to Native Americans, so we were talking about that, which brought us to the topic of skinwalkers. My friend immediately told me to shut up and change the topic. He told me that names have power. I was kind of annoyed. I wanted to talk about that, and yet I immediately got shut down. Who cares about names anyway, I thought. This is stupid Harry Potter type stuff. Shortly after we went to bed, I woke up in the middle of the night to screaming. But it wasn't human screaming. It sounded like a deer, but all sorts of wrong. Deer are common in Philmont, and I had heard them make sounds before. But this sounded distorted and wrong. The screaming continued for at least two more hours before finally stopping. By then, I was on edge, but my exhaustion got the best of me, and I eventually fell asleep. The next day, we got up early, and thankfully arrived early at the campsite. As night fell, I put last night's events behind me, and went to sleep as usual. That night, I slept well. We woke up extra early in the next morning around 3am. It was going to be a long hike and our guys wanted to get a bit of a head start. I was late getting out of my tent and packing my bags, so there was a small point in time where I was left alone in the dark, packing my stuff. Suddenly, the screaming began again. Just barely in my view, I saw a boy with a headlamp walk into the forest. I started yelling and screaming for him to turn around and go back to camp, but I was too far away and soon his light disappeared into the forest. I don't know if these events are related, but it left me very on edge. Things were fine for a while. I'd hear the screaming every now and then, but nothing would come of it. Finally, we arrived back at base camp, and when we finished our trek, me and the guys settled in and prepared for our last night. I heard one of our crew members calling my name from his tent. He asked if I could shine a light outside because he thought he saw something through the flaps. Annoyed, I got up, grabbed my flashlight, and pointed it outside. It all happened so fast, but just as I pointed my flashlight outside, I saw a pale, white, and bony leg disappear behind a row of tents. It looked like the leg of a horse, but with an elongated human foot at its end. I was in shock. I told my friend I hadn't seen anything, and I just lay in my bed, clutching my knife. The screaming began again, and that just made the situation much worse. I got a little to no sleep. I was very eager to get out of there. All that matters is that I'm gone now, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. If you could take one thing away from this story, it is that you should never taunt something that you don't understand, something that you don't want to come after you. Because I got lucky. It just decided to give me a little scare, that's all. Please take it from me, though. Don't mess with legends, because they might decide to mess with you. I wasn't alone on my five-day camping trip, from Afraid of Velcro. I live in a small town in central Kansas, 
This happened a few weeks after New Year's. I was getting ready to go on a little adventure. This adventure of mine was only going to be a five-day camping trip with my dog and myself, but it ended up being longer than expected, and you'll find out why in a bit. It was January 23rd, and the snow had just finished melting around my area, so I thought it'd be fun to get out of the house for a while and take a few days off. After a few days of planning and getting all of the gear I needed for the trip, I packed everything up and began my trek. I'd be hiking from my house all the way to a small mountain and back. This little mountain was about two days away, but I could make that trip in a day if I cut through a large forest near my house. I would come to regret that decision. Anyway, I'd brought my dog with me to keep myself company. His name is Bullet, and he's a fully grown male German Shepherd. Things didn't start to get weird until after I had gotten to where I was camping, so I'll just get straight to the point. I had arrived at the spot on the mountain where I was going to be staying, and I decided to let Bullet off his leash to go explore his surroundings. While he explored, I began to set up my tent and trap cameras that I brought with me. I had just finished up my tent when I heard Bullet barking in the distance. His bark sounded far away, and I didn't want him to get lost, so I decided to go bring him back. I was only about 10 yards into the woods when I heard Bullet's bark, but it was somehow right behind me. When I turned around, my blood ran cold. Standing just 10 feet away from me was a giant humanoid-like creature. I'm talking at least 10 to 12 feet tall. I reached to my side to grab my cold python, but I remembered that I'd left it in my tent along with my other gear. I was standing there for what felt like forever when this creature opened its mouth and made the exact same bark that I'd heard from Bullet. This thing barked once more before he jumped over me and ran back into the woods. I called out to Bullet and ran back into my campsite. I know I should have left after all of that, but I couldn't just leave this beautiful place. Plus, being back at the campsite with my gun and with Bullet, I felt safer. To help myself wind down, I decided to cook some of the beans and hot dogs I brought, and I would just turn in for the night. I was just finishing up dinner when I heard this eerie scream cut right through the air. When Bullet heard this, he ran inside my tent, and I couldn't blame him. I followed him into the tent and grabbed my cold python revolver. I stayed awake for a while, staying attentive to the sounds around me, but eventually I fell asleep. Nothing else happened the rest of the night. Nothing else happened for the next few days either, not until my final day there. I had just finished breakfast when I saw a giant shape at the edge of the tree line. I knew exactly what it was. I didn't hesitate to grab my revolver and fire at it. It suddenly made that same scream I'd heard a few nights before, and instead of running off, like I expected, like I hoped, this thing made a growling noise and began to run towards me. When it charged us, I called for Bullet and ran into the woods with my revolver and him. I ran for a good 10 minutes when I found a log that I could hide in until I knew for sure it was safe. I pushed Bullet into the log first, and I crawled in behind him, hoping that he would stay completely quiet. We were in that log probably about an hour. Only then did I feel safe enough to crawl out of the log. Once I did, I looked around. Bullet came out of the log, and together we bolted back to my campsite. Once back, we found the place entirely trashed. My tent had been torn apart, the fire had been crushed, and the trees all around the campsite were smashed. After that, I packed up my bag and anything that was still in one piece, and I ran as far away from there as I could. After about an hour of on and off walking and running, I decided to check my map to see how far I was to the nearest point of civilization. 
When I pulled out my map and looked at it, I almost passed out. I had been going the wrong direction for over an hour, and I knew that I was more lost than before. The nearest civilization was a gas station, and that was over four hours away. When I looked down at Bullet, I saw how tired he was. I walked around for a while, until I found this little hut next to a lake. The place was just big enough for myself and Bullet to fit into, so I put down my sleeping bag and put down Bullet a little bed and blanket. Then we hit the hay. When I woke up, I told myself that we were getting home no matter what. I hoped that that thing was far behind us, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Just as I was about to leave, I looked down the hill and saw that same creature staring back at me, as if it had been following me, watching from a distance. I pulled out my gun, firing the remaining three shots at it before running back up the hill. Bullet was running alongside me, but he got in front of me after a while. We walked for about an hour before I heard what sounded like voices. Relief and hope rushed over me. I ran straight towards those voices. When I found the source, I saw a group of hunters at a small cabin. They must have seen me because they waved me over, and as I got close, I guess I looked completely shook because they all asked me if I was okay. I didn't hesitate to tell them my story, and they all laughed. Not that I can blame them. If I was one of those hunters, and someone came out of the woods and told me that they had been chased by a giant, monster, humanoid thing through the woods, I would have laughed too. They laughed until that same eerie scream cut through the air again. They went quiet, and so did the woods around us. They told me they'd give me a ride in one of the trucks, and they drove me all the way back to my house. When I got back, I told my family my story too. As I unpacked, my uncle came into my room and told me he believed me, because that same thing happened to him when he was younger. After looking more into this creature and this encounter, I believe I saw the devil himself. Dark Occultists at the Hermitage from Frankie Gotz. This is an encounter I had with a satanic cult, practicing dark occult rituals at a location that my friends and I were at, doing a ghost hunt. We just had picture cameras with us, nothing else. No camcorders or audio recorders. This happened when I was around the age of 18. The year was 2006, give or take. My friends and I had heard about this place called The Hermitage on the outskirts of Hamilton, Ontario. The place has a long history that I cannot fully cover for the sake of time, but there are legends of a suicide that took place on the property. It was a large residence, a huge stone mansion, which is now a ruins in the middle of a forest. The story goes it caught on fire, and now the remnants sit aging in that forest. It has large stone walls and not much more. It has a few forest trails leading to it. And of course, it's believed to be haunted. I've gone to this place a few times before this experience, taking pictures in and around the ruins. But we never caught anything special, and we never experienced anything paranormal there. To be honest, it didn't feel haunted at all. I told some older ghost hunting acquaintances about me doing ghost hunts at the Hermitage, and I was forewarned not to go there late at night because of rumors of cults going there and performing dark rituals involving animal sacrifice. They believed it was haunted by demons and also believed that possibly these people could be dangerous. At the time, I didn't know what to think of it. I told the person that I've already gone there a few times at night, and never ran into any Satanists, or whatever you want to call them, and we never experienced any paranormal activity, so I brushed off this warning. Even though we didn't have any frights from ghosts, it was still a cool and eerie place to go at night. 
when one travels to the Hermitage's entrance, it is blocked off and one cannot park their car in the grounds. But back then, just a little ways away from the location, down the road there was an area to park on the side of the road, enough space for two cars. We traveled there in a black van with my baby mama and friends and parked the van at this little parking spot. There were four of us. We all got out of the van and proceeded to go into the darkness onto the trail that led to the hermitage. It was about a seven-minute walk through dark forest. It was actually wintertime as well, so the trails were covered in snow and ice. The trail wasn't all on flat ground either. The trail would bring you up and down hills. It was a little eerie, but nothing too crazy. I didn't feel like we were being watched or anything like that, but walking through a forest in the middle of nowhere late at night is naturally scary in any location, even if it's not haunted. As we finally made it to the Hermitage ruins, we did our normal thing, just walking around, taking pictures, and sometimes talking to the wind, hoping the spirits would hear us in attempts to try to invoke paranormal activity. This involves asking them to make a noise, or for them to show themselves, and sometimes even taunting them. But like the other nights there before, nothing happened, and we didn't capture any cool anomalies in pictures. Now, from what I remember, there are only two trails that lead to the Hermitage Ruins, but I could be wrong, as it's been a while since I've been there. To be honest, after the experience I'm about to share with you, I didn't go there for many years. But if you were to look at the Hermitage from topographic view, like Google Maps or Blueprints, picture the entrance from the road being at the bottom, and a trail to the right and a trail to the left. If you were to go to the back of the Hermitage, there is no trail, just dense forest. My baby ma, friends, and I were at the very back because we heard this is where the animal sacrifices occur, so we thought maybe we could capture some activity. Perhaps take a picture of a demon or an animal spirit. We took a bunch of pictures and still nothing. Now here comes the scary part. As we were getting bored of this location, we collectively decided we should head back to the trail we came from to walk through the forest back to the van. As we were making our way towards the trail, we spotted five individuals in black robes walking, seemingly in a trance. They were almost robotic, like how soldiers march all synchronistically. All five of these guys' legs moved at the same time. It gave off a weird vibe. Then all at once they stopped. We could see the sides of them as they were turned at a 90 degree angle to the right of us while being literally right in front of us, I estimated probably only 10 feet from us. A few seconds later, they all turned at the same time. Again, it was very bizarre. It was perfect synchronization. When they turned, they stared at us for a few moments. We couldn't see their faces because it was so dark. We could only see the scary, dark silhouettes of their robes and hoods. I noticed the dude in the middle had what appeared to be two long metal bars, one in each hand. As they stared at us, the guy in the middle with the bars started banging the bars together. By the third, ding, we made a run for it. We ran to the trail and started running into the forest. Remember, I told you this is in winter, and the trail was covered in ice and snow, and it wasn't flat due to hills. So we were running, slipping falling. Up until that point, I've never been so scared of human beings in my entire life. I legitimately feared for our lives, because those weird dudes in black robes at like two in the morning, in the middle of a forest, gave chase to us through the woods. All the while, we slipped and fell and never looked back, our fear only intensifying. I swear, while we ran, there were more of them in those woods. I got glimpses of them peeking their heads out from behind trees. I don't know if my fear produced hallucinations and my eyes were playing tricks on me. It was very dark after all. But I swear, I saw them. We would fall again running down a hill, almost tobogganing down the hill on our butts. It was intense and felt as if ages passed before we got back to the safety of our van. But there was a scary surprise waiting for us at the van. 
Parked beside our van was a car with what looked to be a deranged woman with blonde hair and bugged out eyes, turning her high beams on and off repeatedly and frantically, all while giving us this death stare. She looked to be around 30. I theorized she was trying to signal the cult members to our location. We all hopped in the van and the driver turned on the engine. We backed out and booked it out of there. The lady in the car tailed us and we didn't lose her until we got to the city where she slowed down and just turned around. Hearing this, you probably won't get the same feeling of fear that we felt, but being there and experiencing this was literally the scariest moment I've ever had, being terrified of other human beings. I guess I should have listened to my ghost hunting acquaintances. Sometimes it's not the paranormal we should fear, but people who use their free will to commit harm to people and animals. And if you're one of those cult members listening to this who chased us, I hope we never meet again. The Clearing from Black Cat 1206 One Saturday when I was around 13, my uncle came around with his girlfriend and my two younger cousins. Our other two cousins were staying at the flat for the weekend, and a further younger female cousin had asked mom if she could also stay. This was a regular occurrence for all us kids. The weekends and school holidays were a free-for-all, a constant stream of kids staying at one place or another making makeshift beds with bean bags and floor cushions, or just crashing out on the floor with sleeping bags. My mom and aunties all used to joke that in the holidays their homes turned into regular old DOS house. Apart from my five cousins and I, my friend Jay was there. He too was at our flat every weekend and his parents knew he would be okay. Mom had the reputation for being cool, yet very strict. We all hung out together, had a sandwich and drank and played on the Sega. Then Mom and my uncle's partner said we should all go for a walk. Everyone thought it would be a great idea, so the ten of us set out. The three adults decided that we should go to Donkey Woods, which is a bit of green wildland, owned by the council much like Heathland. As kids, we used to go over a lot in the spring, summer, and autumn, on our own or with family, and it was reasonably safe and kid-friendly, and it still felt wild enough to make you feel adventurous and not in West London. We all walked the half mile down the road from the flats to Donkey Woods, where we walked along the river until we got further into the woods. And while Mum and my uncle and his partner all sat down to have a cigarette, us seven kids continued exploring. As I previously mentioned, we all knew Donkey Woods really well and were totally at ease and comfortable over there, so we weren't expecting anything unusual or creepy at all. For us, it was just another mid-August late Saturday afternoon, and we were just messing around. My cousin T, my friend Jay, and I were all talking and suddenly the other four kids came running up. They hadn't been too far away, just slightly further down the river. They were all out of breath and looked a little rattled. The four of them told us that they had seen something weird in one of the small clearings. They wouldn't tell us what. They just said, You have to come and see. We all thought it was just a major wind-up. But when we got to the clearing, our mood changed quickly, not to fear, more to a sense of unsettling apprehension. In the middle of the clearing were three small tents in a rough triangle, and in the middle of the tents was a small, still smoldering fire. Around the edges of the clearing were several small dead birds, sparrows, I think. The whole scene was very unnatural and eerie, and I felt a distinct drop in temperature. Most likely my imagination, but still quite evident. Now, the rough sleepers of the area did use Donkey Woods as a base, but not in that particular place of the woods, as it was too close to the main road, and the homeless people avoided harassment and abuse from certain unpleasant individuals by going further into the woods to prevent any kind of confrontation. Quick note to the audience. Rough sleepers refers to those who may or may not be homeless, but are living or staying overnight in unsheltered, unsafe, or open-air environments. 
Continuing on. The homeless people who lived over Donkey Woods also didn't use tents. They would make a shelter from pieces of wood and plastic sheeting. And Donkey Woods isn't a place where people go camping recreationally, so we felt there was something very strange about the scene in this clearing. I told the four younger ones to go and get the adults. While they were gone, me, J, and T didn't move. T, who was and still is tough as nails, was completely colorless. You couldn't see her freckles at all. I didn't even move my wheelchair around the area as I normally would have done, and Jay just kept saying, what the actual F? When the adults came back with the other kids, they were clearly unnerved by the odd scene as much as we were, and it was soon agreed upon by everyone that we should leave the clearing and Donkey Woods immediately. The creepiest part of the incident was the next morning when my uncle went to see my other uncle and together they went down over Donkey Woods to look around more. They went to that clearing, but there was nothing there. Not even marks in the ground from tent poles, no sign of fire, and no tiny dead birds. Sasquatch in the Missouri Woods from Anonymous. This is my little brother's story. My brother's encounter started at night when he and a friend of his, John, decided to go night fishing. John and my brother have known each other a long time and have always hung out, though they would eventually get distant from each other, and I am not sure why. Anyway, they were driving down an extremely remote road in the middle of the woods when John's truck ran out of gas. They were a couple of miles from a boat dock, and John, being the mischievous person he was, said they would just steal some gas from a boat at the docks near the water. Now, I'm usually pretty attuned to when my brother is lying or pulling a prank, but the fear and confusion in his eyes was solid when he related this to me. They had made it probably close to a mile down the road, and he says the woods went so quiet he could hear John's heart beating. Suddenly, without warning, John shoved my brother down to the ground and ran so fast he was out of sight before my brother even hit the ground. According to my brother, when he looked up, he was alone. Then all he heard from the woods on the side of the road were these massive footsteps getting closer to him. So close, he said it had to be right at the tree line on the road. When the footsteps stopped, he said he saw an enormous figure staring at him. It then crouched down, giving what he said was a low and long growl. At that point, my brother hit fight or flight, and he scrambled to his feet, running towards where John had ran off to. He says he thinks he startled the creature when he jumped to his feet, because it made a surprised noise and ran away at an unbelievable speed. He eventually caught up to John, who was walking back with the gas can. He cussed John like no other for leaving him to that creature and asked why he'd done it. John said he panicked when the woods went silent and he heard the footsteps before my brother heard them. He just reacted and shoved my brother down. At this point, they stopped arguing because a rock came flying from the woods, hitting the boat dock near the water. This time, they both took off uphill at top speed. They both made it to the truck and hopped inside. But they quickly realized they had to put the gas in the truck still. My brother said John asked him to go to fill up the truck, to which my brother cussed him again and basically told him to go screw himself. John got out of the truck and began to fill it up when another rock came flying from the woods, hitting the wheel well of the truck next to John's hand so hard it almost punched a hole in the darn thing. John dropped the gas can, hopped in the truck, and just floored it out of there. They made it back safe, and after that, they drifted apart. And to this day, my brother swears on everything this story is true. And to me, it seems like one heck of a possible encounter. I'm tempted to go there myself and check things out. Bigfoot Encounter from Lanella This is my dad's story. My dad has never been the type to lie, 
and this encounter still scares him to this day. In his early 20s, he loved hunting. One of his favorite hunting spots is a place called Panther Creek in southwestern Virginia. One morning, he decided to go hunting with his uncle, but they separated and went to opposite sides of the mountain. He went to his favorite spot, but this time was different. He felt as if something was off because the forest was very quiet. There were no birds chirping or bugs making any noise, which is odd as it was around 5 or 6 a.m. For a bit of context, he was sitting up on a small hill in the woods, surrounded by trees, facing a large clearing or field about 50 yards down below him. After waiting about an hour for a deer, he saw one walk out of the trees into a big clearing. It stopped to eat. My dad aimed his gun and fired. The deer dropped down. He watched for a minute before getting up to go retrieve it, but before he was able to get to the deer, a large creature with a long brown reddish fur walking on two legs ran from the trees, grabbed the deer by the leg, and ran back into the forest. Keep in mind my dad is almost six foot four, and this thing would have towered over him if he were next to it. He stood there in shock from what he just witnessed. There was no other explanation for what had grabbed his deer, as it's highly unlikely a gorilla was living up in the Appalachian Mountains. He grabbed his things and hurried out of there as fast as possible, and when he got back to the truck, his uncle was waiting on him. He told his uncle the story, as his uncle was more like a father to him than anyone. His uncle just laughed it off and told him it was probably a black bear, but that thing was not a black bear. Fast forward 10 years and my dad got a job working as a long haul truck driver. He was coming home one night and just started talking to the only other truck on the road on his CB radio. They started talking about where they were going and my dad mentioned he was going home after a long week to our hometown. The other guy, let's call him John, said he used to hunt up there. My dad said he loved hunting up there too, but keep in mind my dad never told his story about what he saw to this John. Not yet. But then John proceeded to say, Yeah, I used to hunt up there until I saw something. Shivers went down my dad's spine, and he asked what he had seen. John told him that about five or six years before that, he and his wife were driving down a road near Panther Creek looking for deer, when all of a sudden, a large creature with reddish-brownish fur jumped down from a bank in front of them. It looked right at his wife, and she screamed, somehow startling the creature because it turned and ran down off the side of the road. My dad was shocked. His entire family had always made fun of him for that story, and now he had met someone who had seen the same thing. Fast forward another five years or so. My dad's uncle called him and told him, They're looking for your Bigfoot. My dad was mad because he was tired of no one believing him, but his uncle told him to turn on the TV and go to a certain channel. When he did, it was an episode of Finding Bigfoot in Panther Creek, Virginia. My dad is now 51 and has never been the type to be scared by something like that. He's always been a very tough person, but to this day, he refuses to go up there anymore. The Hole from Electronic Bank 4785 This happened a while back when I was 10 years old. I lived in a neighborhood with large white houses and thick woods surrounding them. For an image on what it looked like, there are five houses on the right and four on the left, and a curve at the end of the road that led to another area. As I said, this entire area was surrounded by woods, and at night it was a new level of creepy. I had four friends, Wyatt, Timothy, Grant, and Troy. We obviously liked the woods, as we had lived there for a while. We were on good terms, and went out daily to hang out in the woods. My house is the second on the left of the street, and Timothy's was the last on the right, his house was on a corner, two sides boxed in by dark woods. In one corner, there was a clearing, where we built our structures. 
we had five teepees, two lean-tos, and, of course, the hole that is the subject of this story. The hole was dug the summer before and was about six feet deep. It was usually filled with water, and we didn't care to drain it. We never went into the woods alone because of safety, and because we were all too scared to anyway. I think it was on a Tuesday when we were having a sleepover at Timothy's house. Me and Wyatt were walking from his house carrying sleeping bags, snacks, and flashlights. The flashlights we were carrying were on full battery, and we knew that because we just replaced them and tested them beforehand. The batteries were at 98%. When we got there, we dumped our bags and snacks and headed back into the woods. We decided to add more sticks to stabilize the teepees. Then we dug the hole a little bit deeper. I got one of his shovels from our storage bin and started digging. Time passed, and it started getting dark. We went back inside then, talking for a while, then went to sleep. The first weird thing that happened was when I woke up. I had to use the bathroom. It was then that I saw Troy staring out the window, intent on something near the forts. I asked him what he was looking at, and at first he said, Nothing. I didn't care, so I got up to use the bathroom and went back to sleep. If you hadn't already guessed, Timothy's room is one of two facing the woods. I woke up once again because Wyatt and Troy were staring out the window, looking in the same direction. Instead of denying to tell me anything, Troy whispered to me to look near the hole. I looked over, and I could just barely make out something dark crawling out of our hole. I was stunned, and then I started to giggle to myself. Laughing, I told him it's just high schoolers, up late at night again, and to, for God's sake, go back to sleep. They looked at me with a glare and asked me, Do you know what time it is? My laughter stopped. I looked over at the alarm clock. It was after midnight, even the high schoolers don't stay up that late. I told them to go back to sleep anyway, but they said they wanted to go check it out. I couldn't argue, because technically they weren't alone. I heard their muffled footsteps walk down the stairs, and then the door quietly shut. I looked outside, and I saw the bright beams of light waving near the edge of the woods. They got to the woods, and all of a sudden the flashlights began to flicker. They dimmed, then totally went out. Under the light of the moon, I could see their worried faces speed walking back to the house. I was worried, even more because of the fact there was movement near the hole. I ran downstairs, grabbing my shoes and one of their flashlights, and I ran outside. Just as I exited the garage, they came bursting in. I could tell they were panicked, yet they didn't want to show it. We went back up to the bedroom and locked the door. Timothy was sleeping, but we woke him up to tell him that someone or something was out there. Timothy had the same reaction I had at first, but we told him to look at the hole for a few minutes. After a minute or so, the smile on his face faded. He slowly turned and asked what the heck that was, and we told him that we had no idea we decided to go out for an expedition to look for it. We grabbed our flashlights, now oddly working again, and we headed out. We searched for what felt like hours, but finally we came back in, our search inconclusive. To this day, I have no idea what that thing was, but I think that's the reason we abandoned that section of the woods for years. Black Cat in the Wombat Forest From Eyebone This happened in the autumn of 2008, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. For context, I live in rural Victoria, Australia, on a block of land with about 40 acres of bush. It was the school holidays when this story took place. I was spending a few nights at my grandma's house, about an hour's drive north of my place. She lived on a similar bush block, which bordered onto the Wombat State Forest, a rather large forest consisting of many ridges and gullies. 
she had two dogs at the time, and as I didn't have dogs back home, I loved to play with them. I arrived at her house in the afternoon, eager to spend some time with the dogs and my grandma. We loved to explore the bush around her house, and always encountered wildlife there. Usually kangaroos, koalas, echidnas, and lots of cool birds. Directly in front of her house was a sloping gully with the creek running through it. The weather was cool and breezy, so we decided to go for a walk before the sun set so we could get back home before dinner. The dogs, Tappy and Tilly, were barking in excitement as they loved walks. As we entered the forest, there seemed to be animals everywhere, birds mainly, and they were calling in every direction. We walked down the steep bank to the creek and crossed an old log, which had been lying there for years. The dogs were loving it and ran up the other bank, chasing a mob of kangaroos. As we walked, we curiously looked at every mushroom, orchid, and natural wonder we could find, the most fascinating being a cocoon from an emperor gum moth. After an hour or so of walking, we turned around, calling the dogs and whistling for them. It was getting colder, and the thought of the warm fire had us both wanting to go back. At about halfway back, Tilly started barking vigorously. She was going crazy, running up and down the gully. Although she liked to chase the foxes and kangaroos, she seemed far more terrified than usual. My grandma was visibly confused and apprehensive upon seeing this behavior. Tilly, she yelled and clapped her hands, but no response, just more barking and running around. It was at that point when the bracken across the creek began to shake and tremble and a dark creature emerged. At first, I thought it was a wallaby, but then I noticed its gait. It was walking, not hopping. Let's get inside, my grandma said nervously, yet we couldn't leave Tilly out there by herself. The creature began to emerge further, and it was then that I was able to identify it. A huge cat, easily the size of a leopard, pitch black in color, with the characteristic kink at the end of its tail. I began to feel sick, knowing that it could be on top of me within seconds. We hurried back to the house and made sure the dogs were safe. At dinner, I asked my grandma about it, and she told me there had long been rumors of a black panther roaming the area and killing people's pets. The dogs were staring out the window, still whimpering and barking, but I never saw the cat again. Scarily enough, a few months later when I visited again, Tilly had huge scratches on her back, and although neither me nor my grandmother knew what did it, we knew Tilly was likely lucky to be alive. Delta Frogman from Spartan Mom I used to work in EMS as an ambulance driver. It was grueling work especially in the Delta of Mississippi. I've seen terrible things, funny things, and all in between. However, I've had some special experiences that will stand out as some of the most core-shaking things I've ever witnessed. Though it's not death that shakes me anymore, or new life, or even saving one, but witnessing a life form comparable to humans. So here is my story. One morning, we get the call to transport a patient to Jackson. Everything is in order, the patient is loaded, and we're ready to get this over with. As per the norm, my paramedic partner is in the back with our patient, and I'm driving. It gets pretty boring on a two-hour trip, so I try to keep myself busy by taking in the sights of the fields and swamps we pass by. At one point, we're passing through another swamp. It was pretty I was looking ahead but letting my eyes wander over the eerie yet majestic beauty of it all. As we came around a bend in the road, I noticed something big perched on a guardrail. There was some fairly tall grass growing by the rail, so it was hard to see it clearly. At first I thought it was a garbage bag or something someone had placed up on the rail. However, I realized it wasn't a garbage bag because it was a creamy light green color like the froth you see on the top of swamps, and it was moving right to left with the movement of the traffic in the other lane. As I got closer, I realized it looked like a huge bullfrog. 
It was roughly the size of a basketball, but for a frog, the shape and color was all wrong. It was rounded like a human's head, and soon I got a look at its face as it turned and looked at me through the front windshield. Its eyes were huge, black, shiny orbs, positioned on the front of its face like a human's eyes would be. At this point, I started to slow my speed, and my mind was racing to understand what the heck kind of frog looks like this. The mouth was wide, stretching around its head but more downward than a frog's, and those eyes had a look to them that I can only compare to a human's. This thing was looking at me with puzzled eyes and studying my face, just as I was doing to it. I was upon this creature now, and it couldn't have been more than a few feet from me. That's when I noticed that it had no legs under it. It was just poking up over the rail. My mind was reeling through all the biology and zoology classes I'd ever taken, trying to understand what this thing was that was looking at me. At that moment, I was now seeing it through the passenger window, taking in every little detail when it turned its head. It finally hit me. It was its head. I was only looking at the freaking head of this creature. This frog man was now looking at my ambulance, studying the side, almost like it was reading or trying to understand the symbolism on the side of it. As I passed the creature, I continued looking at it through the side view mirror. The creature's gaze followed my ambulance a little longer, before turning back and looking at the rest of the traffic going by. That's when I got a load of the actual size of this thing. It most definitely was just the head of the creature I saw. Now I could see its neck and continuation of what I knew had to be the rest of its body behind the guardrail. Now, to give you a better idea of the size of this guy, you would have to see the railing. This wasn't a small guardrail. I'm five foot two inches, and I know that rail was almost level with my ambulance window, and this thing's head was in my window. That means the rail had to come to just below or level with my shoulders. The other side of the rail was a steep slope, basically dropping off into the swamp. So that means this thing, to be standing and peeking over without straining, needed to be at least seven feet tall. Now, after taking in all of this and reaching the end of this bend, I took one last look at the creature, who was still watching the cars. I burned that image in my mind. Believe me or don't, I couldn't care less. Seeing that creature changed me. My way of thinking and looking at the world is no longer clouded with the wall of human logic. It hushed me from You Will Never Know. This took place when I was five years old. I used to live near this swamp that always scared me, because I'd always see gators with glowing yellow eyes out there. One night I couldn't sleep, I was restless and felt uncomfortable, so I decided to head for the kitchen and hopefully find something to drink that would calm me down. I made my way downstairs, and as I did, I suddenly heard someone whispering, I turned around, but there was no one there. I just ignored it. Probably just my imagination, I told myself. I made it to the kitchen, grabbed a glass of water, then headed back to my bedroom. Once again, I heard the whisper, but this time it sounded irritated. Behave. I freaked out and ran back to my room. I covered myself with my blanket. A few seconds later, I took a look outside of my blanket, but there was no one there. I then looked out my window, and I saw a dark figure coming out of the swamp. My eyes began watering with fear as I see this figure looking at me with bright white eyes. Then it hushed me with its finger to its mouth. Then it headed back into the swamp. I was petrified. I didn't know what to do. Suddenly, the closet door opened, and there stood the same figure I had just looked at outside. It looked at me, and I closed my eyes, praying that this thing would leave me alone. 
When I opened my eyes, I saw him face to face. He smiled wide. He reached out a hand towards me. Then everything went black. When I woke up the next day, I was sweating profusely and felt pain across my forehead. I got up and went to the bathroom, and I saw a mark on my forehead, spelling out, Behave. To this day, I have trouble sleeping, and even now at the age of 36, I sleep with the TV on. But that's not the end of this story. Over the next few days, I would cover that mark with my hair so that my parents didn't ask me how it happened. A week after that incident, I visited my grandmother's house. I arrived with my family, including my cousins, at night, and as we all sat next to the fireplace, my grandmother told us a story about the boogeyman. She said it was a creature that would roam around at night, taking the children that don't behave. As soon as she said that, I felt sick, but I held it in. Then she began singing an old song that she heard from her mother. The lyrics were, Hurry, fall asleep, or the boogeyman will come for you from the swamps. He will come to take the children that don't behave. I still don't know if that really was the boogeyman or not, but whatever the case may be, that mark will forever change my view of this world. The Rougarou of Gibson Swamp from Bullet 522071 Back in 2006, I was an adventurous teenager who loved to hunt, and I always went with my grandfather who was in his late 50s at the time, and had just fought off an infection. He was very weakened, and the first thing he told me was that he wanted to go hunting early the next morning. Around then, the local talk was that there was a band of coyotes roaming around the area, so I packed my 22 caliber Swiss pistol and a 12-gauge shotgun, just in case the tiny rascals tried doing anything stupid. So early next morning, I woke up around 5 a.m. I got dressed, and as I walked to my dirt bike, I heard an ear-ringing howl or screech coming from behind my house. At first, I thought it was a bobcat, until I made out that there was also a howl mixed in with it. So I quickly started my bike and drove to my grandpa's house, and waited for him to get his truck keys. Then together we headed off into the area where I heard that howl or screech, because that happened to be the direction where our spot was. Once we get there, we get ready to trek off into our spot. While waiting, nearby I could hear coyotes, the ones everyone had been talking about. But this wasn't the typical coyote sound. Rather, they sounded like they were being attacked. My grandfather, being a very curious man, decided that we should go check it out. While on the way there, we heard an extra set of twigs snapping underfoot, almost at the same time as our own, as if a third person was with us, unseen. When we got to the sight of the sounds of the coyotes, we found a disturbing scene. The poor animals had been thrashed. Some had been impaled on tree branches. Others had huge gashes from head to toe. Others had their heads or eyes ripped from their places. It was a disgusting sight. I wondered what type of person could do this. My grandfather looked at me one time and said, let's go. We started to speed walk back to the truck, but at a certain point, my grandfather had to go take a leak. I turned the other way and waited for him to finish his business, when suddenly I see a shape running around in front of me. That's when I get the dumb idea of turning on the flashlight of my phone to get a better look. As soon as I did that, I saw this huge, masculine, humanoid-looking wolf thing coming directly at me, and I screamed. Keep in mind I was no twig. I played football all my life as well as baseball a bit of a submission specialist in boxing. That was me, and this abomination made me soil myself. I snapped out of my shock and picked up my gun. I pulled the trigger. There was a loud crackle of gunpowder, and then the creature stopped. Slowly, it looked at its chest, which was oozing red. Then it looked back at me, 
and either smiled or snarled, I can't be sure. Then I heard my grandfather come running towards me. Before he got to me, that thing looked at me, and I swear I heard it speak. Not a word. You'll be just like me. After that, it ran back off into the swamps. We went home, and I called my grandmother. Not my grandfather's wife, but on my mother's side. I told her the whole story. She said she believed it to be the Rougarou, and that it's best I don't tell another soul, besides her, for another year. Because if I did, I would turn into the monstrous thing. The old folktale goes, he that sees the Rougarou and opens his mouth about it, becomes it. But this happened over a decade ago, and I haven't heard about it for 13 years. Because after all that time, I heard the howl screech again. Now I'm moving to a different state with my girlfriend, and hopefully I don't have to see that thing ever again, or hear it. Deer Hunting Gone Horribly Wrong From Cossack I used to live on a rather remote farm in the middle of Norway. My home is located at the end of a fjord that will take you out to the sea, and after a while to civilization and the big city. You can also drive into town in about four and a half hours from my home. But this is, more or less, just to give those listening a sense of scale. I have two neighbors about 40 minutes away from my home, but they're seldom at home so I am, for the most part, alone with my dogs and farm animals. Sheep, mostly, and a few pigs. A little information about me. I'm a 30-something born and raised in the hinterlands, so to speak. I grew up without much in the way of neighbors or nearby friends. I spent much of my time helping around the farm, or out in the woods with my dog in tow. Around the place that was my home, there are deep woods, and looming above is tall mountains and deep valleys, overgrown by thick forest and heather meadows. I hunt these lands in the hunting seasons, but there are places I do not go, due to how remote they are, or how hard they are to get to, and such. But this year, I found myself pressed for income, as the Rona prevented me from having hunters come here to hunt deer, grouse, and moose. Now this is relevant to my experience, due to my reliance on these guests for keeping my finances in good order. So I was faced with the prospect of having to send all my livestock to the slaughter, and I would have to accept my inability to keep the family farm afloat. Ever since my rather unpleasant experience in the woods as a 16-year-old hunter, I made a vow to myself that I would never hunt that stretch of woods again that belongs to the property that I now own. Having grown a lot older and far more calloused when it came to things considered odd or supernatural, I rethought this vow. I got an extended quota for deer and roe deer, and I decided to make a profit from selling the game to a local who sells to hotels and fancy restaurants in town. On the last week of deer and roe deer season before Christmas, I found myself deep into the high valley side amongst the heather meadows and sparse pine woods. I'd left my pickup on the gravel road that ran along the fjord, and I began to hike up the valley side with my hunting dog and rifle in hand, looking for red deer. I'd been on the move for about three hours when the weather changed. A thick fog rolled in and blanketed the terrain. I stopped and looked around while I got my compass out. That's when the first odd thing happened. My dog stopped dead in his tracks and began to shiver, as if he was cold or, what came to my mind shortly after, nervous. He tucked his tail between his legs and the shivering got more intense. Then, with a yelp that I can only describe as one of sheer terror, he bolted down the steep valley side. I yelled and whistled in an attempt to stop him before he hurt himself. There are bears, wolves, and lynx around where I live, and the addition of the odd invasive wild boar made me more than a bit worried. Raising my rifle, 
a Springfield 30-06, I looked around, attempting to see what had caused my dog to panic like that and to flee. I called out to scare away any nearby animals or to make any nearby hunters aware of my presence, but the chance of any other hunters being on my lands was slim and none, as I do not sell many licenses for red deer or roe deer. I got no response, and only the utter silence of the woods and meadows filled my ears. It was then the sounds of labored breathing and something resembling the odor of pine wood resin mixed with wet fur that was very filthy filled the air. Anyone who has worked with sheep who graze outside and has had the unpleasant job of handling said animals will know how wet, filthy, and unkempt wool will reek. At this moment, I felt a long suppressed feeling of silent dread beginning to creep into my bones. I started to back down the valley side, keeping a keen eye on the ground as not to stumble, but also to look for any signs of whatever was lurking nearby. I hoped it was just my mind distorting the common sounds and smells of the woodland. Having put some 500 meters behind me, the sounds and smells still hung around. At that moment, I decided that I needed to warn whatever this thing was, so I raised my rifle, and in rapid succession, I fired four shots into the air, so as not to wound any unlucky critter. In my most nightmarish dreams, I could never have imagined the response I got. <laughs> A deep, guttural howl, followed by what can only be explained as something of great height and weight, making its rage known. A stone the size of a rucksack came hurling down, about ten feet above my head, and landed with a great crash far down below. I'm not ashamed to admit at this moment I soiled myself as I ran like a whipped hare down the steep valley side. I dropped my rucksack and binoculars somewhere in that valley side. The only thing I kept a firm hold of was my rifle. A primal instinct in me told me I needed something to defend myself. Although what chased after me, screaming in primal rage, would likely not have been phased by my gun. Heck, I doubt anything short of several 338 Win Mag rounds to the body would have done anything short of annoying it. I burst out of the woods along the gravel road and ran until I could taste a mixture of blood and bile in my mouth. Upon reaching my vehicle, I vomited all over my boots and felt like my heart was about to explode from fear. Looking around to see if my pursuer was still after me or lurking around, I smelled no stench of wet wool and feces. The only thing I may have smelled then was my soiled pants. I shouted for my dog for a long while, until my nerves caused me to climb into my vehicle, driving as fast as I dared along the gravel road until I saw my home. Climbing out of my car and walking on legs that felt as if they were made of gelatin, I felt as if my heart stopped when I saw my dog. He was a mess, muddy, his fur thick with twigs and heather, his eyes wide with exhaustion. I fumbled with my keys and unlocked the door and let myself in, along with my dog. In the hours after, I showered, cleaned myself up, and took care of my dog, but my mind and body were ravaged with fear. Every sound I heard made me nearly jump. I did not sleep that night, and when my significant other came home, she commented on how worn out I looked and how equally strung out my dog was. This took place some weeks ago. Last week I was out with the garbage when that smell of wet wool and pinewood resin filled my nostrils again. Now I'm lost for what to do. I'll be darned if I end my days in the woods. But who knows? Time will tell. We have a Bigfoot in our woods. From When Ghosts Come Out. We moved into a farmhouse on Masters Road in Michigan. This farmhouse has a field in the back of it, and beyond the field is woods. 
In those woods, we've heard sounds, noises that normal animals could not make. One time, my dad was outside, alone, when suddenly he heard one or two loud and unnatural screams coming from those woods. On another occasion, my dad and I were walking in the field and into the woods when we came across a downed tree that had its bark torn right down off its side, as if someone or something had come along and pulled and ripped the bark off. One time when my dad and his significant other were in the field walking, they heard three tree knocks coming from the woods. After that, they started hearing grunts and stomping. One night, my dad and I were outside in the backyard. We were listening to a heron going off in the woods by the river, when suddenly we hear those same grunts coming from the woods again. After that, the heron sounded like it was being attacked. Then, it all stopped. No sounds were heard, it was just silence. This one gets me. My dad and I were walking in the woods along the side of the river. It had a path going down along the side of it, and we were walking down it, when suddenly for a few seconds, we both see this big black mass dash in between the trees, and followed by it, the sounds of breaking branches. Personally, I believe that we have a Bigfoot behind our house. I promise you this really happened, and I hope whatever it is will never get too close to me. Sick People Are Out There From Jeremy A. Back in 2018, I had moved my family into a new developing neighborhood. We finally had enough money to put a down payment on a house and move out of the apartment we had been living in for so long. My wife had recently gotten a job, and together we were able to achieve a comfortable living, at least only for the first few weeks that we had moved in. I've got two boys, one is 11, the other is 13. It's a blessing in disguise when I'm at work and my wife needs help with groceries, otherwise they can be troublemakers sometimes. That's beside the point of the story, though. This takes place soon after we had moved in and gotten comfortable in our new home. Our neighborhood was at the stage of development, where they were still clearing forest and making dirt trails all around. By no means was it anywhere near being complete. There was a lot of forested wilderness surrounding our newly made home along with the others on our block. During the evening and on some weekends, there weren't many, if not any, construction workers out and about. That's when I'd usually take some time to go on walks around the forested areas of the neighborhood, with my wife or with the whole family. My two kids had been gifted a quad by my wife's parents at the time we had moved. Her side had some money. We figured it would be fine, since we still lived in an underdeveloped area, with not too many neighbors to complain. Additionally, the general area was rural, so there was a lot of places to go, besides inside the neighborhood itself. Obviously, there were ground rules. They were not allowed to ride where construction was taking place, and they had to avoid anywhere that had construction workers doing their jobs. And most importantly, they were not allowed to take off without our knowledge, and they couldn't go very far, maybe a few miles away. I remember one afternoon the two boys were at home playing video games. My wife and I had gone out for a stroll in a new area of the neighborhood. We found a small trail some way into the woods that we had begun to follow. We made an effort to go out at least once every other day on a walk or hike to get exercise and stay in shape. Since this was still a new area, we enjoyed finding new places to explore. We had walked a good amount into the woods at this point, a few miles at least. We had continued into the trail until it had kind of broken off and stopped. There was no real designated path to follow now, but we continued in a direction that appeared to be a bit more treaded down than the rest of the landscape. We eventually came to a clearing in the middle of nowhere. No distinct entrance or exit trail from this area. The first thing we picked up on were the huge trash piles scattered around, some of it just random junk piled together 
and other stuff grouped in black bags. It wasn't odd at first, but it definitely had no connection to the neighborhood or construction. I'd wondered who put all this stuff here. The first few apparent things I saw here were an old torn-up couch and a toboggan among the scattered piles in their own specific locations. The funny thing was, it was the middle of summer and it was ironic seeing a toboggan in the middle of the woods. It was at this point that I noticed the couch had two trash bags sitting on top of it. One was tied while the other one seemed to have been ripped open, forcefully at one point. Nothing seemed to have come out, but I was a little interested to see what was inside. Nothing smelled bad in this area and the trash all around just seemed to be old household junk, so I figured why not take a peek. Besides, you know the old saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. I walked over with my wife behind me, notably a little skeptical. I pried open the bag a little more. The bag was stuffed with something. It came to the point where I'd made a big enough gap for whatever was inside to start falling out. It was the last thing I expected to come out. A bunch of old dolls. Not your typical Barbie and Ken dolls, either. These dolls were vintage. I nearly soiled myself when the bag had begun to pour out with these things. The bag smelled like oldness. I'm not sure how to word it, but you know what I'm talking about. That stale old odor that often accompanies antiques and relics that you would find deep in the attic of your grandparents' home. My wife began to laugh. Apparently, she was more comfortable with dolls because she had grown up playing with them. I've always had a bit of uneasiness with them. They just creeped me out. We poked around some of the other stuff in the area, but didn't find anything else besides a few select antiques. I was curious to find out how all of this stuff ended up here but I knew I'd probably never find out. We decided enough was enough and headed back to the neighborhood. As we left the clearing, I could swear I heard the faintest sound, like a child laughing coming from deeper in the woods. I got goosebumps and kind of froze up, asking my wife if she heard that, to which she responded no. We held our stance there a moment longer to see if we'd hear it again, but we didn't. It was one of those sounds that's so faint, it takes a second time hearing it to confirm you actually heard something in the first place. It was a bit unnerving, but I brushed it off. I guess it was just my nerves getting the best of me. It took us about an hour and a half to walk to that clearing and an hour to get back, since we knew our way around this trail a bit better now. We discussed our findings on the way home, my wife continuing to tease me about those stupid dolls. The next few days carried on normally. After those few days, something strange had happened. One night after supper, we had gotten our kids to sleep and began to watch a movie on our own. It was around midnight that we had finally gone up to bed. We'd gotten all settled in to rest, and suddenly, minutes later, out of nowhere, multiple rings of our doorbell made me jump out of my skin. It was like someone was trying to wake us up and scare us. My wife was startled, asking who in the world would be here at this time. Now, my wife wasn't exactly big on surprises, and she scared easily in situations like this. I knew I'd have to go down there and check it out myself. As much as I didn't want to, I forced myself to get out of bed, and first check through the upstairs window to see my driveway. There was nothing there, meaning either the person was still there or had run off. I whispered to my two sons across the hallway who had awakened, saying, Stay in bed. I walked down the stairs with my wife trailing a few feet behind me. I opened the door to be greeted by blackness. There was no one. I went into the closet to grab my pistol and walked out with it in hand ready for the worst. Still, there was no one out there. It was dead silent with no light illuminating a presence. I said nothing. All I did was walk back inside and tell my wife whoever was out there was gone now. I stayed up the rest of the night while my family slept, just to be cautious. No one came back. The next day was normal, but we were out for most of the day. I had dropped the boys off at a summer camp, and my wife and I went out for the day. We eventually came home to relax for a bit before picking up the boys. After we came to pick them up, we went out to eat. 
We arrived back in the evening after dark. As we walked up to the front porch, I heard one of my sons exclaim, Hey dad, look, a package. My wife and I exchanged confused glances. Neither of us had ordered anything and we couldn't think of a reason why there was a package out on the front porch. It was dark and we hadn't installed a front light yet. My son handed me the package and upon further inspection, I knew something was seriously wrong here. It wasn't a package. It was some sort of really old board game. I brought it inside and set it down on the table. My wife told the two boys to go upstairs and said we would be there in a moment. Unsuspecting, they went upstairs unaware of the bizarreness of the situation. On the box was a label, Atomic Energy Lab. There was a sticker that was placed on the box written in poor handwriting. For your boys. I opened the box and stuff was missing inside of it. The stuff that was in it, however, was a bunch of old unfamiliar scientific instruments. I was confused, and I looked it up online. This was no ordinary game. It was old, almost a century. The box was in poor condition, but it was still sturdy enough to hold everything inside of it. Apparently, I found it on some sort of list for banned historical toys on some website. To be exact, the name of this toy or whatever was the Gilbert U-238 Atomic Energy Laboratory. What kind of sick joke was this? Apparently, there were samples of uranium in this science experiment kit. How could someone possibly have gotten their hands on something this old? And why would they leave it at our front door? We reported it to the police who took it from us, but couldn't really do much else. The only lead we had was to check out the area where we'd found the dolls, since those looked old too, but the chances of these two things being connected just seemed all too distant. Nonetheless, we told them about it, and they checked it out a few days later. We called back for further information. What they told us was probably the most disturbing news I've ever received in my lifetime. The police officer's words went along the lines of, You're lucky you never stepped foot in that clearing again after that. Me and my team were shocked. Dolls hanging from trees and strewn about the ground. Definitely not how it looked when you guys were there, huh? The dolls on the ground were stomped and dismembered. There was a Ouija board on the ground and a couple bags filled with old animal bones, we discovered. Everything else in the area seemed to have been set on fire with gasoline and turned to rubble. There were no houses anywhere nearby, but further down in the forest we actually found an abandoned house. Did you guys happen to see that? I was dumbstruck. I remember further down the trail back when I heard the laughter. I had tears in my eyes now. I was in shock. We responded no. He continued on and mentioned how the abandoned house had one unique feature. A doll in each room. We thanked him, and he said he'd place a patrol car in the neighborhood for the next few weeks to help keep our peace of mind. Regardless, we were both very shaken. We did our best to prevent our kids from finding any of this out, and to this day it's worked. We believe it's better to hold off on telling them the truth about all that happened here until they get a bit older. For a while, nothing happened after that. We still decided to move, though, a month later. Not far, but about 30 minutes away in an already established neighborhood. The last thing that happened before we left took place in the final week of us living there, while we were preparing to move. Once again at around midnight, someone had rung our doorbell. Only once this time. I hadn't answered it. All my wife and I did was bring our two sons to our room to sleep for the night and have the doors locked. The next morning, I got up early to discover one last thing on the doorstep. The head of one of those old dolls. Nothing else. We threw it out and pretended it never happened. I just can't imagine how messed up some people are. Who could it have been, though? It made no sense. Was someone watching us in those woods? Was it a sick neighbor? I'll never be able to say for sure. All I can say is don't go into places that look best to avoid altogether. A lesson I've learned to remember for the rest of my life. As I mentioned before, we did our best to prevent our kids from finding out about any of this, and to this day it has worked. 
We believe it's better to hold off on telling them the truth about everything that happened there until they're older, so they can handle the truth about how different this world is from their innocent and bulletproof perspective. I can't believe someone would be screwed up enough to try and sabotage two kids' childhoods like that. Thankfully, it wasn't the case for us, and for anyone listening. I hope it never ends up that way for your kids. Always be cautious out there, and stay safe. Chased by a Skinwalker From Eris Black I'm someone who's a firm believer in the paranormal. I've had tales passed down through my family. I've spent time reading about different types of paranormal folklore, and I listen to people's stories online frequently. I've always had a deep fascination for it, because I've even had my own experiences in the past. There's one experience I had recently that will always stick with me, especially when I prepare to go out on my nightly summer and fall hikes. I live in a small rural town in upstate New York. I'm just a stone's throw away from the Canadian border. My town is surrounded by vast farmlands and thick, sweeping forests. It's not uncommon to be met by our local flora and fauna if you choose to walk along the winding paths and roads near the tree line. I often prefer to walk at night, due to the bustling traffic during the day in the summer and fall seasons. In spite of being a small town in the middle of nowhere, we receive a lot of tourists from the south. One particular night, I decided to go out like I usually did. I was excited because it was the first time in a while that we had cooler temperatures. It had been hot and humid prior. I decided to bring my younger sister and her friend, who was spending the night, along with me. For privacy reasons, I'll refer to my sister as A and her friend as J. A and J were happy as always to join me on the adventure. Before leaving, we all made sure to gather important supplies. A was dressed in all black, so she was in charge of wearing my father's reflective PT sash and manning the LED flashlight. J was in charge of carrying a string bag full of water bottles and a few snacks. I stuffed my pockets with my compass, phone, and utility knife. Once we were ready, we practically skipped down the driveway. Upon breaking off my gravel drive and treading asphalt, the three of us paused a moment to discuss which direction we wanted to walk in. I had decided to take us south from our location to the road that leads directly to an old abandoned train station. From there, we would continue straight until we hit a nature trail I found. We resumed walking when I suddenly had a feeling of foreboding in the pit of my stomach. I usually get this feeling when I sense that we might encounter something dangerous along the way. It wouldn't be the first time we'd had a run-in with our local coyotes or even heard the scream of a migrating mountain cat. I jogged back to my front porch to equip myself with the large, sharpened stick that I kept. Jay thought I was being paranoid, but I'm usually right when I trust my gut. From there, we made our trek down the road, laughing and talking about random things. We eventually came up on the section of the road that broke off into surrounding forest. It was pitch black, as there were no longer any streetlights illuminating our path. A asked if we should turn on the flashlight, but I declined. Our eyes were already well adjusted to the dark, and we needed to conserve battery power for the trail. We attempted to continue some conversation, but the sound of the crickets was deafening as we passed the thick woodland. The blaring of their chirping was so intense that my ears were beginning to ring. J and A got a little ahead of me as I paused a moment to block my ears and stop the ringing. Soon after uncovering my ears, I noticed it was jarringly silent around me, save for a small sound that could be heard about 20 yards from where we were standing. Hastily, I caught up with the girls and told them to be quiet for a moment. J and A simultaneously bombarded me with questions, but I shushed them with a hiss. I perked up my ears and listened more closely to the cry that was coming from the bushes in front of us. It sounded like a mountain lion cub. I felt my body tense up as I came to the realization that if a cub was there, then the mother was not far behind. This explained the sudden silence in the air. 
Jay urged us to turn back, but we were already halfway to our destination. I raised my stick, nudging them both to get in front of me, and to walk slowly and quietly. I would be their eyes from the back if we were being stalked by the adult cat. That was the longest twenty yards we've ever walked. Bit by bit, we tiptoed closer to the sound of the cries. Jay was understandably frightened. We had a large predator, potentially watching our every move, and we were about to pass its baby. It wasn't long before the cries were just to the left of us, in the brush. I walked behind the girls, partially turned sideways. I glanced over my shoulder frequently with my stick raised defensively, to be sure we weren't being followed. The sound was behind us shortly as we continued our slow pace to pass it. We're almost there, guys. Once we're away from it, we can just keep walking, I said with a whisper. We were about four feet away from the cub when suddenly the cries morphed into a low, deliberate groan. I felt my heart practically leap into my throat when a sharp cackle erupted from the darkness. It sounded like a strange whooping noise at first. The voice of the creature was unnatural. It was a garbled, distorted combination of a human laughing and a coyote howling. There was no time to find out what this thing was. We needed to get out of there, and fast. I practically shoved the girls as I commanded them to run, the urgency thick in my tone. The three of us broke into a panicked sprint down the long, dark road, the cackling still behind us. The volume never decreased, as the creature kept pace with us. I could hear the sound of something large snapping twigs as it whipped through the bush. Jay froze a few times in place, each time the thing would screech at us, much to my sister's dismay as she pushed her. I barked at them to keep running, and not to stop until we reached the farmhouse that was coming into view in a clearing. I could see their powerful porch lights from where we were. As we approached the break in the trees, I did what any dumb person would do in a horror film. I glanced back over my shoulder to get a look at the thing. I deeply regretted my decision. At first, all I saw were a pair of luminescent yellow eyes staring daggers into my soul. Then I saw a large shadow with elongated limbs emerge from the tree line which I would later come to find was what my sister also saw. That was all I needed to see before I snapped my head back around and bolted forward with even more urgency. I don't usually have enough stamina to run that long, but adrenaline does incredible things. The three of us pounded into the circle of light provided by the farmhouse before slowing to a stop. I noticed that after reaching the clearing... The noises from the creature had slowly died down. We all decided to sit down as a wave of exhaustion encumbered us. My lungs burned as I struggled to steady my breathing. Jay was as pale as a sheet as she turned to me and asked, What the heck was that thing? I didn't know how to respond. My mind was reeling from the whole situation itself. It was probably a squawker, A suggested. She often referred to those creatures like that because speaking their name would bring them to us. After a few moments, I glanced again in the direction we came. I begrudgingly stood up, thinking to myself, it was too dangerous to try to go back that way to get home, but it was the only way. I dug my cell phone from my pocket and decided it would be best to call my father to come pick us up in the truck. When he answered, he simply laughed and asked if we walked too far again. I said we decided to try running and tired ourselves out and that we needed him to come get us. He agreed and hung up the phone. We didn't dare leave the protection of the porch light. It was our only sense of safety from the thing that was lurking in the trees. It wasn't long before the headlights of my truck pierced the darkness. The three of us stood up and waved my father over, we piled into the truck soon after. All of us looked like we had seen a ghost, which piqued my father's interest, but none of us could bring ourselves to talk about what had happened. 
we skirted his questions as we were driven home. The next day, I started talking to one of my cousins online about the situation. He said it was weird, because what I encountered is usually spotted in the southwest. Upon asking him what he meant, his answer chilled my bones. You were stalked by a skinwalker. He explained how to perform a cleansing, being that I had looked into its eyes. It was better to be safe than sorry. That night I followed the steps my cousin gave me, and then sat up for a while in my bed. I haven't encountered anything like that since, and I hope it continues to stay that way. To this day, I don't understand why it was there, or why it targeted us. But now I'm extra cautious when I go out at night. I carry an iron blade on me, just in case. Uninvited Guest at the Campfire From Yume 130794 Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear, and so on. My parents were legitimately afraid for me and were against the idea. I had to lie to them, saying that we would stay in a hotel near the Cozia National Park so they would get off my back. Obviously, that's not what we did. Long story short, we had to travel from Bucharest to this park, which is around 200 kilometers in, two hours by train. We got our immense backpacks, everything we needed, and went on our way. Nothing really happened on the train, save for the fact that the train was overly crowded, all except for our compartment, which is really rare for Romanian trains. I was excited thinking that we'd have the whole compartment to ourselves. That didn't last long, though. At a certain point, a man entered our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular. I usually find my way around all animals, even those that don't like people. But not this dog. No. This dog was otherworldly. He looked so stiff, as if he was a stuffed animal. He would listen to his owner's every single command. I was impressed by this, so obviously I began asking the man about his dog. After all, it would be a long and awkward trip in which to have complete silence. The man was exactly like the dog. He would not contribute to the conversation and would only speak to give commands to the dog. The little information I got from him was that his dog's name is Uchi Gashul, which in Romanian means the killer. It's a very weird name to give a dog. In this particular example, we would use the English word as it is, not translate it to the Romanian word and name the dog that. But I thought, to each their own. I asked him why such a scary name and he bluntly replied, This dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes and is good at. Now, I personally consider that a dog will grow up to have similar personality to its owner, and most of the times I would judge people with dogs and how that animal reacts to the world and to his owner. But let me tell you, these two did not give me a good vibe. I brushed everything over, thinking to myself that maybe this guy is training his dog to hunt in the woods. Then I began thinking which woods are legal to hunt in in our country. While I was thinking about that, the guy out of nowhere asks us if we are traveling to the Kozia National Park. That was surprisingly accurate, considering the only time we mentioned the place was in the train station long before we found our seats and way longer before we even met this man. Again, I thought it was nothing because in my country, people who happen to go in the same direction will try to make small talk and guess where you're heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe of your destination or be honest. I took the honesty route and I'm judging myself for that now. Never be too honest with strangers or honest at all after hearing this story. We confirmed we're going to that place. 
and we asked what else there is to see around. He began talking about the area, and well, considering we knew nothing about the place, we took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, the animals we might encounter, told us about a beautiful monastery right at the bottom of the mountain that we needed to climb, advised us to visit the Lotri Shore waterfall and explore the caves behind it and to try out the local restaurant. When this guy started talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if he was experiencing a pleasant memory. But he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck. Squeezing it tight, the collar made a loud clink sound. What surprised me was that the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just like a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reached our destination and said our goodbyes. The man waved at us, and we turned away from him to head on our way. But I turned back around right away. I wanted to ask where exactly that restaurant was. But the man and dog were no longer there. Not just that, but also their luggage was gone. That creeped me out a bit, but who cares? We were too thrilled for our first camping experience. We began walking with our backpacks on us, 10 kilos each, and reached a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing, exactly like those horror movie tunnels, which, if traveled during the night, would make your hair stand straight up. Luckily for me, we traveled during the day. It wasn't a long tunnel. We could see the end, but by the time we got to the middle of it, we heard a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog crying in desperation for its life. We stopped. My boyfriend looks at me with his, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us, type of face, and tries to convince me to take a different route. We don't. I hear the dog and I go right towards the sound. And in the middle of the road, I see this chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circle on his butt, crying so hard and lying on the cement looking really hurt. It was as if he had been run over by a car. I freeze, thinking to myself that our trip is over. I have to save this dog. We call for him and he looks at us, pointy ears perking up. He gets up and, like a doofus, starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph, and now he was our camping buddy. About one kilometer further, we find another puppy, probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river. It seems someone threw her in the river to kill her. All wet, cold, and hungry, of course, we take her with us as well. So there we were, 10 kilogram backpacks each, two puppies at my chest, boyfriend with the map, trying to find a spot to camp the first night. We pass by the monastery the man in the train mentioned, but because we had these puppies, we couldn't enter inside the building. The priests wouldn't allow us, so we continued walking around the property, through the gardens, until we reached the base of the mountain we had to climb. I'd like to mention that these puppies were two tiny little brats, because the second you put them down and forced them to walk on their own, they would slam their butts to the ground and cry. Such drama. We walk and walk and walk until we decide to stop, as it was getting late, and I was starting to feel cold. We found a spot next to a small landmark type of cottage in the middle of the wood. We call it Trojanitsa. It's like a scouting post but for the church, where they place religious icons or a Bible, stuff like that, inside to bring good energy to the area. It belongs to the church. It wasn't like a house, it was basically a roof with four small walls and an opening, not a door. You could go in to hide from the rain, for example. There was an icon inside and a Bible with pages ripped from it. Curious as I am, I opened the Bible. I was really annoyed to see that people would write down their names in it, like couples do on the trees. But on one particular page, the words... I will find you, stuck out. This was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that it was probably someone who wanted to scare travelers with silly messages. 
I put the book back, and I gave it no second thought. We put up the tent, made the fire, and unpacked, making some food to eat. We fed the puppies, which were now cuddled up in our tent, and finally, darkness began to fall all around us. My boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour, because when it went off it felt as if all the sounds in the woods were louder and closer to us than in reality. Soon it was 12 a.m. We're all in the tent cuddling to keep warm. The puppies wake up and they start to cry. I get up and unzip the tent and I put them out to pee. They do their business and I get them back in. They cry some more and the smallest one starts to shiver. At the same time, I hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is up too. He can hear it as well and our fire is beginning to fade. The moment he unzips the tent and steps out, the sound disappears into the woods. It sounded like a snake slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. I ask him, was that a snake? He says up to this day that he can't explain what he saw, but this is what he says that it was a slithery figure with feet that made a snort-like sound when the light hit it. The puppies calmed back down after this creature ran off into the woods. We tried to go back to sleep after we reignited the fire. It's 3 a.m. when we wake up again, and the puppies are once again fussing. The fire's nearly dead. We clearly have no idea to put up a sustaining fire, we think to ourselves. My boyfriend gets up to search for firewood, and I get out as well. I stare into the dark, and I swear to God I hear whispering coming from between the trees. I look up at the sky, consider it's 3am, and I hear birds being very loud and fluttering their wings. Now, I'm no expert in birds but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, these weren't. They were very active, very vocal, and very frustrated. I look at the fire and follow the red sparks popping out of it into the sky, and I become fascinated with something. The spark doesn't seem to die. It goes on and on, changing color from hellish red to green. This was very out of the ordinary for me as it created an illusion hard to explain. It looked as if the fire sparks were going into the woods, creating a track for me, probably to follow. I kept looking after each spark to see when it burnt out, but none of them did. They would levitate, turn green, and flow into the woods. At that moment, I began to get goosebumps on my skin. The birds being agitated, the mysterious light pointing us to go deeper into the woods, and all the trees around us having eyes on them, by which I mean the trunks had distinguished shapes that looked exactly like eyes. I know this is nothing paranormal since someone explained that those shapes form when a branch is ripped from the root, and that's the shape that is left after. But there were so many of them like hundreds of eyes all looking at the exact spot where we decided to camp, and all we had was that tiny religious landmark to mentally protect us. As I inspect my surroundings, I hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, like 10 meters away from us. Obviously, I stand my ground but don't go near it. Suddenly, a dark, bent-over silhouette comes out of it, and half inside the bush, half outside of it, it stares at us. I call my boyfriend over, and we're both freaking out, wondering what it is. Is it a bear cub? A wolf? A pig? The creature shakes its head the same way a dog does after a bath, and I hear a distinguished clink, like a dog collar. My boyfriend manages to light up the fire really big, which scares this animal to run back into the woods, through the bush from which it initially came out. That calms us down, but not enough to close our eyes again for a while at least, 
during that night. Going back into the tent, after a while my boyfriend does fall asleep. And by then the puppies are sound asleep. But not me. I kept the zipper on the tent opened a little, just enough to have my eye peek through it, watching the previously mentioned bush. I think I spent a solid hour staring and falling asleep to that bush. All of a sudden, I hear a noise coming from that direction, and I immediately wake up my boyfriend, who's now peeking through the hole in complete darkness with me. What we saw next still haunts my dreams. From that exact same bush, we see a human head pop out and look towards our tent. Note that our peeping hole was small enough to not make it look like you were being watched from the inside of the tent. This head is slowly coming out of the bush, skin so white we thought it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, and another shoulder, a full torso, a leg. Bit by bit, an entire man emerged from the bush, completely nude, lit by both the moon and our fire. What he did next was excruciatingly scary for me. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, from our fire. Basically trying to extinguish and ruin our fire by dismantling it. This all happened like two to three meters from our tent. I look at the man with horror, because I recognized him, and now the clink I heard earlier from that animal is explained. It's the man from the train, with his dog too. I don't know if he followed us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to stalk us, but this guy was there since 12 a.m. at least, because our fire would be dead every two to three hours. We'd be awakened by the sound of branches being cracked, rocks being moved, which we internally explained as animals crossing the land. After he successfully managed to put out our fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging into it bit by bit until only his head would be out, with a disfigured looking mouth, looking like a moaning ghost. Yeah, you try going back to sleep after that. We didn't know what to do, so we just got back out, reignited the fire, lit ourselves some torches, and stayed near the campfire until the first rays of the sun came up. I admit I did fall asleep while sitting down next to the fire, and so did my boyfriend. But any small sound would wake us up. I was too afraid to go near that bush. I didn't need any answers or any explanations, I just wanted daylight, so we could get the heck out of there. And we did. We packed our things and got the heck out of there. We had planned a four-day camping trip, and this experience made us give up after the first night. It was a risk we did not intend to take. If that man followed us, or if it was just a coincidence, it was enough to ruin it all. As a conclusion to my story... And as advice to any first-time campers out there, never tell your location or even the area remotely close to your destination to strangers. You don't know where their minds take them and what they end up doing. Always stay safe. Always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that come to you under the form of sounds, movements, changes of temperature, and so on. Always find a way to protect yourself. It had been in the middle of September when my family and I had decided to go boondock camping. For those of you who don't know what boondocking is, boondocking is when you're in the middle of nowhere with no electricity, no running water, nothing but just you and nature. My family and I we were all geared up to go camping, and we drove to the Hoosier National Forest. We were already in Indiana. As soon as we got there, we went ahead and set up our tent. My sister and I had decided to go gather up some firewood in front of the forest, and we brought our dog along with us. He was a medium-sized dog, 
great for protection. While my sister and I were gathering up wood, we were talking and laughing as girls do, when suddenly we heard what sounded like someone walking slowly behind us. We turned around and realized that there was no one there. My sister and I looked at each other, then looked at our dog, whose hair was standing up like it does when he goes into protective mode. I kneeled down and told my dog that it was just a squirrel running across another tree, but I knew that that was not what that was. I don't know if I said it to reassure me, my dog, or my little sister, who was very scared. It had soon become nighttime, when we were all in the tent snuggled and listening to music, while laughing and joking. It had been late at night when my mother and sister had fallen asleep, so it had to just be me and my dad and we were still awake. When we heard what sounded like a woman screaming in pure pain, as if she were being murdered, or running away from someone, or even something worse. After hearing this, my dad and I rushed out of the tent to see what it was, but we didn't see anything. We figured it had been a panther or bobcat around us, so we had gone back into the tent and stayed up some more just to make sure that everyone was safe. An hour and a half goes by, and my dad hears what sounds like a woman screaming again, except this time it is different. When we heard the scream, it was right by our tent, and then a few minutes go by, and it was on the other side of my tent, and then in a few more seconds, it was right behind my tent. Now I know enough about bobcats and panthers to know what they sound like and how fast they can move from one place to another. And whatever this is, it was no animal. This was no bobcat or panther this time like me and my dad had thought. My dad had grabbed his rifle and I had grabbed my seven inch bladed knife and we rushed outside. My dad and I looked around using our flashlights that we had. My dog had come with us, and at once again, my dog's hairs were standing up. My dad and I had seen nothing, but we knew my dog was seeing something that we could not see, and that terrified me. My dad could see that I was terrified as soon as he saw nothing, but my dad saw my dog's hair standing up. After seeing his hair like that and not seeing anything, the air goes stiff and everything is dead silent. My dad cocks his rifle to scare something away if something was out there. But my dad and I had known better. We knew that there was no animal there. Of course, I think he did that to make me feel better and more safe. We had gone into the tent and my sister was wide awake with fear on her face. I asked what was wrong and she said she had heard whispering behind her. But how was that possible? She was in the tent. I reassured her everything was okay and to go back to sleep. So she did. The next morning, we all moved our tent closer to some other people who were boondock camping as well. The same thing happened that night, but much worse. My parents had gone for a walk to talk. My sister and I were in the tent reading our books. Out of nowhere we hear... I looked at my sister in horror, because it was right beside her side of the tent. No sooner than I looked at her... We both heard this very, very loud scream right behind her, as if a lady was being murdered. It sounded like she was above my sister outside. My sister's eyes widened in fear, and she ran over to me. We waited for our parents to come back. They asked what was wrong, so we told them. 
We all stayed up until we saw the thin light of day, and then we packed up and left. We don't know what is in the forest that night, but we know it wasn't a bobcat or a panther. We did know one thing, and that was that we would never go back to the Hoosier National Forest ever again. The Wahila and the Wendigo From Michael I'm a 31-year-old male named Michael. I'm part native, more specifically the Haida tribe of Alaska. Many of my people believe in the Wahila, a giant white wolf that can be good or bad, depending on your respect for wildlife. It is a guardian that protects people, but it will harm those who disrespect wildlife. Now that you have a brief understanding of what the Wahila is, on to the story. At the time I had just turned 25 and went to go out camping with my friends. We planned to have a good night full of drinking and games. At around 11, most of us were wasted, besides me and my brother Charlie, being the only ones that weren't heavy drinkers. We were really sober. At the time, me and my girlfriend, now wife, were talking about how we were going to sneak away for some alone time. That's when we heard a loud yell coming from right in front of us. We both turned to find my friend Brad managing to slip and land face first onto a rock. He wasn't getting up. My brother got up and ran towards Brad, picking him up and checking his pulse to see if he was even still alive. We needed to get him to a hospital, just in case he had a concussion and to treat any wounds before he gets infected. So my brother and everyone decided to drive him to the hospital, but I stayed back to pack everything up. Out of nowhere, I heard someone whispering my name. At first, I thought it was my girlfriend, who I figured decided to stay behind too. But that wasn't right. She was leading them to the hospital in her car. So, who was whispering my name? I ran to my car to grab the 45 I kept in the center console, then went back to picking everything up. But then I heard someone yelling for help. This time, it was in a more distorted way, like if they were swishing nails in their mouth. As soon as I heard that yell, I knew it was a Wendigo. I felt like an idiot. They've been reported throughout the reservation, and now I was all alone, possibly being hunted by the thing. I run over to the fire pit, throwing more logs into it. A Wendigo should not come towards the light. I stayed there until the sounds of the forest came back, and I went back to packing up. But no sooner had I finished packing up, the forest went quiet again. This time, I bolted towards the fire when something pounced on my back. I stayed still and didn't dare struggle. I could hear something sniffing me. This thing freaking breathed on me, and its breath smelled rotten as if it had just eaten sewage. Then I listened to it speak. Not afraid to bad. That's when I felt a hot stinging sensation going through my arm. I felt its teeth sinking into my arm. I screamed and screamed as it bit into my flesh. I prayed that the spirits could help. I prayed that if I did die, someone would hunt this thing down and kill it. After a while, it quit biting my arm, but instead it flipped me over to where I faced it. It was pale, paler than the moon itself, eyes red with hatred and teeth dripping with my blood right onto my face. It looked at me, seemingly enjoying the fear I showed. It smiled at me, saying, Fear. And then it screeched in my face, through the horrid sound. I thought I heard something else, like a howl, 
and I think it heard it too, as it began to sniff the air. The sound then came again, a long and down to the gut howl. The Wendigo's eyes changed. They no longer showed anger and hunger, but instead fear. It got off of me. Then I heard a growl, one that didn't come from the Wendigo. It came from right behind us. I looked and saw these beautiful blue eyes, but the eyes weren't of care, they were of hatred. The howl erupted again, coming from right where the creature was standing. I turned back to the Wendigo and it looked petrified. Something behind me began to walk. I turned, and it was truly a beautiful sight. Those blue eyes belonged to a solid white wolf, and though the eyes seemed angry, they were still quite majestic. The Wendigo screeched at it and tried to run away from it, but in a flash of white, just like what had happened to me, it pounced on the Wendigo's back and bit directly at the neck, twisting and pulling up. The Wendigo's body flew over me and rolled right next to the fire pit, but it never got back up. I looked at the body and saw the head was gone. I looked back at the Wahila, whose beautiful white coat was now splashed with bits of red and the mouth covered in a crimson fluid. The eyes of anger were now fixed on me, but it never did attack me. Instead, it walked over to the Wendigo, snatching up its carcass in its mouth and walking off into the woods. I could no longer see it. I sat there in shock, and then I began to cry as I realized my most desperate prayers had been answered. I crawled over to my car grabbing my phone and dialing 911. I requested an ambulance. As I sat there, fading in and out of consciousness, I heard the howl again, deep down to the gut, as everything went black. When I woke up, there was a blinding light in my eyes. The ambulance had finally arrived. I was placed on the stretcher and brought to the hospital. I think of this experience every time my birthday comes around. Now with my own kids, I teach them to respect wildlife and respect the spirits, as I believe if it wasn't for respect I showed for wildlife, I wouldn't be around to share this story. Never believe that we're on the top of the food chain, as there are things in this world that we will never comprehend. Take this warning. There is bad... And there is good in the world, but in the end, respect both, because if you don't, you will not like the outcome. I live in a smallish college town in northern Utah, sandwiched near Idaho called Logan. My friends and I love to go camping up in the mountains to the east of town. There was one area we loved more than any called Temple Fork. We had explored the area extensively, as the town is small and there's not much to do. We loved to go hiking and shooting, and camping was oftentimes a weekend event. Even if it was just a quick overnight, that made things pretty easy since we usually kept our gear in our trucks. So we just needed to get food prior to heading out. It was Friday night, and we stopped and grabbed some small sausages some Cheetos, and some Dr. Peppers prior to cutting up towards the mountains. The areas closer to the highway were typically well maintained, and the roads were very easy to traverse. So frequently you would get people who liked the idea of camping, those that had trailers but wanted to play loud music or watch movies, you know, enjoy the creature comforts in the wild. For us, we didn't like setting up a tent next to someone camping in a trailer, so we usually went deeper into the woods on the bad roads, where it was more backcountry. We got up there around 7 p.m. and found a site situated with its back to a hillside, surrounded and secluded by trees. Perfect. There would be no disturbing our evening with loud music. We set to work quickly as we had all camped a lot, 
Some guys set up the tent, others unpacked trucks, and a buddy and I started the fire. Shortly, we were all sitting around the fire as it was starting to get dark, just roasting the sausages and chatting. After about an hour of chatting, one of my friends told us to shut up. He thought he heard a branch snap up the hill. As the campsite was cloistered in trees, it was dark and there was no moonlight. We could only see what our lanterns and firelight had illuminated. We stopped and listened for a little bit, but we didn't hear anything, so we went back to talking. After only a couple of minutes, we heard what almost sounded like someone trying to quietly move through the brush towards our camp. Like you would hear a twig snap, but not like someone just marching down the hill. We stopped talking, and when we did, the noise stopped, almost like it was listening to us. At this point, we were a little nervous. We passed our theories to each other as to what it could be. There were mountain lions and black bears in this area, but how would it know to stop when we stopped talking? Mountain lions are a little skittish, but can be territorial. But we all doubted that it would be a mountain lion. Because a mountain lion wouldn't approach fire and people. Mountain lions are typically pretty stealthy too, and don't like direct confrontation unless you confront them with their cubs. And a black bear wouldn't be smart or stealthy enough to sneak towards us. An elk, deer, or cow wouldn't bother being quiet. Was it a person stalking us? It didn't really make sense, as we hadn't seen a light or anything, and it was way dark. Someone walking through the dense underbrush through the pines would have a hell of a time getting to us without being able to be seen in the dark. We nervously went on talking with one ear peeled for our mysterious friend. Whatever or whoever it was got within a hundred feet of the camp up the hill when we heard a really loud branch snap. I think they knew it when we knew it was there and lost all pretense of being stealthy. We were all young outdoorsmen, so usually camping included fishing or hunting the next day. So fishing rods, handguns and rifles, and even our shotguns, were not an anomaly in our trucks. I ended up walking to my truck and grabbing my shotgun. I only had target pellets, but those can still do quite a bit of damage up close. We didn't hear it move any further. It almost seemed to be scoping us out. I racked around into my shotgun and fired into the air to see if that would get a response. Whatever it was, it tore up the mountains, not caring if we heard it at this point or not. It went from 100 feet away to several hundred in 30 seconds or less. It sounded big. The footfalls sounded heavy as it ran. I don't think it was a person. The brush and fallen logs would have made it almost impossible to run that fast in the dark. You would have eaten dirt from tripping. I don't think it was an animal either, though. How would it know to stop moving when we stopped talking? We packed up right then and there and got the hell out. We never returned to the campsite for an overnight again, but still sometimes stopped to check it out. I shudder to think what would have happened if we decided to stay overnight. The Creature That Roams Blanton National Park From Wesley C. This happened in the largest national park in Kentucky, Blanton National Forest and Nature Preserve. Blanton is both the biggest forest in Kentucky and possibly the most beautiful. I finished showing the park ranger my park admission slip and drove through the gate. I looked out into the parking lot and noticed there was hardly anyone there. I figured this might be normal because it was 7 in the morning after all, and on a business day. When I got out, I released the ratchet ties holding down my red beat-around ATV. After setting it down, I loaded everything on top and locked my truck. It only took about 5 minutes to drive to my spot, and another 45 minutes to set up my tent, butane stove, and unpack my food. 
I took my handgun out of my portable safe that I brought along and decided to take a hike through the massive forest. I had made it about a mile from my campsite before I realized it was already getting dark, so I needed to head back. About a minute later, I heard a stick break. My first thought was that it was a park ranger. I turned around, ready to show him my admission slip. To my surprise, there was no one there. I looked around and saw no animals or people, and the closest campsite was about 200 yards away. Uh, okay then. I muttered to myself, thinking maybe a squirrel or a possum dropped a hickory nut or something. After not seeing anything, I just continued walking back to the site. A louder cracking sound made me freeze in my tracks. To be honest, I wasn't surprised when I didn't see anything once more, but I was unsettled. What the heck? I said aloud into the trees, assuming that this was some sort of prank. When I heard no reply, I began to jog back to my campsite. I just need some sleep, I told myself as I approached my tent, but not before some food. While I was moving the cooler out to the campfire, I heard another slight sound about 15 yards away. I thought nothing of it at first, as it was almost inaudible, but this was different. I began feeling something observing me, and there was a horrible rotting stench that filled the air. I tried to cover my nose, but to no avail. I looked around, but still saw nothing, and the smell still would not go away. I began to draw my pistol, thanking God that I had it with me. I also started to feel nauseous. I tried taking deep breaths, but the fresh air that I was expecting was replaced by this awful rotting smell. I was beginning to get a headache and I threw up due to the nausea. What the heck is that? I yelled. The nausea started to get worse. It felt like my stomach was writhing like some sort of worm. I thought I was going to throw up again. It was then that I looked up towards a crunching noise in the tree line. The sound began moving to my left and I froze in my tracks. Standing there, about two feet to my left, was a creature that I had never seen before. I'll try to describe its features as best I can. The creature's body was a lumpy roll of flesh that was covered with bulging blisters and scars. Its legs were positioned backwards with its knees pointing up, and they were so skinny, they looked like they would snap with excessive force. But its face was possibly the most horrifying. It had glossy, pure black eyes. The creature's nose was two holes where a human nose should have been, and it had teeth that were two inches long. They were bloody and almost needle-like. I began feeling sick again. That thing smelled awful. I tried to run, but my feet were frozen in place. I tried to scream, but all that made it out was a dry breath. That creature must have heard my weak yelp because it began to walk towards me. Right away, I went into fight or flight mode and I chose to fight. I drew my little 22 and fired three shots into its head. The creature turned in pain and let out a deafening scream, but it sounded inhuman, sort of like five animals screaming at once. Then I ran. I knew that I only had a limited time before that thing came for me. I pumped my legs as fast as they would go and ran to my tent, grabbing my phone. I ran to my ATV that was parked nearby. I pushed the little 150cc engine as fast as it could go and drove to my truck. I started my engine and drove the heck out of there. I've gone on multiple camping trips since then and haven't seen that thing or any other creature like that again. And I hope to never see it again. I advise you all if you ever go camping in Blanton National Forest, beware of the creature that roams there. Also, let me know if you ever see anything like it. Camp safely.
Werewolf in Oklahoma from Anthony R. This happened a year ago when I was 14 in a part of the woods of Oklahoma. I was on a trip with my parents, my two sisters, my two aunts, my uncle, and four cousins. We rented a cabin so we could stay for a week. When we got there, we unpacked all our things and got everything inside. After that, I went out to check out the woods surrounding the cabin. There was nothing but trees for miles, as far as the eye could see. Well, I did spot a lone deer grazing, which was nice. Everything seemed normal. We went out to go pick up some food at the nearest restaurant later. When we got back, we found these huge paw prints, unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life. Back home, we had three dogs, two small ones and a big one. I've measured my big dog's paw prints before, and they're about as big as my hand. But this, this was much bigger. I asked my father what kind of wild dogs left these paw prints. He said maybe they belonged to a coyote, or worst case scenario, a wolf. It didn't stay on our minds long, as after that we watched a movie while eating some dinner. After that, it was getting dark and we went to bed. I was sleeping in the living room and the rest of my family slept in their own rooms. I stayed up for a while on my phone, playing games. All of a sudden, I heard noises coming from outside. It sounded like a large dog panting. I don't know what got a hold of me, but I figured I would go see what it was from the window. What I saw gave me goosebumps. There were two glowing orange eyes. From my experience, it looked like a wolf's glowing eyes, from what I've seen in movies and documentaries. But the weird thing was, the eyes were about seven or eight feet off the ground, by far drastically different from the height of a normal wolf. I was horrified, so I quickly ducked down. After five minutes, I looked back and the creature, who knows what it was, was gone. I slowly walked back over to the couch, then hid under the covers until the sun came up. The following morning, me and my family were eating breakfast. I didn't bring up what I saw last night, because they wouldn't believe me or they would call me crazy. The next two days, nothing else happened. But something did happen on the third day. Me and my older cousin decided to go walking in the woods. No one else wanted to come with us, so it's just the two of us. While we were walking, we were talking about video games and other things. When we stopped talking, we noticed the woods were dead silent. I stopped my cousin and he noticed that as well. After a few minutes... We heard the sound of a stick breaking under the weight of something's footstep. By instinct, we turned in the direction of the noise, and what we saw will forever haunt us. There stood a large wolf, covered in dark fur, yet it looked especially muscular, and its front paws looked like human hands. Then the wolf stood up on its hind legs, and it towered over me and my cousin. It snarled at us. We could see most of its horrid teeth. Oddly enough, while some of them were sharp, many of them looked like human teeth. My cousin and I ran for it back to the cabin, but we could hear that thing right behind us. It sounded like it was running on all fours. We didn't look back in fear that doing so would slow us down. By some miracle, we made it back to the cabin, and only then did we turn around and find the wolf creature was gone. We ran inside and locked the door, our family surprised at the sudden and panicked entrance. They asked us what happened, and we told them everything. My sisters and my other cousins did not believe us. One of my aunts was shocked. My mother was frightened. My other aunt didn't believe us as well but both my father and uncle believed us. My father warned the rest of my family to not go outside without an adult. It was getting late. 
we stayed up watching TV, a bit nervous. That's when all of us heard an ear-piercing howl, and now the rest of my family believed what me and my older cousin were talking about. What happened next terrified my entire family. We heard the front door being scratched by something. My father was about to go look through the window, but then we saw it. That wolf creature was at the window already. Its eyes were glowing or reflecting orange, and it was snarling at us. My father and my uncle both grabbed their rifles. They turned on the porch light and went outside to confront it. But by then, the wolf creature was gone. But it had left something in its wake. My family and I went outside to look, and we were dumbfounded. A multitude of dead animals were scattered all over the place as well as bloody claw marks on the door. We went back inside and locked all the doors and windows. My father kept guard, in case it came back. The rest of us tried to sleep, still terrified. A few hours later, I was still awake. I felt my eyes drawn toward the window, and there I saw it, just peering in at me, staring. Soon after, it turned around and disappeared into the dark woods. Why was it observing us? I went back to bed, still scared, and I didn't get much sleep that night. In the morning, we ate breakfast, packed all our things, and headed home, and we never went back into those woods again. We're still terrified of those events, Nowadays, I believe that what my family encountered was a werewolf or a dogman. There have been sightings of this creature all over the world and missing reports of people disappearing in the woods. I wonder if they're connected. I'm just glad my family and I did not become the werewolf or dogman's next victims. Who knows what could have happened if that thing had managed to find a way inside. Peace River Shadow Demons, from Osborne 007. I was on vacation with my sister and her husband in Florida. We were staying at the campground at Walt Disney World, but I grew tired of the crowds. So I headed south and eventually ended up in a town called Arcadia. Staying at a campground there, I decided after a day or two that I wanted to play some golf. So I went up to a local golf course near the Peace River Wilderness area. It was an easy course, and I was alone. The 18th hole had water on the right and an elevated green surrounded by sand traps. I gave the ball a good whack, being careful to hit a draw, avoiding the water. It landed right in the middle of the fairway. The green was pretty intimidating. The sand traps were deep and the green had a narrow passage. Taking out my three wood, I hit down on the ball as hard as I could, and off it went. It was heading straight for the rough, but I knew it would turn because I was so far in front of the ball. It turned out alright, and actually turned over. It rolled right up the green and stopped four feet in front of the hole. I really wanted to make this pot, so I walked around the hole, until I could see the perfect shot. I knew speed was going to be important. When I hit it, I immediately regretted hitting it too hard, but it bent to the right and went right in the center of the cup for a birdie. I was honestly elated. I remember thinking, dear lord, if I died today, I'd die a happy man. But I would soon regret that thought. I heard a bird caw behind me, and in a bush on the edge of the green was a raven sitting on a branch in the bush. As I was leaving, in a good mood, I looked at the raven and spoke to it. Sorry, Mr. Raven, but I don't have any crackers. He looked at me with his head cocked to one side, peering at me with one eye. Then he gave me another couple of caws. He didn't budge as I walked past him. I told him, playfully, in the way of Lou Costello, to shut up. He flew off, which surprised me as he was so large I didn't think he could fly. 
As I walked around the bush and I looked, he was gone. There wasn't anywhere he could have gone, though. There was a field across the street, but he just disappeared. As I got into my pickup truck, a cold breeze hit me in the face. This was strange, as it was 78 degrees out. When I got into my truck, the cab was cold, too. The windows had been closed, so it should have been hot. I headed back towards town, thinking about stopping at Sonic, getting one of those big old cheeseburgers and tots with jalapenos and cheddar cheese. Along the way, I saw a sign that said, Wilderness Road Boat Launch, and a voice in my head said, Go down there. I pulled over for a minute, considering that the dirt road was pretty washboarded, but the voice in my head continued, You're on vacation, explore a little bit. The road was long and bumpy. It led down deep into the woods, but I finally came to the boat launch. There was only one vehicle there with a boat trailer on it. I parked my truck and pulled out my fishing rod. After some time, I realized there wasn't much biting in this river. Peace River is a wilderness area used by canoers. It's very remote. I noticed a Tarzan swing, but decided it wasn't a good idea to use it since I was by myself. If something bad happened, I'd be alone. But the voice in my head said, What are you, a coward? I felt pressured to give it a try. It felt as if something was holding me back a little bit. As I let go, I tried to arch my body, but my hip hit a ledge. I was upside down in the water seeing stars, and my hip was screaming in pain. I didn't know which way was up, but being a scuba diver, I let out a little bit of air and followed the bubbles to the surface. Climbing up the bank was almost impossible. It was so steep. One of the steps was very high, and I realized my hip was broken. I tried pulling my way up, and I fell all the way back down, almost passing out from the pain. I realized that going down the river might be my best bet. I headed for the launch. There were several blowdowns, that is, trees that had fallen across the river, which wasn't very wide, and each time I crawled over one of these blowdowns, the pain would just take the energy right out of me, so I'd rest for a while. At one point, I saw a ten-foot gator on the shore. He seemed surprised, and as he jumped in the water, he slammed his mouth shut, squirting me right in the face with a bucket full of murky brown water. I remembered thinking, so that's what gators do to confuse their prey. But he just swam on by. He did hit me with his tail by accident. I rested for a while, considering my situation, and started to call for help. I then noticed that there were shadows moving along in the woods. I focused on them. They were darker than a moonless night, darker than outer space, darker than a room with no windows. I continued to crawl with my body floating in the water, my left hip totally immobilized. Looking back, I noticed the shadows were in fact following me. When I came to the next blowdown, I called out in a calm voice, I can see you. And I swear one of those shadows stuck its head out from the crotch of a tree and then poured down the side of the tree like dirty motor oil. It pulled up on the ground and it began to head towards me like an army of black ants. They then rose up to form a shape that reminded me of the little guy on the men's room door sign. Like I said, this thing was jet black it looked like somebody had taken a cookie cutter of a gingerbread man and cut a hole in our dimension. On the other side of that hole was absolutely nothing. It began to flash back and forth very quickly with traces behind it. The other two, there were three shadows altogether, were not quite as dark as the lead entity. They kind of stood back. I thought to myself, is this supposed to scare me? He immediately stopped and began to do a Bella Lugosi thing with his arm walking back and forth. I actually laughed out loud. He stopped and walked right up to me. I turned away and a little voice in my head said, You know what to say. And I thought, 
I do. The little voice said to me, To say in the name of Jesus Christ, be gone. Hold your head up high and yell it. I did as the voice said, and all three of those shadows disappeared right away. I continued my painful journey towards the launch and finally reached it. Yelling towards the sky, I said, Dear Lord, please send some help. Anybody. A boat then pulled up. I called out for help. A man approached from the boat. Oddly enough, he had a revolver in his hand, and he asked me a question first. This ain't some DEA trick, is it? N no, I busted my hip. I need some help, please. I replied. They got me the help I needed, and I didn't say anything about the poached gator in the back of their boat. I was just thankful to be out of that situation. Shapeshifter in the Mountains From Anonymous This crazy event took place in the Blue Ridge Mountain region of South Carolina at a fairly popular but very secluded campground right off of the Chattooka River. It all started when my mom and dad, along with their best friends, another married couple, Stacy and Stephen, decided to go spend the day on the river. To get to the river, you drive through a town a ways up the mountain, and eventually go down a road that turns to gravel for a couple of miles, with a parking lot at the end. Then you walk along a trail from the lot about a half mile to the river. There's a big rock everyone always chills on in the river, and that's where they decided to go for the day. Well, Stacy ends up getting trashed drunk from a cooler of beer she brought. She was a pretty big woman and liked to drink. She ends up jumping in the river and floating out of sight. It's about midday at this point, so my mom and dad and Stephen go looking for her. It takes them hours, but they end up finding her down the river assaulting some girl at a campsite in a drunken stupor. My mom gets her off of the girl and apologizes. The campers are chill and let them go. By this point, it's getting dark fast. Now, I don't know how they got separated, but they did. Stephen more or less had to drag Stacy back to the car at the lot, and my parents got left behind and were separated when it got dark. By some miracle, my dad crawled back to the gravel road through the forest and ran back into Stephen and Stacy, but my mom was left behind in the pitch black mountain forest. My dad yelled out for her and searched for a long time before he just started crawling out, and he never found her. It's the middle of the night by then, and they know they couldn't find her in that kind of darkness, so they all came back to the house. Yeah, my mom got left miles in a forest in the parkway all night all alone. But as soon as we knew day would be breaking soon, we left the house to go looking. It was me, my dad, Stephen, and my good friend at the time, who happened to live with us, We'll call him Alex. We were heading up there in Stephen's Asuzu Trooper. Stephen was driving. Dad was in the front passenger seat. I was behind Dad in the back seat and Alex was beside me. We made it to the gravel road leading to the lot, and the sun was peaking in the trees now. We were on a good straightaway. Suddenly, we see something ahead on the side of the road shuffling around. It looks like a small possum-like creature maybe the size of a basketball. It has off-white fur, and it was kind of shaggy. We all had our windows down at the time. It was summer, and it was pretty warm, after all. Our little group was speculating on what it could be, but we assumed it was just some little forest critter. Nothing too striking, so we didn't think much of it. We were going maybe 15 miles per hour, and we came up to it about 20 yards away, and I'm looking right at it at this point, as we approach. The next thing I know, right before my freaking eyes, this little ball of fur just kind of jumps and spins and morphs right before us, 
into this fairly large anomaly of a creature. It was maybe three and a half feet tall and hunched with large padded feet and legs, similar to a kangaroo and a long hairless tail like a giant rat. Its body was fairly stocky with thin arms held tightly to its chest, but I could see little black hands with claws. And yes, I mean hands, not paws or anything like that. Not quite human, but hands with opposable appendages. Now the head was the freakiest. It was like a greyhound dog head with lots of tiny pearly teeth and a thin snout. But all its skin was black and its body had thick black matted fur. Yet the head had neatly kept dreadlocks bouncing off the top of its head between pointed ears and nearly hairless face. But like I said before, it was similar to a greyhound dog head in shape and size. This was the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen. I can't even explain how it made me feel, not evil, but supernatural, definitely intelligent. The whole scene was just surreal. It looked at all of us as it matched our speed. We all freaked out and gawked at it as it hopped beside the car. Oh yeah, it was definitely hopping, extremely fast. Steven sped up to about 50 miles per hour, but it just stayed beside us, seemingly effortlessly. It was on mine and my dad's side. I got a good look at it. Its eyes were like red beads, but glowing like an LED light in the day. It appeared to smile, showing teeth a little from its greasy snout. After maybe 15 to 20 seconds, it bounded in front of the car and disappeared into the forest, like a freaking kangaroo rat dog, whatever the heck it was. It was absolutely wild. After that, we were all in shock and awe and far more eager to find my mom. Stephen and Dad were tripping out by then. I was just like, holy crap, I couldn't believe what we saw. And Alex never said anything. He just had wide, confused eyes. Well, we found my mom later and all was well. She had hunkered down in a stump hole overnight with a shirt over her head. She was teed off for being left, understandably so. So yeah, me and three other perfectly sane men saw a small furry possum-like creature jump and morph into a monstrosity of a beast right before our eyes. And now, I believe in shapeshifters. To put the icing on the cake, I saw the darn thing a couple of weeks later right up the road from my house. My sister was with me in the car that night. She freaked out and told everyone else we told the story to that it was indeed real. I live almost an hour from the mountain spot where we first saw it, and it was in the large hoppy rat thing form when it bounced beside me on my way home that night two weeks later. My sister was petrified and says she will never forget that and how it looked. She described it identically to how I saw it. So I guess it followed us home. Maybe. I don't know. But it freaks me the heck out. That's my story. Believe it or not, it's true. We don't know what all is hiding out there in the world. But whatever that was... Me and four other people have now witnessed it. Be safe, especially out in the mountains and the wilderness. Thankfully, the thing wasn't aggressive so far, but it certainly looked like it could do some damage if it wanted to. Take heed to the unknown. Thunderbird Encounter in the Rocky Mountains from James M. W. I was born and lived most of my life in Ohio, but moved to Colorado at 12. I should say that I do believe in the supernatural and paranormal. I currently live with my mother and stepfather, and the house my father owns has the ghost of one of his friends in it, we believe. He passed away in the home around five years ago. Well, seven years ago, my family and I were homeless, and we were staying in a broke-down RV on land in the Rocky Mountains that belongs to a family friend. Now being that I was 13 at the time and in love with nature, I went out into the woods and rock faces behind the RV all the time. And I loved to find different animals that I've never seen before. 
I found different lizards and even almost became dinner for a bobcat once. But that was nothing compared to what I bumped into a few weeks later. Now, I'm not full-blood native. I only have a little bit in me. However, through my years of research, I'm 19 now, there's only one being that it could have been that I saw, and I'm not sure if it was good or bad. I just can't find out exactly on the internet what it truly means to encounter a thunderbird. Anyway, it happened a few weeks after I had a brush with a bobcat. I was exploring the land my family and I lived on. I found an old wood building in the forest with some old tools on the broken down floor. Now, this was one of the few times that I went off exploring without my older brother, so I knew I was the only one out there at the time in those woods. That day, I didn't hear any animal noises at all. No birds, no bugs, nothing. The hunters out there listening or reading, you might say that this means that there's a wolf, bobcat, or bear around, but this was different. It was beyond the normal silence. Now that I think of it, I remember hearing small animals in the old building when I first went in. Bugs, rats, a few snakes even. But then they all just stopped, for seemingly no reason whatsoever. It was around 11am, so the sun was bright in the sky. I've got good eyes, so I would have known if it was a normal animal I saw when I opened the door to this old building. Somehow sitting in a tree about 20 feet away from me, staring down at me for about 10 to 15 seconds, was a giant bird. At 13, I was 5 foot 11, so I wasn't a small kid. This bird was twice my size easily, with a wingspan that was well over 13 feet if not much bigger. The animal itself was jet black, no other color at all as if it were a shadow or something. I stood there for what felt like forever, just staring up at this being, and as it looked at me dead in the eyes, all I could do was just stand there. I didn't feel fear or dread or anything like that. It was more that I didn't want to move. I didn't understand what I was seeing. Now, in case of emergencies, I did always carry a large 13-inch bowie knife on my hip, but I know that if this thing wanted to, there would be nothing I could do to stop it from killing me right then and right there. And by the time I realized what it might have been, it just opened its wings and flew away. All these years later, I now work at a factory, and during the night shift, sometimes I'll see a shadow of a large bird much bigger than me. The current largest living bird in the world Diomedea exilans, or wandering albatross. It has a wingspan of 12 feet, but this is an island bird, and it's white, so I know it wasn't a known animal or whatever wording you'd use. This was something rare, something beyond belief. To this day, I'm not sure what it actually was, but the only thing I can think of is Thunderbird. Now believe what you want and say what you'd like, but this did actually happen. Black Dog Thing From TC The Annoyed Before I get into the story itself, I need to provide you with some background info. I'm a Native American, and in my culture we have many myths, legends, and folklore. One example of folklore in my culture is the skinwalker. For those that don't know, a skinwalker can take the form of various creatures. However, they will always be slightly different, like a cat with dog fur, or a dog with cat's ears and human eyes. I've been told stories passed down for generations. As I begin telling you my story, this is on a first-hand account, and everything that's being said is true. Now with that out of the way, let's get started. When I was younger, my little brother and I had noticed an owl was following us around. We had noticed that this owl was not a regular sized owl. This one was roughly around 5 feet tall. We'd also noticed that it would linger around us and watch us. We considered this to be normal and we never showed any form of fear or anything to that extent. 
my brother and I began to develop the belief that this owl was a form of a protector. Our mom had mentioned that the owl had arrived around the time we were born and began to follow us everywhere we went. When we were younger, we lived on a farm. Anytime we'd be out on the land, the owl would be around us. Our mom had also told us about how the same owl would sit on the stop sign at the end of the road if we had gone somewhere. When we'd get closer to the house, the owl would follow the car back to our property. When we turned 13 years old, I noticed that the owl had stopped coming around the house or following us. And when I was 16, I ended up getting into a huge argument with my dad, and I stayed at my mom's house for a good while. One night I returned to my dad's house. It was my first time being at his house in months. As nighttime began to rise, I noticed the same owl was at the house. Around 3 a.m., I heard the owl outside. I went to check and I saw it. I waved to the owl and began walking to my grandpa's house. During this time, the bathroom in my parents' house was being worked on, so we had to go to my grandpa's to use the restroom. As I began walking towards my grandpa's house, the owl began to follow me towards his place. In between the houses, there's a good amount of land, roughly about the length of a football field. As I continued walking to my grandpa's house with my dog, I noticed that the owl was alarmed and began hooting frantically. I looked up at the owl to see where it was. Then I looked down to see if there was anything around the area alarming it. As I did so, I heard movement in the brush in another field, the same field where the cows were located. I soon began to see this big black mass, roughly about two feet bigger than a Shetland pony. My dog had noticed it and began to growl and run. As I was walking towards the gate, I saw a normal-sized black dog that was not supposed to be there. The dog then began to run towards the stables, where my dog had run off to. After the dog ran away, I continued to walk towards my grandpa's house to use the bathroom. When I was finished, I had gone back outside, and I noticed my dog was standing on my grandpa's porch, visibly scared and shaking. I patted her to make sure she was okay and to calm her down. That's when I heard a noise behind my grandpa's truck, which was roughly 20 feet away from the porch. I pulled out my knife that I would use as a form of self-defense if I ever got attacked. I walked off the porch and approached the truck. As I did, I noticed a creature standing about five feet away from me. This animal looked somewhat like a dog, but it wasn't a dog. I then remembered that it was the same figure that I saw in the field earlier. After easing myself out of a stage of shock, it really hit me. I was only a few feet away from a medium horse-sized creature which was staring me down and growling, and all I had in my hand was a knife. One of the first things I noticed was its front paws, but they didn't look like normal paws. They were elongated and looked similar to fingers. They were more spread out than a dog's paw. I then noticed its head slowly began to come out of the darkness. I saw its eyes, some brown but also whiter around the eye. It starts to move closer to me. The legs were similar to a dog's legs. However, the creature's legs were more muscular, like a man's. I immediately reacted by throwing the knife at its paw. The creature moved its paw just fast enough to avoid being hit. I then hear the owl screech, and the dog looks at me. I'm closing the distance between me and the creature. It then looks up as the owl begins to fly above me and my dog. It was distracted. I took the opportunity to grab for my knife. I then make an attempt to attack the creature. But it jumps back, easily avoiding the knife, then turns and runs back into the field. I can hear the owl flying back towards the field, where the creature had run off to. Slowly and cautiously, I make my way back to my parents' house. As I approach the gate from the field and into the yard, I hear a yelp and a loud thud, followed by a screech. I look up and see the owl fly from the cow field towards a tree sitting in the yard of my dad's house. When the owl landed, it looked at me and started to hoot. 
It was like it was telling me everything was going to be okay, that I should go inside now. The following morning, I woke up and went out to the field, where the creature had come from. I found a large patch of the brush that was flattened, but there was no blood, no carcass from the creature that had tried to attack me. I also noticed that the owl was not around the property. I'm 22 years old now, and I've not seen the owl or the creature since that night. My dad is still located on the same property that I grew up on, and I do visit the property frequently. After that night, I don't know what happened to the owl or that beast, but one thing I do know is that I believe I encountered a skinwalker. I also believe that the owl was there to protect me one last time. I don't know what to think about this story, and I've never shared it because I never thought anyone would actually listen to it or believe me. So what better place to tell it than here? Eyes of the Forest From Soul Solo Soul It was early spring of 2016. I had just turned 24 years old. My friend and I just reached our main spot to camp, Black Canyon Rim Campgrounds, just outside of Payson, Arizona. We'd usually travel out here two or three times each year. It has some incredible views, and it's only a couple of hours away from the city. For the most part, this area was pretty secluded. A privately owned convenience store rested a few miles away, with a small town 20 miles before that. The entrance was on a dirt road, directly off the highway, with the campground signed at the start of the road, marking local wildlife, any fire hazards, and general news relevant to camping folk. The pathing is mostly linear, with maybe one fork, spanning several miles. We once traveled down the dirt road to see how far it would take us. One of the paths would take you to another highway entrance, with a ranger's tower halfway there. The other path led to a dead end. An abandoned cabin can be found on this path, a few miles in, mostly hidden off in the distance behind some larger foliage. The snow had mostly cleared up at this point, leaving crisp air, a slight chill, and fauna becoming active again. We'd usually spot some wild horses, several deer, and tons of little critters whenever we'd come out this way. It really was the perfect time of year for a relaxing trip to get away from the city for a few days. We got in around 4pm on a Tuesday. That was late for us, as we'd usually try to make it out there by noon at the latest. This trip was pretty spontaneous. We both had work during the coming weekend, and decided to just go for it. The sun was setting fast, and we still hadn't picked out our spot to camp. There were maybe two other groups, both families, parked somewhat close to the entrance, only a few hundred yards away from the highway. This time around, we just wanted to get away from humans for a while. Customer service jobs will do that to ya. We drove down the dirt road, past our usual spot, and finally picked the perfect area. A small clearing, just hanging off the edge of a hill. The whole valley could be seen from this area with a beautiful sunset. This would have been our main spot from then on, if the next night's incident never happened. Anyway, we agreed to get a campfire going, and would just avoid building a tent this trip. We didn't have much time to do so anyway, and her car wasn't that uncomfortable. I would sleep in the back seat and she'd take the passenger seat. With the windows slightly ajar, we'd have a few blankets for each of us, and would soon fall into an unrivaled slumber. The following day went fairly uneventful. We just decompressed. I had this strange feeling throughout the day, though, like we were being watched. There was the sound of crunching leaves just out of sight every few hours, but I figured it was just the local wildlife doing its thing. My friend didn't notice anything unusual, so I didn't dwell on it. Night fell, and the feeling still hadn't gone away. My friend must have felt something too, though she didn't vocalize it. I saw her take some of her sleeping pills. On our camping trips, 
she didn't usually need to take them. The nature's ambience was enough to put anyone to sleep, I thought. It was nearing 1 a.m. My friend dozed off in the passenger seat while I attempted to wind down in the back. I leaned against the side window behind the passenger seat, legs outstretched to the car's back door. The window opposite of me was rolled down slightly with a cold breeze flowing in. I had been on my phone scrolling through Facebook or whatever when I heard something outside. A few crunches of the fallen leaves several paces outside the car. I whispered to my friend, Did you hear that? But she was already out. I put my phone down and listened intently for a minute or two. Nothing. It must have been a small animal, curious of our camp, I thought. I went back to my phone, scrolling through social media. About ten minutes had passed when I heard it again. Crunch right outside the door. I lowered my phone. My eyes took a moment to adjust from the light of the phone into the deep dark of the woods. As I turned the phone away from my face, the backlight illuminated the window above my feet. To this day, I can't get the image out of my head. Two dirty, scabbed hands held on to the window, the fingers wrapped inside the car. The nails were long, uncapped, and dark. Behind the window, a silhouette of a face was pressed up against it. The breath would create condensation every few seconds. All I could make out were the reflection of those empty black eyes. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. It felt like eternity, the staring contest between me and this thing. Thoughts were repeating incessantly in my head. Why haven't they run away when they saw I noticed them? What were they planning? Was this the face of death? After probably ten seconds of not doing anything, the hand slowly unclenched the window and receded into the darkness. The condensation on the window dispersed. Another couple of seconds passed before I heard the dreaded crunch, crunch, crunch melodically fading into the distance. I still just sat there. What in the world just happened? Why didn't I do anything? Why am I still not doing anything? With that thought, my body shot into adrenaline. I pounded on my friend's seat, waking her up from her slumber into a dizzy confusion. I unlatched and kicked open the back door and took a moment to scan the area. Whoever they were, whatever it was, it was gone. I scrambled to pick up any important camping supplies we left outside and just crammed everything into the back seat and trunk, periodically looking over my shoulder listening for those footsteps. I slammed the back door shut, and there they were, a grim reminder of the horror that had happened. Two handprints imprinted on the window. I quickly wiped them off the window in a panic, a reaction to erase the event, I guess. I jumped into the front seat, started the car, and floored it out of there. My friend, finally coming to, asked me what the heck I was doing. We have to go, I said. There's someone out there. I didn't see whatever or whoever it was while fleeing the scene. Speeding down the dirt road, my friend insisted I slow down, and I eventually did. We reached the highway and I proceeded to drive twenty or so miles before we reached a Denny's, where my friend asked for us to stop at to eat and to have me explain everything. The nightmare subsided a few months later. My embarrassment continues to this day for the state of shock I was in at the time. Everybody says you either have a fight or flight instinct, and I'm now confused whether I have either of those. I mean, I just sat there and I did nothing. I frequently tend to ask myself who was out there. Was it another camper messing with us? Was it a resident of the abandoned cabin down the dirt road? Or maybe it was something more paranormal residing in that forest, watching lone, vulnerable campers as they drift off to dreamland. We'd still go camping there in the years ahead, but never too far from the highway. 
whatever it was. I hope that's the last I've seen of it. Growls in the Corn From Crepuscular Creature It was around June or July of 2018. My father brought me over to his now ex fiancees house to play with her kids and get to know her better, since she was his girlfriend at the time. She had two daughters and one son, Ginny, Kara, and Lyle. Well, they lived next to a cornfield, which was owned by a neighbor who said it was okay to walk down the main trail of, as long as we didn't destroy the corn or cause chaos, just common sense respect for other people's land. It was starting to get dark, when Lyle and I decided to take a walk down the main trail to the center of the field. Their pit bull, Jada, accompanied us. We walked and talked about random things such as our current obsession with Five Nights at Freddy's at the time, or what video games we might play on the Wii when we got back from the walk. We weren't at all nervous about the dark. Lyle decided to tell me a story about Jada, who was currently walking beside us. A few years ago, he began. We had some coyotes in the cornfield. They always made so much noise at night. Lyle hopped over a small stick before continuing. Jada was never allowed outside after dark because of them. We didn't want her getting hurt or, you know, killed, since coyotes can be dangerous. Well, one night, Jenny, his eldest sister, led Jada out accidentally and she ran right into the corn, where we heard those coyotes before. They came into our yard and Jada absolutely destroyed them. She even ripped one of their tails off. Lyle ended his story there. I replied, Dang, that sounds like it must have been scary. Coyotes can get pretty nasty. I spoke from experience. Many of our cats have been slaughtered over the years by those mangy mongrels. Lyle just nodded and then started to ramble on about football, which I didn't care for too much, but I didn't stop him from talking about it. After all, he's constantly surrounded by only sisters, and I honestly know how it is to be surrounded by the opposite gender most of the time, having been raised around all guys. We continued on, and when we made it to the center of the field, we decided to have a little race back down the path and to the house. Some friendly competition, right? So we both took off running. Jada joined us, but eventually she ran off into the cornfield, just enjoying herself. I was almost halfway down the path, when Lyle yelled for me to stop and let him catch up. He was beginning to get scared of the dark, as everything minus ourselves and Jada had gone silent. I let him catch up and we began to walk together. It was now extremely dark. We couldn't see more than five feet in front of us clearly, so we took our time. A shiver made its way up my spine as we walked, which I thought was funny, but I didn't say anything to Lyle for fear of him getting really scared and throwing a fit or crying. I didn't want to be blamed for scaring him, since I was the older kid in the situation. As we passed a little after the halfway mark on the trail, we both heard a low, bone-chilling growl from the corn. At that point, we looked at each other, fearing together that we were about to be attacked or die. Lyle especially seemed petrified, shaken to the core, as if he had seen something I hadn't. But I got his attention, and together we sprinted back to the house. When we made it back, Jada was sitting in the garage with everyone else, being petted by my father, who questioned us about what was wrong. Something growled at us in the corn, Lyle blurted out seemingly on the verge of tears. I just nodded, being at a loss for words. My dad's girlfriend frowned slightly, a disbelieving look in her eyes. We were walking back after our race, and when we were just about at the end of the path, we heard something growl right next to us. I panted, still trying to catch my breath. My dad's girlfriend shrugged it off, but I knew my dad believed us. He even believed in things like werewolves and Bigfoot. He claims to have seen Bigfoot at one point. But the next time I would go over to their house, Lyle admitted to me that he did in fact see something more. A pair of glowing red eyes, which stood seven feet off the ground. The encounter scared him so bad, he said he would never go into that cornfield again. 
Lyle and his family moved out of that house a few months later, so I never had the chance to encounter anything else strange out there. <laughs>